Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents an original mystery thriller entitled A Test for Murder. A slight problem is about to arise in Provincetown. The judge of an art show is going to be murdered on opening night. Captain Waverly Underhill, confronted with a freshly murdered corpse and a room full of suspects, is about to demonstrate his own rather unorthodox methods of conducting a murder investigation. Expose him? But how? There are 70 or 80 people down there. How do you propose to find a killer out of so many suspects? I'll ask them. And you expect the killer to simply admit that he did it? Yes, Doctor. That is precisely what I expect him to do. Join us now as Captain Underhill administers a special kind of test. A pop quiz designed to pinpoint a cold-blooded killer out of a room full of artists, art lovers, and patrons of the arts who are all about to discover that their innocent evening of art is suddenly transformed into a test for murder. I can understand why you've come to me. You want to hear my version of what happened. I don't mind retelling it. I suppose, in a way, I'm in a better position than anyone else to describe what happened that night, although there are certainly others who could give an accurate accounting. That was part of the problem, you see, the fact that there were so many of us there. I know you're mainly interested in hearing about the incident... Funny referring to murder as an incident, as though it were an innocuous, commonplace event. There's nothing innocuous or commonplace about it, I can assure you. When it happens, it's always a gruesome thing. Gruesome and quite shocking. Especially when it happens so unexpectedly. Of course, that's generally the case, isn't it? No one really expects a murder, except the killer himself, I suppose. Even so, I think you'll agree... This one was more shocking and gruesome and unexpected than most of those you read about in the newspaper. My entire perspective in this matter is strongly colored by my close association with Captain Waverly Underhill. He's my friend and also, technically, one of my patients, although hardly a model patient, I can assure you. If most patients followed medical advice the way he does, then most doctors might just as well dispense with getting it. Captain Underhill is tall and thin, but certainly not underweight for a man in his middle 70s. It betrays no medical confidence to say that he sometimes suffers from heart palpitations, but more often complains of creeping senility, which he's convinced is robbing him of his mental faculties. Now, this is ridiculous, I assure you. Underhill's powers of reasoning are as sharp as ever. It's my professional opinion that this so-called senility, if it does exist, exists only in his mind. It didn't come out like I meant it to, but you know what I mean. Anyway, if you don't believe me, you have only to observe his actions in the incident I'm about to relate. The way he handled the case from beginning to end was pure underhill. And if I say so myself, nothing less than a perfect demonstration of the investigator's art. It was a pleasantly cool evening, as I recall. Provincetown was just returning to normal after another summer of sensory overload. A fog bank was building out over the ocean. 
but the sky overhead was clear and full of stars. I can't really explain why I was there, or what it was at the last minute that made me decide to go. Attending the opening of art exhibits is not the sort of thing I do very often. I'd read the article that appeared in the Cape Cod Times. It sounded interesting, and I decided I should go if for no other reason than to extricate myself from the rut I was in. As you know, the Alice B. Steiner Memorial Art Museum is located on the east end of Commercial Street in what was formerly a church. When I arrived, the opening was already well attended. I went in and spent the first 15 minutes looking at the paintings in one of the galleries. I certainly had no idea that I would encounter Captain Underhill there, although thinking about it now, I shouldn't have been surprised since painting is one of his primary hobbies. Strangely enough, he didn't seem a bit surprised to see me. Hello, Schofield. I was looking forward to bumping into you tonight. Waverly, hello. I, I didn't expect to see you here. But wait a minute. How could you know? Know what? That I was coming. You couldn't have known. I only decided myself at the last minute... Honestly, Waverly, you may be an old cop, but you're becoming more like the legendary Sherlock Holmes every time we meet. And you, Schofield, are becoming more and more like Dr. Watson. There are some interesting paintings here, I think. Why don't we have a look around? Wait a minute. You still haven't explained how you knew. Hmm? Knew what? That I was coming. Oh, yes. You're still confused about that, aren't you? Well, actually, it's quite simple. First of all, I noticed the frayed cuff on the left sleeve of your sports jacket. My cuff? Also, there is a slight nick under your chin where you cut yourself shaving this morning. And if you'll notice, there are distinctive scuff marks on the toes of your shoes. Good Lord, you mean from all that you were able to... Deduce that you were coming? Precisely. Of course, there's also the fact that since I arrived after you did, I noticed your signature on the guest register as I came in. Oh, no, oh, yes, I, I forgot I signed in. Well, so you're not so smart after all. No, Doctor, and neither am I much of a practitioner of the Sherlock Holmes method of solving mysteries. Now, what do you say you take me around and show me what you've seen? But first, you need some champagne, and I need a refill. Well, uh, how much have you had already? Oh, don't be such a physician. I'm well within my limit. Besides, it functions like these, champagne is absolutely essential. It sharpens the eye and heightens one's aesthetic sensibilities. Why, without it, a masterpiece might go totally unrecognized. Excuse me, are, are you Mr. LaRoche? No, no, I'm not. Oh, Don, rats, now I'm getting nervous. Is Mr. LaRoche someone important? Well, yes, he is. He's judging the show. You haven't heard of him? I'm afraid not. Louis LaRoche is a famous art critic. He arrived today from New York. I'm on the welcoming committee, so I'm supposed to be looking after him. The only thing is, I don't even know who he is. Celia Hansoff has picked him up at the airport. So far, she's the only one who's met him, and I can't seem to find her either. I notice ribbons hanging alongside some of the paintings. It appears the judging has already been completed. Yes, it was this afternoon. But Mr. LaRoche was supposed to return tonight to make the presentations. That's going to be my fault if he doesn't show up. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have introduced myself. I'm Trudy Landsberger. Waverly Underhill. And this is my friend, Alexander Schofield. He's a physician. His motto is, just because you're feeling fine is no reason to think you're not sick. Waverly, please. Miss Landberger, how do you do? Fine, thank you. If you'll both excuse me now, I'd better keep searching for Mr. LaRoche. If we see him, we'll let him know you're looking for him. Please do. That'll be great. Waverly, I can certainly do without introductions like that. Obviously, you're not to be trusted in social situations. Oh, never mind that. Take a look at this painting. What do you make of it? Hmm. It, it's a nude portrait of a woman, isn't it? Yes. Horrible, isn't it? I thought cubism had gone out of fashion years ago. Though it does sort of remind me of a song of my youth. Let's see. There once was a woman named Hannah. She lived in the desert all her life. Her breasts were like maces, her hips an oasis. Oh, let me be in Hannah's savannah tonight. Oh, Waverly, try to be dignified. Excuse me. How do you like it? I'm sorry? The painting. Do you like it? Oh. Oh, well, actually, my friend and I were just discussing it. Are you, uh, are you the artist? No, no, the subject. That's me. 
Can't you tell? Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, now that you mention it, I, I do see a resemblance. You're Louis LaRoche, aren't you? No, but it appears I could be. You're an artist, then? Not really. Oh, yes, he is. Just a hobbyist. Don't let him fool you. He's, he's quite good. In that case, let me give you my card. My name is Beverly Sampson. I'm a professional model. I do private sittings. My rates are reasonable. I do classical poses as well as avant-garde. I see. Well, Miss Sampson, I'll certainly hold on to your card. If I should ever... Please do. You know, I especially enjoy working with older men. Well, Waverly, it appears you found someone who shares your interest in uh, art. I suppose now you'll be giving up landscapes. Oh, very funny, Doctor. You're just jealous because she didn't ask you. You know, with a woman like that, you can't be too careful. If I were you, I'd definitely remain on my avant-garde. I must admit, Alex, sometimes I do get the urge to... Oh, my God! Where did that come from? Up those stairs. Come on, Alex. Quickly. You may be needed. What's wrong? I see him. Everyone, everyone, please, don't, don't crowd up the stairs. Go on back down. You need a doctor. We have a doctor. Please, everyone, go back. Please. We need your cooperation. Alex. Alex, you'd better examine him. If he's as dead as he looks, don't move him any more than you have to. <laughs> Miss Lambsberger, please try to compose yourself. It's important that you tell us what happened. I don't know. I was looking for Mr. LaRoche. I thought I might find him up here. It's no use, Waverly. He's dead. Do you think it's him? Shall I check his wallet? No. No, we'll wait for the police. What in heaven's name is going on here? What in heaven's name is happening? Please, please, we are asking everyone to wait downstairs. Oh, truly, is that you? It's all right, Mr. Amito. It's Mrs. Hampshire. Let her come on. Oh, truly, what's going on? Oh, oh, my dear God. You recognize him? Oh, yes, of course. It's Mr. LaRoche. Oh, is he... Yes, he's been murdered. Mrs. Hanshofer, can you tell me who is in charge of the show? I suppose I am. I'm chairperson for the Arts Council. Excellent. Would you mind waiting just a minute? I'll, I'll need to ask you some questions. Alex, I need a favor done quickly. What is it? Go down and speak to the guard at the door. Tell him what's happened. Say there's been a murder, but don't give out any more details than you have to. Instruct him that he must make certain no one leaves until the police arrive. If anyone insists on going, get word to me. I'll speak to them personally. Any guests arriving late, turn them away and say there's been an accident. After that, call the Provincetown police and ask to speak to Walter Lafarge. Tell him there's been a homicide. He'll know what to do. And then, before you come back up, go out to your car and bring in your doctor's bag. Waverly, don't you think it would be best for Miss Landsberger to wait downstairs? She's obviously very distraught. No, not yet. Not until I ask her a few questions. Excuse me, but may I please ask who you are? My name is Waverly Underhill. I'm a retired police captain, and this is Dr. Schofield. A serious crime has been committed here. With your permission, I intend to take charge of the situation until the police arrive. Oh. Alex, you'd better get going. Mrs. Hanshofer... I'd like to ask you a few questions while Miss Landsberger takes a moment to compose herself. Yes, yes, of course. Are you familiar with the building? Oh, yes, I think so. What is this room used for? Storage and sometimes office space. Right now, as you see, most of the museum's permanent collection has been moved up here to make way for the exhibit down below. There are no windows? There were windows originally, but they were bricked over to create more wall space. No hidden closets or cubby holes. No place that someone might hide. No, no, I don't believe so. Well, you can see for yourself. It's, it's just one large room. That door at the back, does it lead to a fire escape? It does. Is it wired to an alarm system? Yes. There is an audible alarm that sounds if the door is opened. It was necessary, of course, for insurance purposes and to protect the museum's property. I see. If I test it now, can you shut it off? Downstairs I can, in the office. All right. Now, what about the restrooms? Where are they located? The restrooms? Oh, oh downstairs. All right, Mrs. Hansoffer. Here is what I'd like you to do. I'm going to wait up here while you go downstairs. Then I'm going to open that door. As soon as you hear the alarm, you can shut it off. 
Will you do that? Yes, yes, of course. And then I want you to go and lock both bathrooms. Put out of order signs on them if you have to, but don't let anyone in. That's very important. Yes, but but what if someone has to... Oh, they'll just have to wait, that's all. Tell them there's nothing you can do about it. Will you go and do that? Yes. Yes, of course. All right, if, if you say so. Thank you. Miss Landsberger, how do you feel? I... I feel all right. Would you like me to ask Dr. Schofield to give you something to calm you down? No, I don't think so. It's just that I feel so horrible about what happened. If I'd been with him like I was supposed to be, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. Now, now, don't blame yourself. I'm going over now and, and try that door. You're probably going to hear a loud bell, so don't let it startle you. What's the matter? What's going on? Oh, nothing, Doctor. I was just testing the alarm system. Well, what for? To establish the fact that the only way the killer could have come up here and gone down is by the stairs you just used. Miss Landsberger, do you feel up to answering a few questions? Yes, I'll try. Good. Can you tell me exactly what you saw when you came up here? I didn't see anything. Not at first. There's not much light, is there? After I spoke with you and Dr. Schofield, I came up here thinking Mr. LaRoche might have come up to look over the museum's permanent collection. When you came up, did you see anyone? No. Did you encounter anyone on the stairs? No. No one. I thought I was completely alone. I was about to go back down. Then I saw him lying there. I thought he must be sick. That maybe he fainted. Then... I saw the knife. That's when I screamed. All right. All right, Miss Landsberger. Thank you. I'd like you to go back downstairs now and try to relax. Have a glass of champagne. If anyone asks about what happened, tell them you've been instructed to say nothing until the police arrive. Will you do that? Yes. I will. Miss Landsberger, are you sure you're feeling well enough? Yes, yes I am. Just a little shaky. Well, if you need me for anything, please. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Doctor. I'll, I'll be all right. Well, Alex, what did you find out? I spoke with the guard. He's making certain no one leaves. I called the Provincetown police. I couldn't get hold of Walter Lafarge, but someone else is on his way over. All right. Open up your bag and let me have that contraption you used to peer inside a patient's ears. Are you planning on examining his ears? No. No, but I'm going to use the built-in light and magnifying glass to examine the handle of the knife. Uh, for fingerprints? Yes, though I don't expect to find any. Stay back if you don't mind. No point in both of us tramping around too close to the body. The nice thing about a knifing is it tells you a great deal more about the assailant than you can get from a gunshot wound. In this case, the murderer was obviously taller than his victim... The knife blade entered to the right of the spine, which suggests that the killer is right-handed. He used his left hand to cover the mouth to prevent a scream while he drove the knife upwards and in with his right hand. Hmm. No fingerprints, as I expected. Do you think the killer used gloves? I doubt it. It's interesting that the weapon that was used is a dagger. Perhaps the killer was aware that the blade of a penknife can easily fold up if you try to insert it through thick clothing and into the body of a human being. The handle is cast from brass. That could be useful. Who is it? Police. Come up. We've been expecting you. Are you the one who called? My name is Waverly Underhill. I'm a retired police captain. This is Dr. Schofield. He's the one who telephoned. Boy, he's really dead, isn't he? Yes. Yes, and freshly murdered, I might add. Where is Walter Lafarge? In Boston, for a meeting. He's, he's not coming back until tomorrow. That means you're in charge? Sort of. My name is Greenwood. Ray Greenwood. I'm a, a, only temporary. I was hired just for the summer. Mm. Did you call Hyannis? I called them. They are sending a squad car. That gives us about 45 minutes. I just realized, this is the first time in my life I've ever seen a dead body. Officer Greenwood, if you don't mind, I've had quite a lot of experience in these matters. 
With your permission, I'm going to proceed with my own inquiry until the detectives from Hyannis arrive. Yeah, sure. Fine by me. Like you say, you've obviously got a lot more experience. Good. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Go downstairs and assemble everyone into one room and arrange them all in a circle. See if you can find enough chairs for everyone to sit down. Next, make sure everyone gets a piece of paper and a pencil. Something they can use to write down the answers to a few questions. Last of all, see that everyone wears a name tag. If they demand to know what is going on, tell them detectives are on their way. And to save time, we're going to begin by conducting a preliminary inquiry. When you've done all that, I'll come down and take over. Is that all right? Hey, I'm not sure I can okay all this. Mr. Greenwood, you've just seen your first dead body. If we move quickly, you may yet get to meet your first murderer. Waverly, you can't be thinking the killer is still down there. Oh, yes. I'm fairly certain of it. But why would he? Why? Because leaving would only serve to call attention to himself. Right now, that's the last thing in the world he wants to do. Uh, you said he. Are you convinced it's a man? More than likely. Most knife killings are done by men. Women prefer guns. Yes, I believe he's still here. And I intend to use this opportunity to expose him. Expose him? But how? There are 70 or 80 people down there. How do you propose to find a killer out of so many suspects? I'll ask them. And you expect the killer to simply admit that he did it? Yes, Doctor. That is precisely what I expect him to do. Could I have your attention, please? Quiet, please. Thank you. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Waverly Underhill. I'm a police captain, now retired. As I'm certain you are all aware, a man has been murdered upstairs. Officer Greenwood of the Provincetown Police has already notified Hyannis, and they are sending up a team of investigators. They should be arriving within the hour. In the meantime, since all of you will be questioned, and since I've been through this procedure many times before, I suggested to Officer Greenwood that he allow me to begin with a few preliminary questions, which should help speed things up once the detectives arrive. If everyone is agreed, and if there are no questions, I'll begin it's by... Louis LaRoche, who was murdered, isn't it? Uh, that's right, Mr. Uh, I can't quite see your name tag. Uh, Mr. Hirsch. Uh, Mr. LaRoche arrived just today from New York. He was here to judge the show. Now, isn't that fitting? The famous art critic gets bumped off at an opening. If you ask me, whoever did it should win first prize. It's unquestionably the best example of performance art I've ever seen. How vulgar. That's one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard. Disgusting? Why so disgusting? Everyone who knows anything about the art world knows what a creep Louis de Roche was. How he delighted in destroying people's careers. Jason, why don't you shut up? The man's dead. He's not going to hurt you anymore. Oh, he may be dead, but that doesn't mean I'm obligated to honor his memory. I'd like to know who did it. I'd like to shake his hand. Let me suggest that if there are opinions about Mr. LaRoche, you all save them for when the detectives arrive. Right now, I'd like to get started. Mr. Underhill, uh, excuse me, Mr. Underhill. Since you're going to be asking us questions, I would like to ask you one, if you don't mind. Is it your opinion that the murderer is one of us in this room? If so, I think we should be made aware of it. Since this person is obviously dangerous. Like again. Hmm. Uh, since you brought it up, Mr. Um, Mr. Kiefer, I will say quite candidly that it is probable the murderer is one of us. However, however, as to the possibility of him striking again, that is remote. First of all, he's almost certainly unarmed, having left his knife upstairs in the back of his victim. Secondly, it's not likely he will try anything rash unless he feels he is being cornered. 
As you will see by the general nature of the questions I intend to ask, that is not going to happen. Oh, let's all stop being alarmist. This sounds like perfect fun to me. Just like a parlor game. Personally, I hope we nail the bastard. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mrs. Um... Florence Rigby. Mrs. Florence Rigby. Yes, uh, thank you, Mrs. Rigby. All right. Now, to begin, I'd like you to write your name in the upper left-hand corner. Now, put your address underneath that. And please include your permanent address if you are only visiting Cape Cod. Which one's our permanent address? And next, list your occupation. Do I have an occupation? After that, I'd like to know if you came alone tonight or with someone else. If you came with others, please list their names. No conferring on this, please. Simply answer the questions as best you can. It's been so long since I've taken a test, I feel like I'm back in school. Well, don't think of it as a test. Think of it as a questionnaire. All right. Next, I'd like to know if at any time tonight you use the restroom. No need to elaborate. Just, just answer yes or no. I would also like to know if at any time this evening you saw anyone else go into the restaurant. And if so, please list their names, using the name tags if necessary. Finally, I'd like you to state if at any time tonight you went upstairs. Now, this is not intended to incriminate you. You may have had a perfectly innocent reason. But since the police will want to know sooner or later, let's indicate it here. Oh, yes, one last thing. Also, list the names of anyone you saw going upstairs or coming down. Again, refer to the name tags if you have to. And that's all. Dr. Schofield will collect your papers. I suggest until the police arrive, you relax and try to enjoy the show. And thank you all for your cooperation. Here are the papers, Waverly. If you don't mind my saying so, I don't see what good they're going to do you. You didn't even ask what time they arrived or where they were when the murder took place. Uh, if it had been me, those would have been the first two questions I would have asked. In answer to your first question, if, if we need to know what time people arrived, we can easily determine that according to their relative position on the guest register. As to where each person was when the murder occurred, how can we ask that? All we know is the approximate time Miss Landsberger discovered the body. The actual murder may have taken place anywhere from five minutes to as much as 35 minutes before she arrived. Well, what, what good does it do to ask if they went to the bathroom? Ah, ah, here it is. This is what I was looking for. What we're trying to find, Alex, is the intersection of two distinct sets. Number one, the set of all people who admit coming up here tonight... And number two, the set of all those who admit using the restroom downstairs. I'm convinced the murderer did both. Well, how can you be sure of that? Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? First of all, we assume the killer is someone who came here tonight with the intention of murdering Mr. LaRoche. Not many people carry around a dagger as part of their normal evening attire. Next, we have to ask ourselves, why did he do it up here? The reason, of course, is that he was watching LaRoche the entire evening waiting for an opportunity. The murder of Louis LaRoche was definitely premeditated, but it was also spontaneous in the sense that the killer could not have known in advance that this sort of opportunity would present itself. He saw LaRoche climb the stairs coming up here. He followed him up, saw that they were alone, and then quickly murdered him. He did not use gloves because gloves would have taken too long to put on and take off. Instead, he wielded the knife barehanded, and then most likely use his handkerchief to wipe the handle for your prints. Now, put yourself in the mind of the killer. You've just murdered LaRoche. What would you do next? Remember, we've already established it would be foolish of him to leave. What is the most logical thing? Go back down and mingle with the guests, I suppose. Yes, yes, but only after you had made a quick detour to the restroom. You'd need a chance to compose yourself to check in the mirror, make certain there are no bloodstains, nothing to give yourself away. 
Ergo, the killer is someone who admits coming up here and also admits stopping in to use the bathroom. But why admit to either one? Because I also asked everyone to list the names of anyone they saw coming upstairs or using the bathroom. If the killer denies either one and someone else says they saw him do it, that sets up a discrepancy. And discrepancies are the basic underpinnings of all murder investigations, and exactly what the killer wishes to avoid at all costs. Therefore, he will innocently admit to both, and then when questioned by the police, he will simply claim there was no dead body here when he came up. Do you see? Mm, yes, I, I think so. So, having said all that, I now present you with the murderer. Alfred Turk, Jr. You'll notice Mr. Turk admits using the restroom and also admits having come up here. He lists himself as an artist. Mr. Turk most likely murdered Mr. LaRoche because he felt LaRoche had snubbed him in some way. Artists are quite temperamental. They don't take criticism at all well. Also, the fact that his name ends in Jr. may indicate a personality problem. You'd be surprised the number of sons who are forever juniors to their father's name that develop serious complexes as they get older. It says here that he came with his wife. Yes, but that doesn't matter. When he saw LaRoche coming up here, he could have easily excused himself, saying he was going to use the men's room, and then taken a detour upstairs. In fact, if you notice on her answer sheet, she does list her husband as having gone to the restroom, yet she does not put him down for having come up here. Then you've solved the case. Only partially. So far, all we've done is identify the primary suspect. We still have to prove he did it, and prove it in a way that will satisfy a judge and jury. No jury is going to convict a man because he admits using the restroom, or even if he admits coming upstairs. Consider, we have no eyewitnesses, no hard evidence such as fingerprints, no motive beyond conjecture, and the weapon that was left behind is almost certainly untraceable. Then you're saying this is one of those cases where the actual murderer is known, but still he goes free. Not necessarily. Not if we can salvage a little more time before the detectives arrive. Captain Underhill's strategy was simple and direct. He planned to talk Alfred Turk into confessing. He pointed out to me that in situations where tangible evidence was slim or non-existent, a confession was often the only possible means of solving a case. He seemed fairly optimistic about his chances. Psychologically, he said, a man who was bold enough to risk murdering someone in such a public place would also have an overly inflated opinion of his own invincibility. An opinion that, once put under attack, might quickly break down into a desperate need to tell all. I suggested, why not wait and let the police handle it? And he told me that was exactly what he hoped to avoid. Confessions obtained by the police are scrutinized by the courts to make certain that they were done without coercion, intimidation, or trickery. On the other hand, Underhill, acting as a private citizen, could say or suggest anything he wanted he'd not be subject to the same restraints. I was once again amazed at how difficult the detective's job had become. Not only must he think like a criminal to solve the case, but he must also think like a lawyer, judge, and jury to be sure that his efforts will not be wasted and the case thrown out of court. Captain Underhill gave me a quick list of instructions. First, to lend him the miniature tape recorder I carry in my doctor's bag, which I use to record notes on patients when I make house calls. Next, to go downstairs and invite Alfred Turk, or Mac the Knife, as Underhill was now taken to calling him, to join him upstairs. After that, I was to go outside with Officer Greenwood and wait for the detectives from Hyannis to arrive. We were to intercept them and instruct them to wait for a signal that Underhill would pass along by tapping three times on the floor. It was his feeling that timing and the manner in which the detectives arrived were essential to the success of his plan. When I suggested the investigators might be unwilling to postpone their arrival while he conducted an experiment, he told me to use his name and do the best I could. It was not until later, of course, when I listened to the recording Underhill made that I learned what actually took place when Mr. Turk came upstairs. Your 
your doctor friend downstairs said you wanted to see me? That's right. Have a seat. My uh, wife will be worried. Oh, I'm sure your wife will understand. Look. Just because I admit I came up here, that doesn't mean I had anything to do with what happened. I never said you did. Sit down. I'm not going to sit up here in the same room with a dead body. It bothers you? Of course it bothers me. It would bother anybody who had any feelings. At least if I had the decency to cover him up. Oh, no. Never do that. That's the worst thing you could do. Sit down. All right. But just for a minute. Good. Now, to explain why you should never cover a murder victim, Mr. Turk, it's because you don't want to contaminate the evidence. You see, when the killer chose to murder Mr. LaRoche by stabbing him in the back, it meant he had to bring his own body into close contact with his victims. So? Well, undoubtedly he left behind all sorts of incriminating evidence. Strands of hair, loose threads from his clothing, even skin cells. Did you know the average body sheds approximately 40,000 skin cells every minute? No, I, I didn't know that. And you'll notice that Mr. LaRoche is wearing a tweed jacket. Tweed is like Velcro. It picks up every little thing it touches. So you see, covering the body with a sheet, like they do in the movies, would only contaminate the evidence that's already present. So is that going to prove who did it? Uh, not necessarily. Not by itself. But evidence in a murder case is always cumulative. You keep adding a little more and a little more, and pretty soon the scales of justice begin to tip from a presumption of innocence to an assumption of guilt. For example, you'd be surprised how much we already know about how the murder was committed. We know the killer came here tonight with the intention of murdering Mr. LaRoche. He watched, saw him climb the stairs, followed him up, and then took advantage of the fact they were alone to sneak behind him and slip a knife between his ribs. We know the killer is right-handed. We know approximately how tall he is. And we know he didn't use gloves. Instead, he used his handkerchief to wipe the handle free of prints. Unfortunately, that was a mistake, since the handle of the knife is cast out of brass. If the killer's palms were sweating, as undoubtedly they were, then the sweat from his hands will have corroded some of the metal, traces of which will show up on his handkerchief under laboratory analysis. And, oh, I hope I'm not boring you. No. Go on. Of course, it's all circumstantial, but as the saying goes, if you see footprints in the snow and letters in the mailbox, you can assume the mailman has been there. Now, juries know this. They're much more sophisticated these days, much more willing to consider related evidence. Lawyers know it, too. In fact, many of the ones I know say they actually prefer circumstantial evidence. Eyewitnesses can be mistaken. Often they get rattled when they have to stand up in a courtroom and testify about what they saw. But you take an expert in forensic science, someone who is accustomed to getting up in front of a jury, and then Would you... Would you mind telling me what all this has to do with me? I'm not saying it has anything to do with you. Then I think I'd like to go back downstairs, thank you. All right. All right. That's your privilege. There's just one point I'd like to make. And what is that? The investigation of this murder is not going to begin officially until a team of detectives arrives from Hyannis, which should be any minute. And right now, I think whoever did this had better be asking himself a few hard questions. What kind of questions? Like what will happen if he keeps quiet? Will there be enough evidence to bring an indictment? If I can learn this much in half an hour, imagine what a team of highly trained investigators will be able to uncover in a week. For example, where did the knife come from? Now, a knife may not be as traceable as a gun, but one as distinctive as this, I would think there may be a store on the Cape, perhaps one right here in Provincetown, with a sales clerk who will remember selling a knife like this to a particular customer. There's also the question of motive. Will the police be able to prove that the murderer knew his victim? Things like that. I still don't understand why you're telling me... Of course, if the murderer decides to take a chance and keep quiet, 
It's going to make it very difficult for his attorney. The charge will be first-degree murder, premeditated. The judge will take his place on the bench, rap the gavel three times, and then the attorney for the defense will have to stand up and try to prove that his client is completely innocent. On the other hand, if the murderer is waiting up here, ready to confess to the police as soon as they arrive, it will open up a whole range of avenues for his attorney. It may even get the charge reduced to second or third degree homicide. Unfortunately, the killer is going to have to make up his mind in a hurry before the police get here. You can hear them coming now, can't you? They're on their way. Once he makes his decision, he's going to have to stick to it. There will be no turning back. Not even if he wants to. The rest of what happened you know from reading the newspapers. The homicide squad arrived in their cruisers from Hyannis and found upstairs not only the body of the murdered man, but also the confessed killer himself, Mr. Alfred Turk, Jr., a large contingency of reporters showed up soon afterward, representing newspapers, radio, and television. News footage that appeared the next day showed the police carrying the body out on a stretcher and then escorting the accused in handcuffs out of the building and into a waiting squad car. Typically enough, in the reports that followed, little or nothing was said of Captain Waverly Underhill's role in solving the case, although Officer Greenwood was cited for taking unspecified quick action that ensured the suspect did not escape. When the police and reporters finally cleared out, the opening actually resumed and continued until very late, with everyone in surprisingly good spirits, nothing like a murder to enliven the mood. Captain Underhill strolled about, looking at the paintings and talking to others. I noticed him from time to time, ignoring my advice and still drinking champagne. Around 1.30, I decided it was time for me to leave. I looked around for Captain Underhill and found him sitting alone. I offered to drive him home. He declined, saying that was something that he had already taken care of. Before I could ask the question, I was given the answer. As I turned around to observe Miss... Beverly Sampson approaching with a smile in her lips and carrying two glasses of champagne. My solitary ride home that night was filled with envious imaginings. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of A Test for Murder. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Honey. Co-produced by David Ellsworth. Engineered by John Todd. With original music composed by Mark Birmingham. Assisting in the production were Scott Dickey and Carol McManus. The actors in tonight's play, Dave Ellsworth, Captain Underhill. Wally O'Hara, Dr. Schofield. Neil McGarry played Alfred Turk, Jr. Eva Broderson was Trudy Landsberger. Mary B. Jones, Celia Hanshofer. Lainey Davis, Beverly Sampson, Kevin Grappi, Officer Greenwood, Fred Morey, Mr. Kiefer, Bill Dane, Jason Hirsch, and Carol McManus played Florence Rigby. A Test for Murder was recorded at HG Recording Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theatre. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This program is made possible with the cooperation of the Public Media Foundation. This is Bob Nolan wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater.
It's a foggy night on Old Cape Cod. A perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents an original mystery thriller entitled The Caller on Line One. Tonight, we follow the fate of Miss Tanya Macklin. Miss Macklin's a Cape Cod radio personality and host of Talk Line, the weekly advice on the air program. Miss Macklin works for WPPX, a small station with a broadcast range that covers most of the Cape. Now, in a few moments, she is going on the air to take calls from listeners who have personal problems. Soon, however, Miss Macklin will be facing a problem of her own. A problem so large it will threaten to transform her normally sane world into a nightmarish world of terror. So now, sit back, relax, and allow us to tune to a program that should be beginning just about now. This is WPPX, the voice of Cape Cod. Stay tuned now for Top Line. Hello, hope you're having a good evening and welcome to Top Line. I'm your host, Tanya Macklin, and for the next hour, well, if you don't feel like going to bed just yet and you're in the mood for some company, we invite you to listen in or call in. Talk Line, for those of you who don't know, is a weekly radio program devoted entirely to you, to whatever it is that's going on in your life. If you have a problem you want to talk about, we are here to listen. Maybe you've just been through something you feel like sharing. Call us up. We're not here to judge or criticize. We're here to listen and maybe offer a little advice. If you're feeling angry about something or hurt, or if you're trying to overcome old fears and phobias, call me up and let's talk about it. I can't promise I'll have the answers, but one thing is always certain. It helps to talk, and it helps people who are listening who may be going through something similar. We're going to take a short commercial break right now, and then we'll be back to take our first call. The number here at the station is 555-4538. Join us, won't you? Guns are Us Gun Shop at the new scene. How we doing, Ron? Offers the largest Pretty good. Three fish on the line already. Looks like it's going to be a busy night. I wonder why. I'll tell you why. Step outside and check out what's coming up over the parking lot. There's a full moon out there. That always brings us more calls. <laughs> That's when the weirdos really come out of the woodwork. <laughs> you know, Ron, it never ceases to amaze me what a great reservoir of human sympathy you have for your fellow man. <laughs> okay, big deal. So I'm not the most compassionate guy in the world. I can't understand where you get the patience to deal with some of these jokers. If it was me, I'd say, get lost. I got problems of my own. Oh, you're telling me. Watch. <laughs> it's unwise to insult one's engineer. He may walk out and leave you to run the show all by yourself. Five seconds. All torpedo tubes loaded. They're open. Fire when we're ready. Nine Captain. until six. And on Sundays from nine to one. Hi, we're back and we're going to take our first call. This is Tanya Macklin. Thanks for calling Talkline. Are you with us? Yes, I am. First, I want to say that I really enjoy listening to your program very much. Thank you. It's nice to be appreciated. Well, the reason I'm calling is about my husband. Uh, we're both senior citizens, retired. We moved to Cape Cod five years ago from Ohio. How do you like it here? Oh, we like it very much. We like the ocean, and we like feeling that we're living on an island. I know Cape Cod really isn't an island. Oh, it's pretty darn close. Well, yes, and if you consider the Cape Cod Canal, I suppose you could say it is. Uh, anyway, the reason I'm calling is about my husband. I found out just yesterday that a woman, a widow, who lives down the block from us, attended the same high school as my husband did. In fact, they were in the same class together. She's lived here for almost a year, and I know my husband has seen her because we've talked about her. And yet, not once ever has he mentioned to me they were classmates. Oh, you think there's something suspicious about that? Well, yes, I do. I mean, I can't think of any other reason that he'd want to hide from me. How did you happen to find out? Oh, well, actually, I learned about it from her. We bumped into one another at the supermarket, and she told me. Uh, she spoke very fondly about my husband. She 
he even implied that at one time they shared a romantic interest. Oh, I just can't imagine why in the world he'd want to keep something like that a secret from me unless well... I can think of another reason. He may not remember her. I graduated from high school, too. It must be ten years ago, and I'm sure if you asked me now, I couldn't remember everybody that was in my class. Well, yes, but if there was a romantic interest... You don't know that. It may have been one-sided. Maybe she had a crush on him, and he didn't even know she existed. Well, I suppose I could explain it. Another possibility may be that your husband decided not to tell you because he didn't want you to feel threatened knowing an old flame of his was living in the neighborhood. Well, what do you think I should do? Should I just ignore it? Oh, no, no. I think it's definitely preying too much in your mind. I think you've got to find out. And I think the best way is to simply ask your husband. Well, I suppose you're right. I'm sure I would feel better. But, oh, dear, now I don't know what to do. Why is that? Well, because if he really doesn't remember who she is, if I remind him... It just might rekindle an old relationship. Well, look at it this way. Would you rather he found out from you or from her? Chances are he's going to find out sooner or later anyway. Ah, you're probably right. Still, I'm going to have to think about this. Okay, but don't wait too long. It's not worth stewing over. Who knows? The three of you may end up becoming good friends. I suppose so. Anyway, I wish you luck. I think you'll find it'll all turn out for the best. Think so? Okay, well... Thank you. And thank you for calling. Hello, you're on talk line. Welcome to the show. To whom am I speaking? Tanya Macklin. Tanya? That's a pretty name. But shouldn't it be Tanya? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be pronounced? Well, some people say Tanya. Some people say Tanya. I like Tanya better. Tanya is too strong for you. It doesn't match your voice. Do you mind if I call you Tonya? No, go right ahead. Thank you. Okay, now that we've got that little point settled, is there something else you wanted to talk about? Well, yes, there is. I have a problem that's been bothering me. That's the reason I'm calling. What sort of problem? It's not a problem, really. I seem to have trouble making friends. I don't know why. I just moved down here not very long ago. And it seems whenever I meet someone and try to get to know them, they close up. Sometimes I think it's me, but sometimes I think it must be them. I can't understand why people on Keep Card are so standoff. I wouldn't say they're more standoffish here than anywhere else. But I think you should keep in mind, making friends has never been an easy thing to do. A lot of people have the idea it's supposed to be easy, and sometimes they think there's something wrong with them when they don't make friends right away. It isn't easy. It never has been. It's hard, and it takes patience, and it takes time, especially if you've just moved into an area. I understand that. But it seems to me most people won't even give you a chance. Well, it may be that you're trying too hard. That can work against you. When it comes to making friends, you have to let it happen, not try to make it happen. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You know, you sound like someone I could be friends with. Oh, that's nice of you to say. I'm sure we could be. However, you have to remember that friendships are relationships, and relationships have to start slowly and grow at their own pace. If people close up when you meet them, it may be you're forcing it, trying to make the relationship become too much too soon. That could be your problem. I don't see it as a problem. I never said I had a problem. I'm merely saying that most people you meet are not willing to give anything back, no matter how nice you try to be. Stay like busted vending machines. You put 50 cents in and it keeps giving it back to you over and over and over. And sometimes you feel like just taking your fist and smashing it. Yes, I, I know what you mean. It can be very frustrating. That's right. For example, just the other day I was driving Route 28 and I stopped for a hitchhiker. And he said he was going to Provincetown. I wasn't going that far, but I said I would take him there anyway. I tried several times to start up a conversation, but he just clammed up. He just sat there. Yes, but in a situation like that, he might have been really nervous. Some hitchhikers are friendly, others are wary and like to keep their distance. It's understandable. It's certainly not a very relaxed atmosphere in which to try to get to know someone. Well, we drove as far as High Anna's. And when I stopped for a light, he suddenly jerked open the car door and he jumped out. He did? That's right. He just took off. Well, that is unusual. You weren't driving wildly or too fast. Never. 
I'm always a careful driver. Maybe it was his first time. Maybe he was nervous and just didn't feel comfortable. You didn't do anything. I told you I didn't do a thing. Oh, then he was probably very uptight. I wouldn't worry about it. Actually, he's lucky he got out when he did. In another few minutes, I would have noticed the shadows. What shadows? He had them tucked away out of sight. That's how he was able to trick me into stopping in the first place. They were hidden in his clothes, in the pockets, in the creases. When I stopped the car and he jumped out, I saw them escaping, flying out. And when I looked back and saw him in the rearview mirror, he was covered with them. Of course, if I had seen them to begin with, I would not have tried to, to pick him up. I would have just run him down. I see. Well, look, I I'm going to stop you here. Why? Because I don't think it's a good idea for us to continue this conversation. Why not? Because I think you need to talk about this with someone who can help you sort it out. I don't think we should try to do it over the phone. I'd like to give you a number to call. It's a place right here on the Cape. What is it? A clinic. They have people there who will sit down and talk with you as long as you want. They're professionals, and they're excellent, believe me. Professionals? I know all about professionals. They're never satisfied until they've excavated every little corner of your mind. Oh, these people are not like that. They're very good, and they're very understanding. Have you ever been given mood-suppressing drugs? No, I, I haven't. Well, I have. Lots of times. They work for a while, but then they wear off. And when you come out of it, you feel like a bee that's been trapped inside a jar. And when you get out, all you want to do is stink somebody. All right, I do believe what you say. Now, if you'll only trust me and get in touch with these people. Trust. Now, that's a funny word. It seems the ones that use it the most are the ones you can trust the least. Trust us, they always say. We're only trying to help. Now you're saying it, too. I'm sorry. We're going to have to end this conversation. Wait a no, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm not finished. You have to listen to me. I have things that I've got to... I'm sorry. I don't like to do that. If the caller is still listening, I apologize for cutting you off. But I, I hope you understand that this is something we really can't handle over the phone. I urge you to call the clinic. The number is 555-3409. Call them tonight. You don't have to wait until morning. I really think you need to talk to someone who can help you deal with your anger. Okay, I think we'll take a short break here. This is Talk Line, and we'll be right back. Ooh la la. A French hair salon exclusively for women. Ooh. You all right in there? Oh, I guess so. A little unnerved. Gee Louise, what a total fruit. Ron, I've told you I don't like to hear you make derogatory remarks about the callers. Okay, sorry. I would drop a call. Oh, never mind. I'm just upset. I'm not sure I did the right thing hanging up on him. Hey, look, if you ask me, well, sorry. You're not interested in my opinions. Five seconds. You sure you're ready for round two? I'm ready. I'm sure the worst is over. Ooh, la, la. You're listening to Talk Line, and I'm your host, Tanya Macron. Before we take our next call, I, I want to remind our listeners of something I've said before. This program is no substitute for professional counseling. Sure, I can offer advice, and, and I can sometimes help you figure your way out of minor problems, but I strongly believe one of the most important services I can provide is to encourage people to seek professional help when they need it. Too many of us are reluctant to do that, and it's a shame, because it's, it's the professionals that can really help us sort things out the most. Well, that's enough about that. We'll take our next call. Hello, you're on talk line. Hello, uh, Miss Macklin. I would like to ask... Uh, if, excuse me, could you turn your radio down? Oh, uh, yes, just a minute. Is, is that better? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Miss Macklin, I'm calling about something that I would like to get your advice on. I'm listening. It has to do with a woman that I've been dating for the past seven months. I'm a bachelor, 35 years old. Mm -hmm. She and I get along very well, and, and we enjoy each other's company. I would say the relationship is definitely tending towards marriage. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. I uh, haven't actually asked her yet, but I'm getting around to it. You think she won't say yes? Oh, no. I think she will. That's sort of the problem. I, I mean, well, you see, last night we were having dinner at a restaurant, and I accidentally dropped my napkin. When I went down to pick it up, I noticed for the first time that she had a small tattoo on the inside of her left ankle. I, I think it's a rose. 
I didn't look too closely, and it was pretty dark under the tablecloth. Anyway, what, what I'm wondering is, I mean, I've always been under the impression that women who have had themselves tattooed have usually led to so, some sort of unsavory life. What do you mean by unsavory? You know, the type who ride around on the back of motorcycles and have wild times. Do you think she rides around on the back of motorcycles? No. I mean, at least I don't think so. I guess I should know more about her past, but, but, but I don't. I take it you also don't know if she has other tattoos someplace else. <laughs> no. Actually, we haven't gotten that far in our relationship. But to tell you the truth, it, it has crossed my mind. That's why I was wondering is, if there's anything that you can tell me. I'm afraid I don't know very much about tattoos. Most women seem to have a natural aversion to permanently marking their bodies. In the case of your girlfriend, well, it could be her tattoo does have some connection with some torrid episode in her past. Or it could simply be that she wears it because she likes it, or used to like it. You think I should ask her about it, then? I think you'll have to if your relationship is going to continue to grow. Mm, I, I guess you're right. However, when you do ask her, I'd make it clear that you're interested because you care about her, and that regardless of how or why it got there, it isn't going to change the way you feel about her, assuming that's true. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. I'm sure I could accept almost anything. Good. Then ask her. I think if you're going to end up getting married, it's important that you both get to know a great deal more about each other. Doesn't that make sense? Yes, it does. Very much. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Good luck, and thanks for your call. Hello, you're on talk line. Thanks for calling. Hello, Miss Macklin. My name is Sally Lou. I'm calling about a problem that I hope you can help me with. I'll be glad to try. Well, good. I appreciate that. Hi, Tonya. It's me. That wasn't very nice of you to hang up on me. I don't like being cut off. I don't find it to be... Hello, talk line. Are, are you with us? Hi, Tanya. It's me. You remember, I called last week about the trouble I was having with my husband's best friend. Oh, yes, I do remember. How did it go? Well, I took your advice. I told him what he was doing was not fair to my husband or me. And I told him I just wasn't interested. I said I wasn't going to tell my husband about what happened because I didn't want it to ruin their friendship. But if he tried it again, I would. You think he believed you? Well, so far it's working, although it's only been a week. I've also learned to keep that door locked whenever I'm undressing. <laughs> Good idea. You know, Tanya, it's not that he's bad, and I know he'd never do anything intentionally to hurt my husband's feelings. It's just that, oh, well, with him living there... It's I'll... called proximity. What? Closeness. The three of you living under the same roof. It can strain a marriage and put a real test of friendship. Oh, you're so right. The permanent solution will come when he finds a place and moves out. Until then, I'd continue to keep the door locked. Oh, I intend to. Anyway, I just thought I'd call and let you know I followed your advice and it's working. Good, I'm glad. Thanks for calling and letting us know. Uh-huh. Okay, we're going to take a short break now and be right back with more calls. You're listening to Talkline on WPPX, the voice of Cape Cod. Thinking of remodeling? Thinking of doing it yourself? Before you hey, get Tanya, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was the same guy calling back. Me neither. He had us both fooled. Uh, listen, there's a Dr. Epstein or Epstein on the line. He's been trying to get a hold of you. He says it's urgent, but he can't talk to you on the air. I told him to call back after the show, but he says it can't wait. You want to take it, or should I tell him to get lost? No, I'll take it. Which line is it? Uh, line four. Tanya Macklin. Ms. Macklin, thank God I got through to you. My name is David Epstein. I'm a psychiatrist. Ms. Macklin, the man you spoke with on the radio is an escapee from Bridgewater State Hospital. What? His name is Dennis Luckhurst. He is a psychopath. He is extremely dangerous. He was committed to Bridgewater after being found criminally insane for the murder of a school teacher in Framingham. Ten days ago, he escaped. He killed a guard and critically injured another man getting away. He stole a car. So far, the authorities have been unable to locate him. But are you sure it's him? Positive. I'm one of the psychiatrists who was treating him at the hospital. My wife and I have a home in Sandwich here on the Cape. I happened to be listening to your program when I heard him call in. I tried to get in touch with you immediately, 
I told your engineer it was urgent. I was afraid he wasn't going to let me speak to you. I'm sorry, but what is it you want me to do? Help me find him. We've got to locate him so the police can pick him up. Just a minute, Doctor. Excuse me. Ron, how much time? Five seconds. I'll need more. Go to another commercial. What's going on? I can't explain now. Just do it. Okay, but your fans out there aren't going to hide at point there. Okay, Doctor, I'm back. Smacklin, first of all, can you tell me what is your station's broadcast range? How far does it go? We cover just about all the cave, Provincetown, and as far west as Sandwich. The signal fades almost as soon as you cross over the canal. That means if he is listening, he must be somewhere on the cape. That helps, but it's not good enough. We have to narrow it down. You're going to have to talk to him again. But how can I? He's probably still listening. Go back on the air and invite him to call in again. Apologize. Say you're sorry. Say anything. Just get him to pick up the phone and call you. But, Doctor, if he calls, what do I say? Second time. It doesn't matter. Say anything. Just keep him on the line. As soon as we hang up, I'll call the police. I'll instruct them to monitor your broadcast. If he calls back, they will trace the call, but you must keep him on the line. Okay, I'll try. I'll do my best. Good luck. And Miss Macklin, please be careful. Ron, listen, I don't have time to explain. If that guy calls back, you know the one I mean? Don't cut him off. I have to talk to him. If I'm on another call, signal me through the glass and I'll take it. What's going on? I'll tell you later. Just do it, okay? You're the boss. Three seconds. Two, one... This is Tanya Macklin, and you're listening to Talk Line. Before we take our next call, I'd like to say something to the gentleman who called in earlier. I want to apologize for cutting you off. That was rude, and it was my fault. I obviously didn't give you a chance to say everything you needed to say. So, if you'd like to call back again, I'll be glad to take your call. Here's the number again if you need it. 555-4538. I really hope to hear from you. Hello, you're on Talk Line. Is this it? Am I on? Yes, go ahead. I want to ask Tanya Macklin a question. You're speaking to her. Oh, okay. Um, Miss Macklin, I'm a high school student. You are? What year? I'm a sophomore. You go to school on the cave? Yes, I do. But I'd rather not say which one. That's fine. Go ahead with your question. Um, this year I'm taking French as part of my language requirement. But the place I sit in class is the last seat in the middle row. Well, there's this boy who sits beside me in the next row over, and every time we have a quiz or a test, he always has his book open on the floor, and he copies his answers. He cheats. Yeah, he does. You're trying to decide whether or not you should let him get away with it? Yeah, well, sort of. I mean, what bothers me is he gets away with it. What about the teacher? Isn't he or she in the room when these tests are being given? Yeah, he is. But he writes the test questions on the board. And then he sits down at his desk and buries his hand in a book. He hardly ever looks up. So, in other words, you don't feel he should be allowed to get away with cheating, but you also don't feel good about being a snitch and telling the teacher. That's right. So, well, what do you think I should do? Hmm. Why don't you try this? Next time you have a test, lean over and whisper to him to close his book. That way, you'll let him know that you don't appreciate him cheating, and chances are he will close his book because he won't want to risk getting caught by the teacher. Of course, he won't be grateful to you for butting in, but at least he'll have to respect you a little for not turning him in even though you could have. Does that sound like a good plan? I guess so. Do you think it'll work? I don't know. Probably. Can I ask you something else? Sure, go ahead. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. No, I think I'd better go on to the next caller. I hope I answered your question. Thanks for calling. This is Tanya Macklin. You're on Talk Line. Hello. Tanya? Oh, hi. I'm glad you called back. You are? Now, that's odd. You cut me off twice already. I, I know, and I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I promise I won't do it again. Guess where I'm calling from now? I don't know. I think I hear some cars in the background. I'm in a phone booth. Since my last call, I've been out driving around. But don't worry. I've been listening to you on the car radio. Oh, you have a radio in your car? That's correct. What kind of car is it? Why do you want to know? Oh, no reason. I was just curious. 
Well, it's not my car anyway. I'm borrowing it from a friend. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, let's see. Before, you were starting to tell me about shadows. That was fascinating. I, I wonder, could you explain a little more? I'm not sure I completely understand what you mean. It's like that fellow who called in about his girlfriend. He peeked under the table and saw the tattoo on her ankle. You should have told him to make sure it wasn't a shadow. That's where he's got to be careful. Because if it's a shadow, and she has one down there, she's probably crawling with them up above. Oh, really? You see, that's something I wasn't aware of. That's interesting. Please deposit five cents for the next three minutes. Look, why don't you give me your number and let me call you back? That way you no, won't I have to... I have the money. I have the money. Now, let's see. What were what we talking about? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. You see, it's not simply a question of good or bad or right or wrong. It's more a question of good and evil. Some people don't believe it, but there are definitely shadowy people that we pass by on the street every day. Now, I'm not suggesting they are pure Satans, but there are definitely people whose lives are controlled by evil thoughts. Listen, Dennis, are, are you sure it wouldn't be better if I called you back? What? What did you say? I... A asked if I could call you back. No. You called me Dennis. Oh, I I don't think I did, did I? Yes, you did. I heard you say it. Oh, but how could I? I mean, you haven't told me your name. That's correct. So how could you know? Well, I, I guess you must have mentioned it when you called earlier. No, I didn't. I never told you my name. Well, you must have. How else would I know? That's right. How else could you? Unless, oh, I hear it now, the hissing. What do you mean? I should learn to be more careful. You almost had me fooled. I thought, she's not like the others. But you are, aren't you? No, I'm not. Oh, yes, I can hear them now, very clearly. There are shadows clinging to every word you say. Dennis, please listen to me. I only want to talk to oh, you. Oh, no, we're finished. That's done. You've done enough damage already. Oh, please, Dennis, don't hang up. Let, let me you ask you just one more me. thing. It's my turn to hang up on you. Goodbye, Tonya. It was nice talking. Oh, wait, no, wait, please. <laughs> we're, we're going to take a break now. This is Talk Line. Tanya, what the hell's going on? Who are you talking to? His name is Dennis Luckhurst. He's an escapee from a mental ward. I was supposed to keep him on the line long enough for the police to trace the call. <laughs> I don't think I did. He escaped from a mental ward? Yeah, now he's here on the Cape, but no one knows where. What was he in for? He murdered a school teacher in Framingham. He was committed to Bridgewater, and ten days ago he escaped. He killed a guard and critically injured another man getting away. Oh, if the police don't find him soon, he'll probably kill again. So what are you supposed to do? I was supposed to keep him from hanging up. Now that I've blown it, I don't think there's anything I can do. It's up to the police. Was that why the doctor called? Yeah, his name is David Epstein. He's a psychiatrist who lives in Sandwich. He was one of the doctors who was treating him. Dr. Epstein happened to be listening tonight, and he recognized his voice. I'd better try calling him back. How much time do we have? A couple of minutes. You want me to look up the number? No, I'll do it. I've got a phone book in here. Listen, Tanya, I'm going to take a quick run out to my car for a pack of cigarettes. I'll be right back, honey. Epstein. Epstein. Oh, here it is. Is Dr. Epstein there? No. Who's calling? Is this Mrs. Epstein? Yes. Mrs. Epstein, I have to speak to your husband. It's very, very important. I'm afraid that's impossible. But it can't be. He called me. I, I just spoke to him a few minutes ago. Now, see here. I don't know who you are. But if this is your idea of a practical joke... No, no, it isn't. I really have to speak to him. For your information, you could not have just spoken to my husband, because my husband is dead. Dead? But... 
That can't be. If you don't believe me, I suggest you look up his obituary in the newspaper. He was killed ten days ago by a madman who was escaping from Bridgewater State Hospital, where my husband worked. What was his name? What was whose name? The man who killed your husband. His name was Dennis Luckhurst. Now, I believe I've answered enough questions. You haven't even told me who you are, or what it is that's so important. Oh, nothing. It's, it's nothing. I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Ten days ago. Ten days. Oh, Ron, thank God you're back. Ron? Ron, is that you? Hello, excuse me, the office is closed. You'll have to come back in the morning. What? What, I can't hear you. P push the button to the right of the console. Y yes, that's the one. You hear me now? Ye yes, I can hear you. Miss Macklin, I'm Dr. Epstein. I thought it would be best if I stopped by. Look, you can't come in here right now. I'm just about to go back on the air. Yes, I do. You'll have to wait in the lounge. Yes, of course. Will I be able to hear the program in there? Yes, you can hear it. Fine. You know, you don't look very much like I expected you to look. Of course, you're very attractive. Dr. Epstein? Yes. You, you didn't see anyone outside as you were coming in. No. When I drove up, the parking lot was completely empty. Oh, oh I see. Miss <laughs> Macklin... I believe your commercial has ended. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, thank you. Could you just wait in the lounge? We're back now. I'm Tanya Macklin, and you're listening to Talk Line. Um, this is WPPX you're listening to. Our station is located at number four, Seagull Lane. I, I don't know how many of our listeners have ever stopped by the station before. It's really a lovely spot, just a mile and a half off Route 28 on Seagull Lane. I think before we go on and take our next call, I should explain something. The man I was talking to on the air just before the last commercial is mentally ill. You see, Dr. Epstein, a psychiatrist, asked me to try to help locate this man because he escaped from a mental institution and he needs help desperately. You see, we know this man is here on the Cape and we're just trying to find him before he accidentally hurts someone. So anyway, what I'd like to ask you to do if you're listening right now is to pick up your telephone and call the Yarmouth police. Ask them to come by the station at number four, Seagull Lane. What are you doing? Ask them to come right away, please. Oh. Call the police. Tell them to hurry. Yes. Tell them it's an emergency. Oh, oh, he's here right oh, now. Oh, he's please. trying to get in. Help me. Oh, no, please. Go away. He's coming in. Tanya, you didn't open the door. <laughs> for some time. Oh, yes, I must be. I can hear my voice coming over the radio. Well, first of all, I want to say, Tanya, that I listen to your program every week. Ordinarily, I'd never think of calling in myself. I'm just not the type. But something happened that made me think I should get your advice. I had a group of ladies over to play bridge. You see, we always play bridge on the first Wednesday of every month. Anyway, it was my turn to host the group, and I decided to pay us some side dishes to serve while we were playing. Anyway, as I went into the kitchen to take the hors d'oeuvres out of the refrigerator and warm them in the microwave, one of the ladies came in to tell me she'd seen one of the other guests take something from my desk. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Caller on Line One. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Engineered by John Todd, with sound effects by Scott Dickey, and original music composed by Mark Birmingham. The actors in tonight's play, Lainey Davis as Tanya Macklin. Kevin Groppy was Dennis Luckhurst. John Todd played the engineer. Grace Biggers, caller number one. Dave Margulis, the man with a tattooed girlfriend. Debbie Oney, the woman who keeps her door locked. Patience Martin, a high school student and telephone operator. Lee Olive as Mrs. Epstein. Gene Todd, the final caller. And Frank Mitchell and Debbie Oney, background commercials. Thank <laughs> you.
The show was recorded at HT Recording Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Tomasoni. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. For one final announcement, two job openings are now available for an experienced radio engineer and talk show host. Those interested may apply at WPPX. The pay is good, but job security is not guaranteed. This is Floyd Pratt wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Standing on a footbridge, suspended high above a river gorge. You are standing in the middle of the bridge, halfway across. There are no handrails. There is nothing to hold on to. There is only the bridge itself. You can feel the bridge swaying under your feet, swaying very slightly. Do you feel it? Yes. Now, listen to my voice. Listen only to the sound of my voice. You are not afraid. You feel quite relaxed, even though you are very, very high above the ground. You are the bridge swaying under your feet. Do you feel it? Yes. As you are standing on the bridge... The bridge begins to grow narrow. It is shrinking. It was four feet wide. Now it is three feet wide. Now it is two feet wide. Now one foot. Now it is only six inches wide. Just barely wide enough for your feet to stand on. You are not nervous. You feel completely relaxed. You know as long as you remain perfectly still and perfectly rigid, you will not fall. To maintain your balance, you must remain rigid. Do you understand? Yes. Do you feel afraid? No. That's right. You are not afraid. You feel quite comfortable, even though the river is far, far below you. Now, as you are standing on the footbridge, a wind begins to blow. A gentle breeze. You can feel it through your hair. Feel it pressing against the back of your dress. Feel it touching your legs. Feel the wind. Do you feel it? Yes. The wind is blowing steadily at your back. Now it begins to blow a little harder, with a little more force. Gradually, the velocity of the wind is increasing. With every second, you can feel it growing steadily stronger and stronger. You realize that to maintain your balance, you must now lean against the wind. You must lean backwards. But you must also keep yourself rigid. Go ahead now. Mm. Mm. Pay attention to my voice. Listen only to the sound of my voice. The pressure of the wind is very strong now. It is almost like a hurricane. Keeping yourself absolutely rigid, you must lean back further and further. Keep leaning back. All the way back. All the way. All the way. Very good. Good evening, and welcome once again to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Tonight we present an entirely different sort of radio mystery a taut psychological thriller entitled The Hypnotist. The 
listen now as the hypnotist leads us into the twilight realm of the subconscious mind, into that mysterious and murky domain where the real and the surreal coexist, where the past mingles with the present, and where the specter of terror once encountered presents itself in its purest, most elemental form. Listen to my voice. Listen only to the sound of my voice. No! Name is Karen Jeffries. Just graduated from college. Mommy. He's out there. He's out there again. Police officer, you'd better wait outside. Don't struggle. I mean, I won't hurt you. Struggle. I'll kill you. Pupils responding to light. Up 62, blood pressure 130 over 80. Okay, let's get an IV going. She was this way when we found her. Dr. Lyons, 190, Dr. Lyons. Miss Jeffries. Miss Jeffries, can you hear me? He's out there. Don't worry. I've got them safe and tucked away. Respiration is low. Vital signs maintaining. No evidence of brain injury. Miss Jeffries, can you hear me? She was this way when we found her. Sir? I want the vital signs monitored continually. We need to work up some data and quickly. She's the only one left alive. Let me know immediately if she starts coming around. There's always a possibility she may slip into shock. Miss Jeffries. Miss Jeffries, can you hear me? Miss Jeffries. He's out there again. Miss Jeffries. He's out there. Mommy. Miss Jeffries. Mrs. Jeffries, can you hear me? He's out You're there. wondering where your girlfriends are. Let me know immediately if she starts Mommy. coming around. There's always a possibility she may slip into shock. Lions, contact Mommy. nurse Mommy. station, Dr. Lyon. Four girls in a rooming house. She's the only one. Mommy! Mommy. He's out there. You're wondering where your girlfriends are. Mrs. Jeffries, can you hear me? Last week, we began by examining the concept of evil as embodied in the words of writers like Robert Louis Stevenson, Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells. The neural pathways to the brain appear to be functioning. We've gone over the house upstairs and down. So far, we haven't come up with one iota of physical evidence. A cataleptic state induced by deep psychological trauma. We canvassed the neighborhood. Nobody saw him. Nobody has any idea who he is. Implying that an investigation into the dark side of human nature carries with it its own risk. As you know, there are many forms of coma. Apoplectic coma, metabolic coma, comas brought on by alcoholism, diabetic acidosis, and uremic poison. 
Of course, there is also what is known as a trance coma. The duality of the human mind, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. We've questioned all their old boyfriends and crossed every one of them off the list. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In Karen's case, the lack of responsiveness is not due to any metabolic dysfunction, nor is there any apparent damage to her brain or brain stem. Who postulates that evil is no more than goodness gone berserk. Her EEG readouts oscillate between three and seven cycles per second. She spends most of her time in theta and delta with an occasional touch-up into alpha. The universal mind, the northern hemisphere, and the southern hemisphere. At this point, she's our only lead, the only one who knows who he is, the only one who can possibly identify. The mind has many ways of dealing with stress. Right now, the mind is protecting her from the experience. When she regains consciousness, she will have to deal with the reality of what she went through. To study it requires that we examine it. To examine it is to look upon it directly. To look upon it directly is to risk being possessed by its evil power. How long before we can talk to her? Impossible to say. She still has to regain consciousness. Even then, it may be too much to risk allowing you to question her. Like a Medusa, to examine it, one must do so obliquely. Well, that's a risk we're going to have to take. You can't afford to let this guy keep running around loose. I can't be concerned about that. Right now, I'm concerned about her recovery. Fine. And while you're worrying about that, Doctor, think about this. Right now, he's out there somewhere. He may be looking for other women to do the same thing to. Only this time, maybe it'll be your wife or your daughter. A universal horror. Uncanny and uncontrollable. It rises in a paroxysm of sensitivity like the epileptic fit that arches the back, clenches the teeth, and sends the tongue to fall lifeless into the throat of its victim. He's out there again. An amorphous shape, moving within a swirling black cloud. The dark side of the moon. talking about? Who is he? If nobody knows who he is, maybe we should call the police. After all, nobody knows who Perhaps one of us should go out and get his license number. Go ahead. Why me? It's your idea. Yeah, but you saw him first, Gail. He's probably harmless, right? But then why are we both acting like we're afraid of him? If he's out there again tomorrow, I am calling. This is Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed is a psychiatrist. He's also an expert in clinical hypnosis. Hello, Sydney. Oh, I didn't realize that you two already knew each other. Sure. I know Dr. Reed. We've used him on a number of cases. Every time we had a witness whose memory was a little vague. Of course, that was before the court said no to hypnosis. Now the only thing they let you use hypnosis for are psychiatric evaluations at Bridgewater. Isn't that right, Doc? Dr. Reed is going to try hypnotizing our patient. What? Are you crazy? You can't do that. You'll destroy her value as a witness. I'm not interested in her value as a witness. I'm interested in her recovery. Wait a minute. You don't understand. Once she's been hypnotized, she's worthless. The courts won't allow her to testify. Relax, Sidney. We're going about it differently this time. We're not going to hypnotize her. Just the opposite. She's already in a trance state. 
We are simply using the techniques of hypnosis to try and bring her out of it. You want her conscious again, don't you? How are we doing today? Still not talking? That's all right. You just relax. We're going to take good care of you. Now, I'm just going to roll you over. Carol, have you seen the chart for the patient in room 7? No. Is it missing? It's not where it should be. Probably one of the doctors walked off with it. They're always doing that. Yeah, I know. How are you doing? Terrible. Pat felt sick and had to go home. I've been rushing around like crazy. All the patients on her wing were late getting their meds. How's she doing? Oh, the same. You know Sharon down at admitting? Said a man stopped by and asked about her condition. Oh, he also wanted to know what room she was in. Did she tell him? Well, no, she didn't. She said she wasn't permitted to give out any information. Did he leave his name? No, but that's not unusual. Did Sharon tell the police? No. She should have. After all, that's the reason they've got a guard stationed outside this door. Well, it's probably too late. I'll tell her if it happens. Again. Better tell her to report it anyway. They'll probably want a description. Okay, I'll tell her. I sure hope they catch that guy. You're not kidding. Normally, I'm against capital punishment, but after what he did to those four girls, I'd be willing to take him out and shoot him myself. Yes, I heard. She's three years younger than you, you know. Come back, dear. You're not lost. Come back. Mommy. I don't understand you. When there are so many nice, eligible young men who are interested in you. Mother, that doesn't mean I'm interested in them. Is she going to recover? You have to understand. She expected she was going to die. She would have if something had not frightened the killer off. I have to be in love first. When is that going to happen? Don't worry, I'll let you know. I'm right here, but you don't even know it. Mommy! Knowing with certainty that you're about to be murdered is one of the most stressful situations the mind can endure. Karen, I'll be back tomorrow. Move the lamp closer to her bed. A little closer. I want it shining down on her. That's good. Thank you very much. Karen, if you can hear me, listen to my voice. Listen to me, Karen. Pay attention to my voice. Listen and concentrate on my voice. Picture, if you can, a beautiful mountain lake. You are standing on a floating platform out in the middle of the lake. The water in the lake is perfectly clear and perfectly calm. As you look down, you can see straight through the water to the pebbles on the bottom. Look at the pebbles, Karen. The water is so clear, so perfectly transparent. You feel as if you're floating on air. you 
look in front of you, you can see white, billowy clouds drifting overhead. Their images are reflected across the surface of the water. Look at the clouds, Karen. Watch the clouds. As you continue to watch them, you begin to feel as though you are one of these clouds. Weightless. Floating. Completely. Relaxed. Totally at peace. Feel yourself floating. Now, you begin to feel yourself drifting upwards through the clouds. You are rising towards the sun. Already, you can feel the sunlight warm on your skin. Feel the sun and relax. Now, I am going to count to three. When I reach the number three, you will have broken through the clouds. You will then open your eyes. You will be awake and feeling fine. One, feel yourself continuing to drift upwards, moving towards the light. Two, you are coming into consciousness now. The clouds are thinning out. Three, you have broken through. Open your eyes, Karen. Karen. Listen to me. Open your eyes. Doctor. <sighs> Nothing. No response. We'll try again later. Just call to tell you I'm going to be here a little while longer. Mm, no, no change. Hmm? I don't know. They say keep talking to her, keep her stimulated. Hmm. Do you want me to pick up anything from the store? Oh, you heard from the police? Oh, what did they say? Hmm. No, I didn't think so either. Hmm. All right. I'll try not to be too long. Five days, and you seem as distant as ever. Why are you so determined not to be aroused, Karen? You have to come out sometime. You know, you may find this hard to believe, but I feel I already know you. Ironic, isn't it? Me, the hypnotist. And yet I feel as though I'm the one who's been hypnotized. Sleeping Beauty casts a spell even as she sleeps. Come out, Karen. Come out and let me prove to you that 
Not all men are like that. It's like moving inside a dream. Standing in front of a door that swings inward, a man is waiting to take my ticket. His face is hidden inside a dark wind that swirls round and round his head. I hand him my ticket. He stamps it and hands it back, saying, Be careful. You may never find your way out. The rooms are like rooms in a boarding house. The house is like a maze. One room leads to another, endless, convoluted and twisting. I seem to be looking for someone. I can't quite remember who. All I know is that I keep searching, moving from room to room, always with the feeling that someone was just here. Upstairs, I hear a shower running. I can feel myself moving in the direction of the sound. I feel my hand slide along the rail. The bathroom is at the end of the hall. I see a bright light shining out from under the door. I knock. There is no answer. Open the door. Everything in the room is completely white. The fixtures are white. The walls, the floor, the ceiling are all white. The air is filled with steam. The walls are slippery. Gail, Laurie, who's in here? With my hand, I reach out and draw back the plastic shower curtain. But there is no one. Where did everybody go? I turn around and face the mirror above the sink. With my hand, I reach out and wipe away the steam. Suddenly, behind me, there's a woman standing beneath the shower head. She's like a Greek statue. Her face is alabaster. Her lips are without color. Her eyes have no pupils. As the water rushes down, her face is slowly dissolving, slowly washing away. I hear a man's voice coming up the stairs. I try to run. I can't move. I'm like a statue myself. I'm... No, don't struggle. I won't hurt you. Struggle, I'll kill you. You're wondering where your girlfriends are. You're wondering what's become of them. Don't worry. I've got them safely tucked away. You'll be joining them very soon. Listen to me, Karen. I'm going to say goodnight now. Before I go, I want to give you a small meditation. Listen to me. I'm going to teach you my favorite way of flying. Listen to me now. Listen. I want you to imagine yourself in an 
open field on a hillside that lets you see all of the sky on a beautiful sunny day with the sky a deep fathomless blue with white billowy clouds floating on the air very high above you as you look at the clouds as you watch them keep looking keep watching the clouds you feel your body begin to leave the earth moving upwards keep watching the clouds don't look at anything but the clouds you are flying now you are up in the clouds you feel happy so happy happier than you have ever felt before Visiting hours are now over. The hospital requests that all visitors please observe this rule. Visiting hours will resume again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Visiting hours are now over. Hello? That's right. This is Miss Jeffrey's room. Officer Murphy. What? Are you sure he asked for her by name? Is he still there? Yes. Yes, definitely. Can you hold him? Yes, I'm coming right down. Where are you now? Which entrance? All right, keep him there. Don't let him get away. Use force if you have to. I'm coming. Where's the guard who's supposed to be outside this door? Gee, I don't know. There was no one here when I came out. That still doesn't tell me who you are. Who gave you permission to be in here? Look, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm her cousin. I thought... Did you report to the nurse's station? No. Was I supposed to? They would have told you no one is being allowed in to see her. I thought if I just sat by her bedside... I'm afraid not. She's not to be disturbed. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Her pulse is racing. What's that mean? She's not going to die, is she? She may be coming out of it, or she may be slipping deeper into a coma. I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. All right, Doc. And call a nurse on your way out. All right, I'll go to bed. Didn't mean to barge in. <coughs> uh, 
That's all right. I don't think we've met. My name is Alan Reed. I've been working with Miss Jeffries using hypnosis. Yes, I've heard. I know it's a bit late, but I thought I would come in and work with her some more. How's she doing? Oh, she seems to be holding the room. I was just checking on her myself. Why is her heart beating like that? It's not unexpected. However, I was just about to give her an injection, something to calm her down. Dr. Morgan, report to ICU. Dr. Morgan. What happened to the guard outside the door? Oh, he stepped down the hallway to the bathroom a few minutes ago. He said he would be coming right back. Dr. Morgan, I see you. Dr. Morgan, staff. That's you, isn't it? I'm sorry. Aren't you Dr. Morgan? It does say so on your coat. Oh, yes. You're wanted in ICU. Yes, of course. Just as soon as I finish with this injection. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Inside an elevator. Above the doors are numbers that light up to tell you what floor you're on. Look at the numbers, Karen. Look up and see them. In, in front of you, you see a row of buttons. Numbers 1 through 12. You want to go to the top floor. Push the button. Push number 12. Listen to me, Karen. The elevator will take you up, but you must push the button. See it with your mind. Reach out and push the button. Do it now, Karen. Push the button. Now. Very good. Very good. You did it. Now, feel as the elevator begins to move. You are going up. Watch the numbers as they light up. Number one. Number two. Number three. Surprise. Number four. Number five. Moving towards the surface. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Feel the elevator moving. Feel the extra weight of gravity as you travel upwards. Number nine. Number ten. Listen to me, Karen. Concentrate. Keep watching the numbers. You have passed the tenth floor. When you reach the twelfth floor, the elevator door will open. You will then open your eyes. You will be awake and feeling fine. Do you understand? You will be awake and fully conscious. Going down. You are almost there. The elevator is arriving. Number twelve. Karen, open your eyes. You did it. You opened them. Yes. Do you know where you are? In a hospital? That's right. But why am I here? Don't you remember? No. Good. Don't try to remember now. It's not important. 
Are you a doctor? I'm a psychiatrist. Is that what I mean? A psychiatrist? Possibly, yeah. Uh, however, I'm afraid even if you don't need one, you're still going to have to talk to me. You see, up to now, I've been doing all the talking. If you know anything about psychiatrists, you know we're never comfortable talking. We much prefer to listen. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Hypnotist. Tonight's program was produced by Stephen Oney and Mark Birmingham. Written and directed by Stephen Oney. Engineering and original music by Mark Birmingham. The actors in tonight's play, Neil McGarry, The Hypnotist. Debbie Oney was Karen Jeffries. Kevin Grappi, Dr. Rubin. Bill Dane was the killer. Jeff Kamish, Dr. Morgan. Mary B. Jones, the mother. Sean Hurley was Officer Murphy. Carol McManus, nurse number one. Christy Weimar, nurse number two. Jack Brady, the detective. Robert Nolan, the professor. Wendy Iwanski was Gail and the voice on the intercom. Additional voices supplied by Mark Birmingham, Christy Weimar, and Carol McManus. The Hypnotist was recorded at Rosemead Production Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This program is made possible with the cooperation of the Public Media Foundation. This is Bob Nolan wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. presents The Legacy of Uriah Pillar, a suspense thriller in the classic tradition. So now, we invite you to sit back, relax, and listen to The Legacy of Uriah Pillar, a tale of treachery and deceit. And a story that proves once again that a death in the family can be expensive. It can sometimes cost an arm and a legacy. Yes, uh, Captain Waverly Underhill, yes, I, I, I know him quite well, a, a retired gentleman, a widower, former police captain. He lives alone in a bungalow in Dunwoody Village, just outside Hyannisport. You've seen him, perhaps, tall, white-haired, with drooping eyebrows, wearing a bow tie and a blazer, strolling along Main Street, or sometimes in Bermuda shorts and sandals, with his knobby knees showing, walking along the beach at low tide, lost in thought, occasionally bending down to examine a seashell. Well, you've seen me, too. That is, if you happen to be one of my patients, or perhaps you've noticed my shingle hanging out front of my office on Ocean Street. My name is Alexander Schofield, a general practitioner, not quite retired. I, I first met Captain Underhill when he came to see me about some slight ailment that was bothering him. We became friends, and after that I'd see him oh, once or twice a month, and we'd have dinner together. 
Often he'd tell me about the police cases that he'd been involved in. It was during one such dinner at the Dock Street Charterhouse that he first heard him tell about the strange case of Uriah Pillar. The subject came up when I asked him about what he'd been up to that day. He told me he'd gone out to visit his wife's grave. You can't imagine, Doctor. It's more lovely and peaceful every time I go. You can hardly tell anymore where the ground was disturbed. Shows how fast Mother Nature recovers. Much faster than humans, I think. This time when I left her, I took the long way round, along the path that leads up the hill, where you can get a fine look out over Cape Cod Bay. Oh, yes. I know that view. I passed Uriah Pillar's mausoleum. Gray granite surrounded by an iron rail fence with tall cedars standing guard all round. You remember that case, don't you, Schofield? Very strange. Bizarre. I told him I did not recall him ever mentioning it. I'm sure I did. I must have. Didn't I? I repeated I did not think so. Even so, I told him I could hardly be expected to recall every case he'd ever had a hand in solving. Looking at him across the table, he seemed troubled by his inability to recall. Underhill often complained to me that senility was robbing him of his mental faculties. Well, I can assure you this was not the case. We'd all do so well as to have a mind as senile as Captain Underhill's. If you want my opinion, I believe his senility was nothing more than a masquerade he adopted whenever it was convenient, especially if he wished to disarm a person he was dealing with. After a few minutes, when it seemed he was not going to continue, I was finally forced to prod him. Well... Aren't you going to tell me about it? Hmm? About what? About the pillar case. You were starting to tell me. <laughs> you want to hear about bed sheets? There. You see what I mean? If that is senility, then the diploma hanging on my wall is a fishing license. Took a little more prompting, but I was finally able to get him to continue. Uriah Pillar was a rich man. Born wealthy, he spent most of his life compounding the money he inherited from his family. He was also a peculiar man with the sort of eccentricities millionaires are prone to have. For example, he believed that postage stamps were laden with germs. So whenever he wanted to mail a letter to avoid licking the stamp, he licked the envelope and pressed the stamp to the moistened corner. You know the sort of person I mean, Doctor. And no doubt some of your patients fall into the same category. Oh, yes, I do. Sometimes I think at least half of my patients are that way. Uriah Pillar married a woman who bore him two sons before she died. The oldest son was named Simon, and in many ways he was a carbon copy of his father. Industrious, frugal, and stern in his judgments. Simon was married to a woman named Audrey. She was younger than he... Uh, four years younger, I think. Well, four years is not so much. I suppose not. Anyway, they had no children. They lived together on a farm in West Barnstable where they raised horses. Excuse me, gentlemen. If you're finished, I'll take your place. Yes, I, I think we're finished. My scallops were excellent. Would you like coffee or would you like to see a dessert menu? Oh, no dessert for me, but I, I will have coffee. You prefer tea, don't you, Doctor? Oh, yes, sir. With a wedge of lemon, please. Anything else? No, I think that'll be all. Well, go on, Captain. You're saying... Uh, let's see. Let's see. Where was I? Well, you were telling me about uh, Uriah Pillar's two sons. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, the oldest was Simon. The youngest was Leander. Leander was born ten years after Simon, and even at the age of 26, he was still considered the baby of the family. Leander had never done well in school, although what was lacking in his studies he seemed to make up for in popularity. He barely finished high school and then dropped out of college after only one semester. He returned to the Cape, got an apartment of his own, and planned to take a year off to, to find himself. Five years later, he had still not come round to applying his nose to the grindstone of a career. Of course, this worried the old man and infuriated the hard-working older brother, who by anyone's standards must have been born with his shoulder to the wheel, his nose to the grindstone, and all other parts of his anatomy otherwise engaged in the process of making money. Here's your coffee. And here is your tea. Uh, you know, miss, I've changed my mind. I, I believe I'll have a piece of your delicious Boston cream pie. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll have a plate of sliced bananas. Just sliced bananas? That's right. High in potassium. It's good for the brain. Helps fight off senility and keeps the mind from becoming confused. Oh, really? I didn't know that. 
I'll have to check to see if we have any. Be right back. So, what happened next, Waverly? What happened is that Uriah Pillar found out he was dying and that he had only a short time left to live. All his precautions about not licking stamps had apparently not been able to ward off Hodgkin's disease. Gradually, as his final months ran down to none, he began to worry more and more about the rift that existed between his two sons. He hoped that before he died, he could find some way to bridge the gap and to bring them closer together. It was this thought that occupied the forefront of his thinking as he sat down to compose his last will and testament. No one knew what arrangements the old man made until after his death, when it came time for the reading of the will. The reading took place in the office of Horatio Salazar, Esquire, a successful attorney and bachelor, who on this particular afternoon sat behind his desk, puffing on a cigar and making idle conversation with Leander, while waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Simon Pillar to show up. Well, Leander, I expect you'll be playing on the town softball squad again this year. I guess so. Our team did pretty well last year. <laughs> That's right, you did. How many games did you win in all? Excuse me a moment. Yes. Salazar, Mr. and Mrs. Simon Pillar are here. Fine, fine. Send them in. Now that your brother and sister-in-law are here, we can finally get started. Simon, come in, come in. Good to see you. Hello, Mr. Salazar. You know my wife? Audrey? No, we haven't met. How do you do? How do you do? Please, be seated, Mrs. Pillar. Let me offer you this chair. Thank you. I don't suppose that any further introductions are necessary. Hello, Simon. Audrey? Let's get on with it. We're not here to waste time. All right, Simon. I'll start by reading the will. That could take a while, couldn't it? Just tell us what it says. Very well. Let me begin by saying that I've carefully gone over all the terms of the will, and everything seems to be in order. However, there are certain peculiarities. What sort of peculiarities? I'll get to them in just a moment. As you know, your father left an estate worth a considerable sum of money. According to the stipulations in the will, his house and property are to be sold to cover the estate tax and any other outstanding debts. The balance of his estate is to be divided equally between his two sons, half going to Simon and half to Leander. The actual amount each of you will receive is $548,000. That sounds pretty straightforward. What about his other holdings? Actually, there are no other holdings. You see, before Uriah Pillar died, he converted everything into cash. But why? I'm coming to that. Of course, there's no reason it should present a problem, providing that... Then get on with it. Quit beating around the bush. Simon, will you just relax? He's coming to it. Listen, buddy, you can just shut up. When I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. And stop squeaking that chair. It's annoying. Don't tell me what to do. Gentlemen, please... I was only saying that if we will all cooperate, there shouldn't be any problem. Just what is this problem you keep alluding to? Just this. The money your father left to both of you has been placed in a strong box and buried underground in an undisclosed location. What? what? The will states that I'm to present each of you with a key to your own safe deposit box. Inside each box, you will find half of a set of instructions that will tell you exactly where the money is buried. It ought for you to find the money and to claim your share... It will be necessary for you to combine both halves. But I don't get it. You see, Leander, it was your father's intention that his two sons put aside their differences. He hoped that by doing this, he could bring about a reconciliation. <laughs> of course, all that's required of the two of you is to arrange a convenient time. Not so fast. I think Audrey and I will wait a while and think it over. I don't understand. The money's not going anywhere, is it? No, but surely you realize it without your cooperation. And I say, what's the rush? We'll think about it. Right now, the money is sort of an escrow, which is a good place to leave it until we decide how we want to spend it. Of course, that could take some time. It might even take years. <laughs> I can't believe it. Sit down, Lee. I just can't believe it. Mr. Salazar, how could you let them get up and walk out like that? Lee, sit down. Now listen to me. There's no point in arguing with him. It would have only aggravated the situation further. But you heard what he said. He's not going to claim his share. Wait a minute. There must be something I can do. Isn't there some legal action I can take? You mean like contest the will? That won't do any good. And if you're thinking of suing your brother, you can try, but you won't win. 
The terms of the will are clearly stated. Your father intended that both you and your brother should freely decide what to do. No judge is going to force Simon to hand over his half of the instructions if he doesn't want to. You're saying I'm stuck? You're saying there's nothing I can do? I didn't say that. But I think you should be patient. Give it a little time, your brother might change his mind. That chance. You could try talking to Audrey. Oh, that wouldn't do any good. She thinks just like him. Then I suggest if you're really serious about collecting your share of the inheritance, there's only one thing you can do. Which is what? Change. Reform. Earn your brother's respect. You mean be like him? You don't have to go that far. However, if you were a little more motivated, a little more industrious, your brother might change his opinion. Why not work at it? It might take a year, it might take longer. But I'm sure that in time your brother will come around and change his views. After all, Lee, if you can find a way to reconcile your differences, it would be the best for everyone. It would be fulfilling your father's last wish. It's what he wanted more than anything. Here's your Boston cream pie, and here are your sliced bananas. Would you like cream to go with them? No, thank you. I like them plain. Will there be anything else? Uh, no, no, thank you very much, that's all. Uh, Captain Underhill, do you mean the older brother would actually deny his share of the inheritance simply to, to spite his younger brother? It, it, it seems incredible. It was incredible, and, and yet that is exactly what happened. For a time, Leander tried taking the lawyer's advice. He tried improving his lifestyle in an effort to upgrade himself in his brother's estimation. Gradually, however, he began to feel it was useless. So he gave up. Leander was just not the type who could apply himself to anything for very long. Well, what happened? Something must have changed, unless... Good Lord, you don't mean the money is still buried? No, no, something did change. And it was the lawyer who brought it about. Horatio Salazar approached Leander and offered him a deal. Ten cents on the dollar. He would pay Leander $50,000 in cash in exchange for his half of the instructions and a waiver, relinquishing forever any claim to his share of the inheritance. The lawyer had Leander pretty well figured. He knew the temptation of receiving even a fraction of his inheritance would prove irresistible against the prospect of waiting who knows how long for the older brother to change his mind. So on a Monday morning in the middle of May, Leander Piller met with Horatio Salazar at his office and signed a contract giving over his share in exchange for $50,000. It, it seems to me this Salazar fellow is taking quite a gamble. After all, how did he know that Simon would be any more willing to deal with him than he was with Leander? A valid point, Carter. Except that soon after the transaction was complete, events began to happen quite rapidly. On that same Monday in May, at approximately 7.30 in the evening, there came the sound of a motorcycle pulling up outside Horatio Salazar's house. Just a minute. Uh, who is it? It's me. Leander, this is unexpected. Come on in. I was just having dinner. Thanks. Your housekeeper isn't here, is she? Mildred? No, she went home some time ago. Look, friend, if it's about that contract you signed this morning, I hope you're not having second thoughts. No, it's not that. Wait a minute. Step more to light. Good God, look at you. Your clothes are a mess. Your face streaked with dirt. What happened? Did you fall off your motorcycle? Mr. Salazar, I... Mr. Salazar, Simon is dead. Dead? I found his body while I was out trail riding. He was lying in the field beside his house. I knew it was him right away. He was... He had been shot through the head. Uh, have you gone to the police? No, I, I, I didn't. You should have reported it. Why didn't you? Because I couldn't. I had to come here first. Lee, before you say anything more, tell me the truth. Did you kill him? No. No, I didn't. I swear it. Oh, all right. I believe you. We'll simply have to tell the police you thought it was best to consult your lawyer before reporting the crime. That won't look good, but it'll have to do. 
Now go on, tell me the rest. Tell me everything. When did all this happen? I don't know. I only know when I found his body, he looked like he had been dead for some time. His clothes were damp. There was a heavy dew last night. He must have been lying in that field for at least 12 hours. All right, all right. Let's approach this from the beginning. Start with last night. Tell me where you went. Tell me everything you did. I went to Fiddlejack's. How long were you there? From about 10.30 until it closed at 1 o'clock. I was with friends the whole time. We had a few beers and we... Why did you stop? You remembered something. What is it? Nothing. You'd better tell me now if there's any chance of it coming out later. It was just something stupid, I said. I must have been half drunk. They were teasing me about the inheritance, saying I was never going to get it. I told them I had finally figured out a way to collect my share. I didn't tell them about our deal. I let them think I was going to get the actual money. And what did they say? They laughed. They didn't believe me. They said Simon was never going to change his mind, that he would sooner croak before he let me get my hands on a single penny of what was rightfully mine. What did you say to that? I don't remember. You don't remember? I really don't. I was drunk. I can't remember what I said. All right, go on. When you left Fiddlejacks, what did you do? I went home. I went to bed. Alone? Yes, alone. Can you prove that you went home and went to bed? Yes. Well, no, not exactly. Nobody saw me, if that's what you mean. So you could have gone out again. But I'm telling you, I didn't. What about this morning? What did you do when you got up? You know. I went out and ate breakfast. Then I met you at your office. We signed the contract. Then I strapped a six-pack of beer on the back of my bike and went trail riding to celebrate. Then around five o'clock, I found his body. Five o'clock? It's 7.45 now. I thought you came straight here. I did. I mean... I must have been mistaken about the time. Damn it, Lee. Don't lie to me. I'm the only one that can save you. All right. If you want the truth, I'm late because I tried to bury him. You what? Don't you see? I knew they'd think I did. I figured if they can't find the body, they can't prove I did it. They can't even charge me. You stupid fool. I got him off the ground and laid him across my bike and drove him into the woods. I tried digging a grave, but I, I didn't have a shovel. After a while, I knew it wasn't going to work, so I... I put him back where I found him. My boy, don't you realize what you've done? In trying to cover up, you've done the worst possible thing to convince the police that you're guilty. I put the body back. It doesn't matter. They'll see the tracks. They'll find the grave. Mr. Salazar, I didn't kill him. It's not whether I believe you. It's whether the jury will believe you. And I'm afraid... Mr. Salazar, if we show them the contract, they'll know I couldn't have done it. I no longer had a motive. It won't work. Why not? You said your brother was killed sometime last night. But we didn't sign the contract till this morning. The police will say you went out there last night to try one last time to convince your brother to give in. No. And when he refused, you killed him. No. And then you tried to hide the body. No, it didn't happen that way. In this case, I'm afraid appearances speak louder than words. Please, Mr. Salazar, you know the law. There must be something I can do. I'm afraid there's only one thing you can do. As a lawyer, I shouldn't be the one to tell you this. You can come out now. Is he gone? Yes, Audrey. He's gone and he won't be coming back. Very nice, dear. I must say you did that very well. I was almost convinced myself. A good lawyer must be skilled in the art of persuasion. I must say you certainly lived up to your end of the bargain. Well, as the future Mrs. Horatio Salazar, I didn't want to let you down. What are you doing, you devil? What does it look like? Ooh, whatever it is, I like it. <laughs> in the woods like this is giving me the creep. I am hurrying. I can't take any faster. Shouldn't we have hit it by now? How deep are you? Five, six feet. Don't worry, it's here. The instructions were very precise. It just doesn't say how deeply it was buried. Oh, I'm getting so jittery. I can't stand it. It will help you relax. You can get down here and try digging for a while. Wait. It's keeping it. Oh, holy, I hope so. It's a strong box, all right. Hold the light steady. I can't see. I'm trying. It's him. Can you take it? I, I think so. You got it? Yes, you, yes, you can let go. Okay, watch out. Here comes the shovel. Oh, 
watching you shine the light right in my eyes. Gee, sorry, Mr. Salazar. What? Who's there? Don't you recognize my voice? Lee? Lee, is that you? Lee, wait a minute. It's not what you think. We were going to share it with you, I swear it. I know, Mr. Salazar. I don't doubt that for a minute. Lee, wait. Let me come up and explain. You see this gun? I think you better stay where you are. My God, Lee, I didn't kill your brother. I swear it. It wasn't me. Lee, it was Audrey. She did it. She killed him. Mr. Salazar, you shouldn't make accusations like that unless you're sure you have all the facts. You know what I think? I think you killed him. I think the police are going to think so, too. Lee, you can't get away with this. Audrey, really? And why not? Audrey's prepared to testify that you went to see her husband. You showed him the contract proving that you bought out my half. You tried to make a deal. Simon refused. There was an argument, and you shot him. Of course, I'll show them a copy of the contract. When the police see that you gambled $50,000 on being able to convince Simon to go along... Well, naturally, they'll understand why you were so upset when he turned you down. Hold it, wait a minute. You're forgetting one thing. Your brother was murdered last night, but the contract was signed this morning. I didn't have a motive till today. Mr. Salazar, you surprise me. Being a lawyer, you should know better than to believe everything you're told. That story I told you about Simon being murdered, it isn't true. Well, it isn't a way except for one thing. It hasn't happened yet. But don't worry. It will. And when it does, there will be plenty of evidence pointing directly to you. Of course, the fact that you left town in a hurry will look mighty suspicious. Lee, watch out! I've got dirt in my eyes. I can't see. Lee, shoot him! Help me, I can't! What do I do? Hit him! With what? The, the flashlight. I'll use the flashlight. Hold him still. Quit rolling! <sighs> Lee, Lee, the light's gone out. I, I can't see a thing. Lee, are you all right? Lee, answer me. What's this? Oh, the shovel. All right, I've got the shovel. Don't move. Lee, if it's you, say something. Please answer me. If you don't, I'll... It's okay. It's, it's Laura. Oh, oh Lee, thank God. God. Get him off me. Okay, help me get him into the pit. I'm going down to make sure he doesn't come to. Find me the gun. I dropped it somewhere. Well, Mr. Lawyer, I guess things didn't work out exactly like you planned. I hope you're nice and comfortable because you're going to be here a long, long time. Audrey, where the hell is she? What's taking her so long? Audrey! Audrey! I'm coming, will you wait? I had to go back to the car for another flashlight. Here's the gun. But but wait, don't do not do it yet. What's the matter? I'm, Why not? I'm, I'm going back to the car. I, I don't feel like watching. All right, wait there for me. This won't take long. Oh, where is he? What's taking him so long? I can't stand waiting in this car much longer. What was that? Oh, Lee, thank God it's you. Were you expecting someone else? Oh, don't be funny. What was that bump I just heard? That was me putting the money in the trunk. Or did you want me to leave it behind? Well, what took you so long? I've been waiting forever. I had to fill the hole back in, didn't I? Lee. What? I... I didn't hear you fire another shot. I didn't bother. I figured, why take a chance on somebody hearing? Oh, my God. So what do you want me to do? Go back and dig him up? Oh, my God. Forget it. It's done. He's dead. <sighs> now, let me have the papers. The what? The papers. The instructions. They're in your purse. Let me have them. Well, what, what are you going to do? Your liner, too. I'm making sure these don't fall into the wrong hands. We wouldn't want that to happen, would we? It could prove embarrassing. everything. How are the bananas? Just right. Not too hard, not too soft. Perfectly right. What you said about potassium, is that true? Ask the doctor. Yes, it's a proven medical fact. Older people, if they don't get enough potassium, are apt to become disoriented and confused. Bananas being rich in potassium help prevent a deficiency from developing. For older people, a banana a day is probably better than an apple a day. 
It helps me remember to forget to pick up the check. Miss, uh, do we have time for an after-dinner drink before the bar closes? Waverly, will you join me? I assume you uh, still have more to tell me about this case. We don't stop serving for another 45 minutes. In that case, I'll have a drum buoy. What about you, sir? Do you want a banana daiquiri? Oh, no. No, thank you. I, I've had my quota for the day. I'll have a Quantro on the rocks. I'll bring them right over. Well, please, Captain, go on now. What happened next? Uh, pretty much what you'd expect. Simon Pillar was found murdered. Killed by a gunshot. The police investigated and came to the conclusion the lawyer was responsible. A warrant was issued for his arrest. Of course, he was never apprehended. Well, what about Audrey and uh, Leander? They waited for things to settle down. When the matter was largely forgotten, they moved to another town further out in the Cape. And the widow, Mrs. Simon Pillar, became the new Mrs. Leander Pillar. Which must have been a great convenience as far as the initials on her luggage was concerned. Their marriage lasted a good two years, and then Audrey began to suffer from a nervous condition that is often associated with mental strain. During the day, she was high-strung. At night, she had difficulty sleeping. Of course, she saw a doctor who recommended she consult a psychiatrist and who wrote her a prescription for sleeping tablets. She didn't see the psychiatrist, but she did take the pills. And nevertheless, her condition grew steadily worse. No, 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 you can't come in here. The child is taken away. Huh? Go back. What is it? Go back. It's very now. Go oh, Audrey. Away. I told you, leave me alone. Audrey, what? Audrey. What? what? What is it? What's the matter? You were talking in your sleep again. Oh, oh I, I was. I, I'm sorry. Did I wake you? What, what did I say? I, I don't even remember what I was dreaming. I couldn't make it out. Go downstairs and make yourself a cup of hot chocolate. Maybe it'll help you sleep. All right, dear. I'm sorry I disturbed you. It's these dreams. I, I can't seem to get control of them. Don't wait up for me. Go back to sleep if you can. She can't control them, huh? What am I supposed to do? Sit back and watch while she goes to pieces? No wonder the doc wants to see a psychiatrist. He's no fool. He knows when people walk and talk in their sleep, it means something in the subconscious is trying to get out. <sighs> That'll be the day when I let her lie on some shrink's couch and explain what the trouble is. Dear, would you like a cup, too? No, thanks. Hmm. She walks in her sleep. Oh, I've changed my mind. I don't want a cup after all. Dear, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to have any. Are you sure you don't want some? Oh, he's fallen asleep. I wish it was that easy for me. Oh, let me see. I'd better make sure the stove is off or I'll end up traipsing back down here in my sleep. Don't forget to turn off the lights. Oh, the banister is dusty. I can feel it. Oh, I'll dust in the morning. <gasps> What happened, dear? Were you walking in your sleep? I told you it was a dangerous thing to do. You look sound asleep now, though. You dropped off nicely that time. Something I can help you with. Oh, dear Lord, what a start you gave me. I didn't see you stepping around the corner. I was just coming up to ring your bell. Are you looking for directions back to the highway? No, no, that I'm not. My name is Father O'Connor. I come from the boys' town in Plymouth. Have you heard of us? I don't think so. Look, if it's a ballot donation... Oh, I... no, it isn't that. Your name is Leander Pillard, is it not? That's right. And you're the person I've come to see. I see. Well... If it's about my wife, I appreciate your stopping by. Your wife? I'm certain I don't know what you mean. She died. Oh, no. No. Oh, what a shame. Was it sudden? Yes, it was. 
Look, Father... That's a terrible blow for If you could just tell me what it is... You see, it has to do with our boy. I tried to tell you already. And your father's will. What about my father's will? Well, uh, could we just step inside? I promise I'll not take up too much of your time. The house is kind of a mess right now. Why don't you just tell me what this is all about? Oh, of course. Forgive me. I don't want to impose. Well, you see, Leander... Your father, during his lifetime, made several generous contributions to our boys. And when he died, God rest him, he made quite a substantial bequest in his will. A bequest? I wasn't aware of any bequest. Well, and neither were we. That is, until quite recently. I don't follow you. You see, before your father died, he mailed me a letter. I didn't open it, because his instructions were that it was not to be opened until five years after his death. That was last Wednesday, you see. When I opened it, I found in addition to the letter addressed to me, a copy of the will and a set of directions. Directions? Instructions of where to go to find the money. Your father was always a practical man. As the letter explained, if his two sons did not collect the money, he didn't want it to stay buried forever, never to do anyone any good. So he sent me the letter with the authorization that in five years' time, if the money had not been recovered... We could go and claim it ourselves and spend it on our boys. Then I'm afraid you're out of luck. That money was dug up a long time ago. Oh, surely it was. But there's also the matter of the second strong box. A what? The one that contains the money your father left to us. It was put in a second strong box and buried directly underneath the first. You only have to dig down a little deeper and... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say something wrong? What? No, it... It's just that I'm a little surprised, that's all. That does sound like something my father would do. Well, your father was a peculiar man. But when it came to our boys, his heart was always in the right place. Did you bring the letter and the instructions with you? I'd like to see them. I did. I did. But I gave them over to Judge Carver down at the courthouse. He's going to look it over. He suggested that I stop out here and tell you about it so there wouldn't be any misunderstanding. Of course, tomorrow we'll all be going out to dig it up. There'll be lots of folks on hand, including the newspaper people. If you'd like to join us, I'm sure we'd all be very happy... Uh, no. No, thanks. I don't think so. Are you sure? Well, well, I'll call you in the morning anyway, in case you change your mind. Probate. That's extension 519. Please hold and I'll transfer your call. Probate office, Mary Stork speaking. I want to find out about a document, a letter, that may have been filed today pertaining to the estate of Uriah Pillar. Is that P-I-L-L-A-R? That's right. Oh, yes, I know the one you mean. Uh, you mean the letter Father O'Connor brought in. What is it you wish to know? Uh, nothing. I was just checking. Plymouth Boys Town. I want to speak to Father O'Connor. Sorry, Father O'Connor will be out of the office for the next few days. May I take a message and have him call you when he returns? Do you know where he went? He said he was driving down to Cape Cod. If it's important, I, I could try to reach him there. Hello? Hello? Are you still there? Hello? God damn, there's mosquitoes. They're everywhere. My neck is on fire. Get away. Leave me alone. All right. Take it easy. Get a hold of yourself. You've got to get through this. It isn't going to be easier, but I don't think about it. Just get
keep digging. I must be getting down there. I don't smell anything yet, but I will. In a few minutes, and I'll use the flashlight. I just hope I'll be able to stand this stench without gagging. Never mind. Think about something else. In a few hours, you'll be done with this. You can go home and take a shower with lots of soap and hot water and a scrub brush. What's that? A light in my eyes. Who's there? Don't move. Very carefully, put down the shovel. Who is it? Who are you? What do you want? My name is Underhill. The question is, what are you doing? Me? Am I trespassing? I didn't know this property belonged to anybody. Say, hey, wait. Don't I know you? Well, now it could be. Do you know Father O'Connor? You! That's right. Now do what I tell you. Lay down the shovel and come up out of that hole. You're finished digging for the night. Here's your check. I'll take it whenever you're ready. Oh, here, miss. You can take it now. No, 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 Waverly. Let me do this. After that story, it's well worth it. Here you are, and thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Captain Underhill, what surprises me is how the deuce you could figure out all this without having been involved in the investigation. Mostly, I read the newspapers. You'd be surprised how much you can learn if you read them closely. Of course, being retired, I have lots of time for that. I read about the old man's death and the unusual terms in his will. There was quite a lot in the papers about that. I read about Simon Piller's murder and how the police thought the lawyer did it. I've never heard of a lawyer yet who would skip town and leave his financial matters unresolved. Then I saw the announcement in the wedding section a few years later when Audrey and Leander were married. And then two years after that, I read about her dying from an accidental fall. Mulling it over, I had a pretty good idea what really happened to cause the lawyer's disappearance. But I knew, unless I could force Leander to reveal where the body was buried, I could never make the case stick. As it turned out, it proved rather sticky for him. He found out the hard way it's, it's not always so easy to bury the past. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Legacy of Uriah Pillar. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Co-produced by David Ellsworth. Engineered by John Todd. With sound effects by Scott Dickey. And original music composed by Mark Birmingham. The actors in tonight's play, Captain Underhill was played by David Ellsworth. Wally O'Hara appeared as Dr. Schofield. Lainey Davis played Audrey Piller and other voices. Kevin Groppy was Leander Piller. Sean Hurley was Horatio Salazar. Charlene Goodrow was the waitress. And Robert Mazzotti played Simon Pillar. Tonight's show was recorded at HT Recording Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Tomasoni for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This is Floyd Pratt wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents a story of terror and suspense in a soundscape mystery thriller entitled The Buoy. Come with me now. I want to show you something. We're heading in, leaving Vineyard Sound behind us. 
No foghorn. That'll be Nobsco Point somewhere over there on our right. Impossible to tell where it is exactly. But if you keep your eyes looking in that direction, you'll notice every now and then that the fog glows a little brighter each time the light in the lighthouse sweeps round. We're looking for something that should be coming up on our left. We're looking for a marker, a ledge, and a rock called Coffin Rock that more or less marks the entrance to the passage. Listen for a bell on our left, and further over there somewhere, a gong. Listen hard now. The sea is this flat. There won't be much wave action to set them ringing. There's the bell buoy, more headless than I thought. Slight correction in our course, and we should steer just to the right of her. There she goes. Our wake woke her up a bit. There's a gong, too, you hear? That's good. When you're navigating through a fog like this, it's always a great comfort to know that you know where you are. Now, we'll keep our eye on the compass and follow a heading of exactly 300 degrees. It should take us directly into the mouth of the passage. This first part of the passage is called Broadway. Miss Normer, like so many other names associated with the sea. We're running down the line of buoys now. Over there to the right of us is Woods Hole. Now, if we were to shave about 30 degrees off our present course, that would head us directly into Great Harbor. Over on the port side is not a mess. The first of the chain called the Elizabeth Islands that lie off the mainland. Like paint that dribbled off the artist's brush. After Nanamesic comes Antikina, then Noshan, the biggest, then Pask, then Nashawina, and last of all, Cutty Hunk. And without this passage here, you'd have to go around all six of them if you wanted to make it into Buzzard's Bay. Let me tell you what's up ahead, because we're not planning to go all the way through. But dead ahead of us is Penzance Point and a little island called Devil's Foot Island. It's there that the passage makes an abrupt swing to the left into a section of the channel known as the Strait. Off the foot of Devil's Foot Island is a buoy which has the rather prosaic name of Buoy Number Three. Now, this is exactly the halfway point through the passage. Once you're in the Strait, continue on for another 400 yards and then swing north at buoy number six, and it will lead you straight out into Buzzard's Bay. Do that, and you will have successfully navigated the Woods Hole Passage. We're slowing down now. Coming up on buoy number three, the one that I mentioned. Well, we've got a pocket of clear air ahead of us, which is good for what I want to show you. I'm going to shut the engine down altogether. And we'll hang back and be quiet. Watch to see what happens. You see the buoy up ahead of us? Tall, black against the fog. But if you put a light on her, you'd see she's painted green, bright green. Do you hear it? There's a boat coming this way. A workboat for sure, too small to be a trawler. Most likely a lobster boat. There. Now you can see it. Coming out of the fog. Cutting across the rolling calm of dark water. She's heading for the buoy. There's a man at the bow with a line. Another at the wheelhouse. A third one standing up at the stern. The man at the wheel slips her into neutral. She glides the last 30 feet. The man at the bow slips a loop over the buoy as the boat slides past. The man at the stern does the same thing. They're working quietly now. Not a word spoken between them. The man at the bow moves back to help the others. The 
lifting something out of the hold. Something heavy. Something moving. From this distance, it's hard to tell. It might be a fish. A large animal. A dolphin, perhaps, anxious to be released. No, it's not that. Something else? Something arching, twisting its body like the contortions of a caterpillar inside a cocoon. One man's having trouble keeping hold of his end. He drops it. He drops it again. Now they set the thing back down. The man who is at the wheelhouse has something in his hand. He raises it above his head and brings it down sharply. He lifts the thing once more. This time there's no movement. No movement at all. Except for the slight roll and pitch of the boat and the approving nod of the buoy as the men get on with their work. Looking for a room for the night. I was hoping you might have one. Just for yourself? That's right. Well, we're practically full up. But if you want to wait, I'll make you up one of our spare rooms. Would you? Oh, that would be great. You can just sign the register. Thank you. Miss the ferry, did you? Mm, only by a little. <laughs> a little the same as a lot. You're not the first, and you won't be the last, Mr... Mr. Halpole. Now, if you have a car, you can move it round to the back. No, I took a cab. The bus was a little late getting in, and the taxi couldn't make up for it. Well, as I say, you're not the first, and you won't be the last. If you'd like to go in and warm yourself by the fire, I'll go and see to your room. Thanks. Help yourself to some brandy if you want it. It's in a bottle on the mantelpiece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. My fire sure looks inviting. Do you mind if I join you? What? I said, do you mind if I join you by the fire? Join me? You want to join me? No, I, I don't mind. Oh. oh, it's a bit raw out there this evening. It's good to be in by a warm fire. Personally, I'd hate to be stuck out there without a place to spend... Oh, my God! Are you all right? Cole! Oh, let me get you something. Do you need a doctor? Oh, I'll call a doctor. No, no. no don't call. Oh, are you sure? It, it, it's all right. Would you like some brandy? Would that help? Yes, yes, yes. Brandy. Brandy, please. I'll join you if you don't mind. Here you are. Thank you. I really must apologize for my outburst, Mr. The Halpole. Mr. Halpole. You see, I'm, I'm really not ill. It, it's just that I... I thought I was over something, and I... I guess I'm a little chagrined to discover I'm not as over it as I thought. The fire does feel good, doesn't it? This is something that happened to you? Yes. Would you care to talk about it? I don't mean to pry. It's just that my profession has me convinced that it usually helps to talk. And what is your profession? I'm a counselor. A marriage counselor, actually. <laughs> Even though I've never been married. But then, lack of direct experience doesn't stop most of us from offering our advice on this subject. Just look around you and you see that's true. Yes, I suppose you're right. I... I'm really a good listener, Mr... Walcott. My name is Edward Walcott. Yes, I, I suppose you're right, Mr. Halpole. I, I suppose it would help me to talk about it. 
I had thought I was so past it all. After all, eighteen and one half years is a long time, particularly when you've spent ten years of it in therapy. Tonight was to be a personal test, a chance to prove to myself that I had finally come to accept what happened to me. The truth is, Mr. Halpole, the body may survive. But it can take much longer for the soul, the spirit, the psyche, call it what you will, to recover. Tell me, are you familiar with the term syzygy? A syzygy? No, I don't S -Y -Z -Y think so. S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. Syzygy. It's a term in astronomy that refers to the alignment of the earth, the moon, and the sun. It's a fairly common occurrence. It happens twice a month whenever there is a full moon or a new moon. But true syzygy is something else, and much less common. It happens only when the alignment is perfect. That would be during a lunar eclipse. Very it? good, Mr. Halpole. That's exactly right. The Earth casts its shadow upon the moon because there is a direct line between the sun, the Earth, and the moon. But even then, true syzygy is only true, depending on where you are on the Earth. Do, do you understand why? Uh, I'm not sure. It's because the Earth is very large, you see, and also because the moon travels around the Earth on a tilt. An elliptic, it's called... As the moon orbits around the Earth, sometimes it passes south of the equator, sometimes it sits right on the equator, and sometimes it passes north. For true syzygy to occur in the northern hemisphere, in approximately the place we are now, then the alignment must take place while the moon is traveling north of the equator. And that occurrence is quite rare. In fact, the last time it occurred was October 29th, 18 and one half years ago. I recall myself standing on the public pier in my rain poncho with my suitcase beside me watching the last of the big ships of the Steamship Authority making this majestic departure from the harbor. I stood there in the damp drizzle of things, thinking that I had been foolish to make my plans on the basis of a schedule that was two years out of date. There's always a kind of lost feeling that comes when you miss a boat. A sense of missed opportunities, I suppose. I felt in a strange way stranded, although why I should feel this way was puzzling since I was, after all, still standing on the mainland. Certainly the ferryboat showed no apparent remorse for leaving me behind as it chugged its way out of the harbor. Visible now in the fog, gave one last taunting blast upon its horn. I decided there were only two things left for me to do. Find a hot meal, and then acquire a warm bed for the evening. Preferably one not too far from where I would have to catch the ferry come morning. Woods Hole in the off-season is an out-of-the-way place, and there was not much to choose from. I wandered past one or two beer joints that were mostly deserted, and where I imagined that ordering a hot meal would be taking a definite gastronomic risk. I went around the corner to where that little channel cuts through into Eel Pond, and there I chose a small cafe that sits right alongside the drawbridge. The air inside was humid, and the windows were steamed, owing both to the atmospheric conditions and the heat coming out of the kitchen. I ordered coffee and a bowl of chili. My waitress was friendly enough, but she became guarded when I asked her about a place to spend the night. Did she think I was hoping she might offer me her own place? Perhaps she was right to think so, because perhaps a part of me was lonely and hoping she would. 
I finished my meal and decided to walk just a bit before heading the half mile up the road to the motel she recommended. The drizzle had stopped. The fog was beginning to move around in a light wind. I looked down at the fresh mat of yellow maple leaves that showed up so brilliantly under the street lamps. I even remember stopping and watching a few of them float down the rivulet of water that ran down the gutter to the storm sewer. My feeling was melancholy. I passed the fisherman's dock and noticed two fishermen standing close together smoking cigarettes. They dropped them in the water as I approached and went back to their work, which appeared to be repairing something on the dock. I turned around at this point and headed for the motel because I suddenly had the idea that I might not be able to get a room. <laughs> which was silly, of course, and I realized it immediately as I looked around and reminded myself of how deserted this town was at this season of the year. Of course, I had no difficulty whatsoever getting a room. I was giving the end room off a motor court, and I settled down pretty much immediately to read in bed until I fell asleep. I fell asleep with the light on. Then I remember, some time later, waking up enough to reach over and switch it off. Then... I'm not sure how much time passed. I remember waking up to a sound that was gone by the time I was fully awake. I lay in the room and listened. I heard a car or two go by. I listened to the ticking of the clock. I heard voices coming from outside the door. There was something about them that was menacing, like... Burglars in the night. I should have acted right then. I didn't. Instead, I allowed the chain on the door and the warmth of my bed covers to lull me into a false sense of security to convince me that all I really needed to do was to lie there and listen. I sat up on my elbow. They burst in upon me. What's going on? I was thrust what? down upon what the bed this? before I could get free of the covers. What are you doing? Wait! Wait! Help! Help me! All of my reactions were too slow. Every one of them. My memory is unclear on what happened next. I feel fairly certain that I must have been taken somewhere in the trunk of a car. Vaguely, I remember the ride out in the lobster boat. I don't believe I came fully awake again until I felt myself being hoisted in the arms of two of them. I saw the dark water over the side of the boat, and I thought for certain I was about to be thrown overboard. I struggled. I did my best to prevent them, but they overpowered me once again. Anyway, as it turned out, that wasn't what they had in mind at all. When I regained consciousness the second time, I found myself floating out in the water strapped to a buoy. My body had been placed inside a large burlap sack which was drawn up around my neck. My weight was resting on the narrow lip of the buoy on which I was just barely able to set my heels. There were numerous straps holding me across my chest, my abdomen, my thighs, and my ankles. In addition, there were several ropes tied in such a way to prevent me from wriggling either upwards or downwards to slip free. My mouth was securely taped as it had been since the motel room. The only parts of me that I could move with any freedom were my hands, moving only from the wrists, and my head which I could swivel from side to side. My first realization as I looked around somewhat frantically was that I was alone out here. Turning my head as far as I could and peering out into the limits of the fog, I saw no one around me. Neither did I hear any sounds that would indicate someone was close by. I tried calling to no avail. I struggled against my restraints but quickly realized how useless that would be. 
was obvious I had been brought out here and left. That was the inescapable conclusion. But why? For what reason? And who would want to play such a horrible practical joke? Roughly handled, I had been seized in my sleep, taken out and strapped to a buoy. Obviously, it was no one I knew or could have known, as there was no doubt of my being a complete stranger in town. And yet, clearly, someone expected me to spend a very uncomfortable night bobbing around on a buoy, and I had not the slightest comprehension of why. Was it to teach me a lesson? In my mind, I retraced the entire evening and re-examined every face I had seen. It seemed there were only two possibilities. The first having to do with the waitress in the restaurant. Had I offended her more than I thought? Or was it more likely that a jealous boyfriend had been sitting at another table and had misinterpreted what he saw? Was I a case of mistaken identity? Or did he, out of his own jealous paranoia, suspect me to be some secret lover with whom his girlfriend had been carrying on a clandestine relationship? Or was it the incident on the dock? The two men I had seen hurry back to work as I approached. Did my observing them make them think I had seen something? Something I shouldn't? And did they decide to do this to me as a warning? To throw a scare into me? To, to teach me not to poke my nose into other people's business? The fact that I had been brought out here in a lobster boat suggested this choice was correct. Although it was also possible that the jealous boyfriend, if there was one, was a local fisherman who, who are known to have hot and fiery tempers. The encircling fog made me feel lost and disoriented as though I were very far out to sea. And yet, the sounds that reached my ears, the faint surf, the foghorn, the church bells, which I recognized, told me that I must still be relatively close to shore. I tried to assess the danger I was in. Unless someone came back to cause me further harm, I seemed destined to spend the night riding this buoy, coping with the cold until someone else, most likely in the light of day, came by and spotted me. I knew a little about buoys. I was aware that they come in different sizes and shapes. Some with flashing lights, some with bells that ring, and some with metal rods that clang with every action of the waves. The buoy I was riding on had no lights or bells. It was a plain enclosed cylinder, like an oil drum, and it seemed to be quite large. I estimated its length to be at least 14 feet above water. It never occurred to me to ask myself why it was necessary to use such a large buoy so close into land. Time passed, perhaps no more than ten minutes. I listened to the foghorn and stared down at the shiny black water. Looking up, I noticed that here and there in places overhead, the fog was beginning to break open and allow small patches of stars to poke through. I heard the groan of the anchor chain beneath me. Something sluggish, a faint tremor. Not, nothing more. We drifted. Then, once more, something stirring, something waking up. I listened. It was quiet, followed by the effect of these sounds was quite damaging upon my nerves, upon my reason. When I began to think clearly again, I realized that. Nothing had changed. Nothing. Except for one thing. Where before the result of my weight hanging off one side of the buoy had had little effect in causing us to lean to one side, I now looked down and noticed. For the first time, I noticed that my toes were underwater.
suppose we're underwater. I looked down at the surface of the water more carefully, and where before I had seen nothing but a flaccid calm like a mill pond, I could now detect a definite dimpling to the surface. The water was moving. Through my back, I could feel a slight shiver of vibration running up the chain, being amplified by the air inside the chamber of the buoy and making itself felt all up and down my spine. A current was running. It meant the tide was turning. That was all. Nothing to be nervous about. I looked about me and noticed that everywhere the fog was breaking up, disintegrating, opening up gaps along the waterline so that in places I could see all the way to shore. As it continued, it was like the rising of a curtain. But suddenly I could see where I was. I could see I was much closer in than I realized. I could actually make out a dark shoreline encroaching on both sides. There appeared to be an open stretch of water directly in front. Or was, was it only an inlet? Difficult to tell. The land on both sides seemed to meet in the middle. And yet the water swirling past my feet was flowing in that direction. Flowing as if there must be a way out. Then I realized what it was. A channel. That was it. It had to be. This was a channel, and the buoy I was riding on was put there to mark the passage. The tide was going out, that was all. I made this simple observation and then put it out of my mind. Instead, I, I concentrated on the fact that the fog was lifting. Already, I could see lights from the town reflected across the water. I could see more and more stars up above. The constellations the big dipper standing on his handle in the north, the Pleiades and Cassiopeia overhead. I looked around at all I could see, and I felt better. I felt comforted. Seeing was so much better than being lost in the fog. And not only seeing, but being seen. For now I believe that my chances of being found and rescued were greatly increased. Time passed. Fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes. I gritted my teeth against the cold and felt determined to ride out this miserable night. Still, I failed to comprehend my predicament. I believe that whatever danger I faced lay above the surface. I had not yet come to realize that the real danger lay below. Not until another groan of the anchor chain brought me around to the fact that several things had changed. The movement and turbulence of the water was now much more apparent. The dimpling on the surface had become a definite ripple all around, and the dark water welling up in the backwash behind the buoy showed me something of the current down below. The buoy itself had begun to move with the current, side to side swaying like the motion of a snake, coupled with an up and down movement like a hobby horse. There was more strain upon the chain. I could feel that. But as more the angle at which we were leaning had increased, and the water, which had only once covered my toes, was now reaching above my shins. For the first time that night, I went a little wild with terror. <laughs> I struggled like a madman against the rocks. I heard myself trying to loosen them. But when my strength gave out and I collapsed in exhaustion, I could feel they were not one fraction looser than before. In the calm following my panic, I began to think more clearly. I began to face up to the situation I was in. The current was dragging the buoy under. That much was obvious. The question was, how far would it go? <laughs> it almost sounded like the sort of question you'd expect to encounter on a high school science test. And so I tried to think back. I tried to remember everything I had ever learned about the tides. 
I was aware, basically, that the tide changes direction every six hours. Which meant that at some time during the next six hours, or five, I suppose it must be now, the current in the channel would reach its maximum velocity. How much of my body remained above water when that critical moment was reached was a question I found myself keenly contemplating. I peered down at the moving water and tried to judge its speed. Perhaps a knot. No more than a knot and a half. I knew that one half knot was what one would expect to encounter in the open ocean, away from any land masses that would tend to compress it and thereby increase its speed. One and one half knots was already a considerable current, which suggested that the currents in this channel might be very strong indeed. The buoy itself was also a clue. It was enormous, as I mentioned. Three or four feet of its length still towered above my head. How much of it would remain above water before the current finally slackened, and the buoy, with me upon it, was released from the grip of these rushing waters. It all depended on the tide. The tide was the key. And the higher the tide, the stronger the current. It made sense because whatever water flowed in would have to flow out again when the tide changed direction. And a higher tide meant there would be that much more water to flow out again in the same amount of time. Thereby producing a stronger current. But what determined the tides? The moon, of course. The gravitational pull of the moon. I remember that much from high school science. The phases of the moon. Didn't they have something to do with it? The new moon and the full moon. Didn't they say the tides were highest during the new moon and full moon? But where was the moon? I searched the sky. I looked in every direction I could see. But no moon of any phase was visible. That was good, I told myself. At least that was one positive thing about this whole ordeal. The shock jolt startled me. I suppose it must be the chain working out one of its kinks. The result was that the water was now reaching to the tops of my kneecaps. I was terrified now. Completely and utterly terrified. And then... And then my eyes happened to notice something in the eastern sky. Something low upon the horizon. The moon was coming up. I watched in horror as a great three-dimensional full moon, the color of orange, rose above the rim of the world and inclined its bald head toward me as if it were about to point out a bird's mark. <laughs> I began to laugh. An hysterical laughter that rose with the moon and carried away my reason. At that moment, I was no more sane than the craziest man alive. My God, what a horrible experience. How frightening. The guesses I had made about the full moon and its effect on the tides were quite correct, but also quite limited. For example, I was not aware of the phenomenon called syzygy, nor was I aware of another celestial event that was taking place which was to play a significant role before the night was through. The moon was entering into perigee. Do you know what that means, Mr. Halpole? Well, I'm not sure. It, it has something to do with the orbit, doesn't it? The moon enters into perigee when it passes through that part of its orbit that brings it closest to the Earth. 31,000 miles closer, which means 31,000 miles of additional gravitational pull. The moon is the main culprit, you see. Normally, the moon's gravitational pull is more than double the strength of the sun for the simple reason that although the sun is much larger, it is also much further away. During times of perigee, however, the effect of the moon is magnified by a third. In other words, in terms of ocean tides, what would normally have been a three-foot tide becomes a four-foot tide. Do you understand? Well, yes, I understand. Now, 
Let me tell you something about how the tide actually runs through the Woods Hole Passage. The tide floods to the east, and it ebbs to the west. When the water is coming in, it flows into Vineyard Sound. When it is going out, it empties into Buzzards Bay. In between is about 20 minutes of slack water. When the tide begins to ebb, the current through the passage runs at about one-half knot and increases at about one-half knot per hour until sometime between the third and fourth hours when the current reaches its maximum velocity, which is about 4.1 knots, about five miles per hour. Not so fast when you consider that a person jogging can easily run five miles per hour. But... Think of the force of a whole body of water moving at this speed. Think of the force of all that water piled up into Vineyard Sound and trying to force its way out through a crooked channel 300 feet wide and 13 feet deep. Think of the marching force of several million tons of water trying to escape, and then you will understand what danger I was in. However, these were facts I was not privy to at the time. My world became engrossed in measuring the minute advance of the water, which now had climbed to the tops of my thighs, and in coping with the cold, for it was the cold that had become my chief torment. The burlap cloth I was wrapped in seemed to do some good, like a wetsuit in keeping a layer of warm water surrounding my legs. But whatever good it provided was offset by the cold metal of the buoy itself, which functioned like a siphon to drain away my body heat. Thank God this was the south side of the Cape, where the ocean waters still feel the influence of the Gulf Stream. On the north side, my survival time might be measured in the space of a single hour, but over here, over here I could hold out much longer, with more chance of rescue. Or did it simply mean that my death would be that much worse for being drawn out? No. I still clung to the belief that this was only intended to frighten me. That the buoy would not go under. Or if it did, they would come back. Come back in time to take me off. They had to. They simply had to. I heard the sound of an approaching airplane coming from the west. I saw its wing lights blinking against the background of stationary stars. It's the measure of my desperation that I imagined that somehow they could see me. That the pilot sitting at the controls could somehow look down through the dark night and pick out this one buoy bobbing in the current and see that I was held prisoner. And he would radio for help radio for a boat to come out and pick me up. Save me! Save me! Save me! Time passed. I lapsed once more into stupor. My listlessness I began to hallucinate. In the remnants of fog that drifted by glowing in the moonlight, I saw faces. I saw people. I saw a woman in a white dress go pirouetting across the surface. I saw a ferry boat, an actual ferry boat made out of fog, passed by so close I could look in the windows and see actually see people sitting in their seats, staring straight ahead with blank expressions. I watched the moon continue its inexorable climb into the nighttime sky, passing from orange to pale yellow, yellow like the color of the leaves in the gutter. I experienced one moment of false hope when I thought I could detect... Yes. Yes, it was happening. The current was abating, the buoy coming more upright, lifting more of my body out of the water. But it was just one more thing I didn't know. 
But the tide runs out in stages in which it pulses and appears to slow down, even stop, before coming back again with renewed vigor. For so long now I had been going back and forth between terror and hope that I thought I... I genuinely thought that nothing could happen to make me any more terrified. Then I looked down and noticed something floating in the water. Small bits of something white slipping by in the current. It wasn't. In the moonlight it looked like pieces of styrofoam. I, I couldn't quite make it out, nor could I think of what it could possibly be. Then suddenly the word shark came into my mind, and I knew instantly what it was. Chum. Someone up current of me was chumming the waters with blood and pieces of ground up fish. Its purpose was to attract sharks. I swiveled my head. I tried to see behind, but so much of my vision was cut off. Anyway, I realized they could be doing this a long way off, and still the current would carry the scent down to me to lure them in my direction. Oh, yes, I had heard the rumors about the waters in this area. The word most often used in connection with sharks and the waters off Woods Hole was infested. Shark infested. I had heard how they like to come and congregate in the slack waters inside Great Abba while they wait for the current in the passage to deliver up some juicy morsel. And obviously I was to be the juicy morsel. There was no longer any doubting their intentions. No point in deluding myself any longer that they were only trying to scare me or that they would be coming back to take me off. For the first time that night, I began to seriously believe that I was going to die. The fact that this was happening to me seemed so hideous, so monstrously unfair. What had I done to deserve this? I felt sad for myself. Sad that soon I would no longer know the world, and the world would no longer know me. I felt sorry for my family, for Rachel and Claudia, my wife and my daughter, who would never know what had happened to me, who would spend the rest of their lives wondering if I was still alive. I looked up at the stars, spinning around with their magnificent indifference, and it occurred to me that perhaps the motive for my death had nothing to do with the waitress or the two men standing on the dock. Perhaps it was more impersonal than that. Perhaps it had only to do with the moon. The moon was my murderer. Raising my eyes to where the moon had risen, I saw the same bald-headed gentleman, a maniacal Mr. Peanut with his monocle in place, and that terrible grin as he tipped his top hat towards me. And then I saw something that made me think for certain I was going mad. Watching the moon, I could swear that the top hat was coming back on. Before my eyes, I could see it. The top hat was being replaced. My, my, my mind reared back as if to scream. When suddenly, I was arrested by a sound. A boat approaching. A motorboat coming this way. It was at this very moment that I saw my first shark. A ten-footer running near the surface, traveling down the path of moonlight, heading directly toward the buoy. Towards me. Until the last second when it, it veered away, showing me the flash of its eye, its frowning mouth, and the white of its underbelly. I wanted to scream at the top of my lungs so the boat would hear me. And yet I was afraid. Afraid that the sounds I would make would only encourage the shark to attack. But it didn't matter anyway. The sound that reached my ears told me that the boat was not heading for the passage. 
it was going into Great Harbor. Time passed into oblivion, and I became insensible to everything around me. It was as if I were already dead. It was only when the water reached my chest, and I felt the icy grip around my heart that I came fully awake once more. The channel had become a torrent of rushing water, the surface buckling and churning all around me. The action of the buoy itself had become increasingly violent. A relentless pounding up and down as if I were strapped to the bow of a ship. Again and again I watched in horror as the water fell away from me and then came rushing back until it was only inches from my face. Tearing down into it like tearing into an abyss. And then, from underwater, I felt a bump against my ribs. A shock. Another sound became apparent. A sound that my ears left to as if it was someone calling my name. Another boat coming this way. Yes, yes, not headed for the harbor, but coming this way. A sailboat, I thought. A large sailboat taking advantage of the current to make the pass through. But would he make it in time? The water was already so close to my face, I was forced to keep my chin up and my head to one side to keep my face from going under with each plunge forward. Suddenly, without warning, another slipped to the chain and I was under all the way. And then, just as suddenly we were up again and I was breathing. I tried to calculate how much longer before they arrived. Once inside the main channel, the passage would be swift. Navigating in the dead of night would not be easy. It meant there would be at least two of them. The captain at the wheel, someone else standing up at the bow, concentrating, keeping track of the buoys, making sure they stayed well inside them. Which meant, at some point, they would have to look directly at this buoy. But how much would they see? The buoy lying on its side with me underneath, with no more of my body visible than my head sticking above water. I wouldn't be visible to them at all until they were exactly alongside, and then only for an instant as they shot past. But what about the ropes? Would they see the ropes? The ropes must be visible from the other side. Would they see them and think it strange? Would they ask themselves what they were there for? I saw the beam of the searchlight sweep over the water in front of me and then hold on the buoy. An instant later, it was off. They had seen the buoy, but had they seen me? They were coming up now, moving very quickly. The light was on me again, then away. Did they see me? Did they see me? I could see the boat coming into view. I could see the bow. I saw a man standing with a searchlight. He wasn't looking. And then, for the first time that night, I went under. faces of people I had known. I saw a photograph, one I had taken years before. Summertime, the grass on the riverbank soaked yellow from the setting sun. Rachel sitting there, her knees drawn up and one hand raised to shield her eyes as she looks towards the photographer, me. And into the light, the light, the light, the strong golden light. Thank you.
friend, it was the cold that saved me. The cold, which had been my torment all night long, was the single factor that saved my life, causing me to hold my breath even after I had lost consciousness. To be called back like that, to be snatched from death and brought back to the world of the living was nothing less than a miracle of redemption. And yet, as it turned out, there was no easy way for me to resume living. I was marred by the nightmare of that experience, and I have never been the same since. Which is why tonight was the test. A chance to prove to myself that I have finally made the adjustment, that I have finally come to accept what happened to me, because you see, tonight is the anniversary. Tonight, the celestial circumstances are exactly what they were 18 and one half years ago, which is why I say, Mr. Helpful. The body may survive, but it can take much longer for the spirit to recover. The room is ready whenever you are, Mr. Halpole. Mr. Halpole? Mr. Halpole? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I was just listening to this man's most extraordinary account. What man is that, sir? Oh, why, this man sitting right here? Now... Where did he go? Where did who go? Why, the man who was sitting right here. You must have seen him. His name is Edward Walcott. I saw no one. But that's impossible. Why, he was sitting right here. You must have seen me talking to him. I saw you sitting. I saw you lean forward like you might be listening, but I didn't see you talking. But th that's not possible. He was here, in this chair. Why, we had brandy together. You had brandy? Yes, we both did. Well, you see for yourself. Only one glass has been used. <gasps> oh, now, this is God. strange. There's water on the floor in front of this w chair. Wait a minute. Oh, what did you say? I said there's water on the floor no. in front of this chair. No, no, no. When you first came in. I said your room is ready. My God. It was a warning. He said, tonight was the anniversary. It's ready for you now, upstairs. Mr. Halpole? Where are you going? Mr. Halpole? Mr. Halpole? You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Buoy. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Orton. Engineering by John Todd, Chip Davis, and Mark Birmingham. Original music and special sound processing by Mark Birmingham. The actors in tonight's play, opening monologue by Floyd Pratt. George McConville played Edward Walcott. Tom Dutton was Mr. Halpole, and Carol McManus played the innkeeper. This program was recorded at HG Recording Studio, Cape Cod, and at Rosemead Productions, Los Angeles. Special thanks to the Woods Hole Coast Guard Station, to Robert Eldridge White, publisher of Eldridge's Tide and Pilot Book, to Bensos, who provided the underwater hydrophones, and to the community of Woods Hole for so graciously allowing themselves to be maligned. This program is copyrighted by Stephen Tomasoni for Audio Artists Incorporated. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This is Floyd Pratt wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. It's a foggy night on old Cape Cod. A perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents an original suspense thriller entitled 
Five Fathom Rip. George's Bank, the famous fishing ground, is situated 80 miles due east of Cape Cod, out on the very edge of the continental shelf. Here, incoming waves from storms far out in the Atlantic sweep in, passing over depths as deep as 6,000 feet. Then, seemingly in the space of a single rise and fall of a single wave, will suddenly be passing over shoals as shallow as only a few fathoms. Many of these shoals have names, especially the larger ones. as George's Shoal, Cultivated Shoal, North Shoal, and Hambone. Down in the southeast quadrant in an area known as Little George's is a rip which goes by the name of Five Fathom Rip. It's a rip, of course, because of the way the tide rips along it. It's a strange, almost optical illusion effect. So far out at sea, you don't expect to look down and see ripples appearing on the surface when there's no wind blowing. Those ripples may look harmless, but they belie a tremendous force of moving water. Only a suggestion of movement, but it's the same sort of look. The same sort of suggestion you see in the water at the very crest of Niagara Falls just before it plunges over. Many times, Five Fathom Rip has been a scene of high drama, mostly the kind you'd expect. Fishing boats capsizing in heavy seas, boats icing up in winter storms, becoming so top-heavy they, they flip upside down. But for Bobby Winslow, what happened to him was nothing like that. What happened to him was much more unexpected, much more unusual and much worse much much worse it was all Hibbert's fault without him this whole mess never would have happened or at least it never would have happened to me Strange, I suppose, to lay the blame on somebody who wasn't even there. But then it's just as strange to say that the hero of this story is a shark. But the fact is, both are true. It was Friday afternoon. I was down working on my boat at the Sandwich Boat Basin, which is a little puddle of a marina built off the side of the Cape Cod Canal, just below where it empties into Cape Cod Bay. I was in a skiff working my way alongside a 50-foot wooden trawler I was dumb enough to pay 30000 for out of dry dock. I was flipped over on my back, leaning halfway out, using a boat scraper to scrape rotted caulk from a seam down near the waterline, when I heard the sound of a big boat pulling in and swiveled my head in time to get an upside-down view of the Christina pulling in and hibbered at the controls. I sat up to roll the kinks out of my neck and wonder what in the world it was that brought him in here. Ordinarily, the Christina operates out of New Bedford and fishes deeper waters. A boat her size is a fairly uncommon sight in the little sandwich boat basin. Not arriving at any satisfactory explanation, there was nothing to do but stamp the lid back on the putty can and row over to find out. As it turned out, that was the first thing I never should have done. Hibbert is curly-haired, burly, stocky, somewhere in his middle 40s, which puts him about a decade ahead of me. He and I share a camaraderie dating back to the days when I used to crew for him. Now that I had a boat of my own and he had moved into a larger-scale operation, our camaraderie had loosened a bit now that the overlay of competition was laid upon us. Hibbert, in addition to being salty, sarcastic, and gruff, is also a masterful cusser. Anytime he wants to, he can open his mouth and spew out the most wondrous, spontaneous outpouring of slurs 
epithets, curses, derogatory remarks, plus any stray words that might wander and which on closer examination might prove to be nonsensical, but which sound bad and therefore are good to use. There was one thing I admired him for. I could never cuss decently. Always wanted to, never seemed to develop an act for it. He didn't see me approaching from the waterside. When he did, his face passed through several quick stages. Surprise. Alarm. Then a furtive secretiveness, all of which disappeared in a few split seconds. Bobby Winslow, you low-life son of a Millerade bastard! You wordless stick, you curse bag of a thunder-headed cretin! How the hell are you, anyway? Never! What the hell are you doing coming in here? I was lonely, and I just couldn't stay away from you any longer. I forgot how ugly you are, and I had to remind myself. Now, uh, I'm coming in to make love to your wife, you decide. That was Hibbert. He invited me up and then took me down below to the engine room to view the disaster. It looked like somebody had sprayed vegetable oil all over the place. Oh, slimy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so are you. Damn hydraulics. Just getting in the way when the hose busted. Sprayed 400 gallons of this stuff all over the engine. All over the walls, down the bilge. Then I come to find out that some sweetheart of a son of a bitch borrowed my whole repair kit without telling me. When I find out who it was, I'm going to make the little scum sucker make the place clean. We were on our way back up when I stopped. What's in the hole? I noticed you riding low in the water as you came in. Yeah, just our ice. We took on a few extra tons so we could stay out longer. No fish? Some fish. Like I said, we were just getting started. We were running our first tow when the holes burst. I knew he was lying. Must have been a heavy load to create that much strain. He knew I knew he was lying. Well, then, or maybe it was just ready to let go. That happens sometimes. Let's get out of here. Now, why don't we just look in here first? No point in repeating what he said, but I'll tell you. What I saw when I climbed down into the fish hold, nothing could have prepared me for. Holy jeez. It was the kind of sight that suddenly reorganizes a person's life. The kind of thing a fisherman's dreams are made of. The kind of thing that only another fisherman, someone who's been there, who's done it, who's seen the size of normal catches, can possibly appreciate. Holy mackerel. I saw fish. Tons of fish. A mother load of fish. Not just any fish. George's flounder. Lemon sole George's flounder. The best. The largest. The most succulent and therefore the highest priced fish selling at auction. George's flounder. Some as big as dinner plates. Some like doormats weighing six pounds, eight pounds, ten pounds each. I was looking at fish, but I was seeing money. Stacks and stacks of it. Bills of currency piled head high, packed in layers of shaved ice, every one of them staring back at me with that wide-eyed, blank-eyed, fish-eyed expression. Sort of like Andrew Jackson's face on a $20 bill. We rode on little George's Bobby boy, just south and west of Five Fathom Rip. Suddenly we were into them. I swear I never saw so many. Every toe was as much as the gear could take. And Bobby, they're not moving. They're not going anywhere. It's like somebody come along and sprinkled them all over the bottom. And they're just waiting for us to scoop them up. And that's why I came in here. That's why I'm going to get this damn hose repaired and this bilge pumped out. And tomorrow, as soon as that little dink of a fish market opens up... I'm going to take out what I got. I don't care what kind of a beating I take on the price. And then as quiet as quiet can be, I'm going to tiptoe back out there, and I'm going to make me a hall that's going to set history. A hall so big I'll retire, and I'll move to Florida, and live me the life of a lottery winner. And you, Bobby boy, are going to have to sit this one out. 
That boat of yours is in no shape to venture outside. Besides, I heard about the little situation you got yourself into. <clears throat> yeah, about that little situation. Has to do with my boat. She's an old Western Rig stern trawler built in 1933. Western Rig meaning the wheelhouse is up forward. The fishing is done off the stern by a net put over off a big net drum. She's still seaworthy, although she hardly looks it. Some of the timbers down below look like they came out of the Mayflower. The iron fittings, winch handles, brakes, turnbuckles, that kind of thing, are all so pitted and eaten away by rust they've taken on a spindly look. The topside floor decking is rotted soft. A knife blade penetrates half an inch of soggy wood before striking solid. But basically, she is still sound, especially for inshore work. Offshore is another matter. Well, anyway, as I mentioned, she was built back in 1933, which was the year that Prohibition was coming to an end. It was a happy-go-lucky time on Cape Cod when just about everybody but the Coast Guard shared a wink and a nod about the rum running that was going on. Of course, now with the government's war on drugs, the climate has changed. But back then... Most likely as a lark, the original owner decided to call her Smuggler. Now, basically, I try not to tell other people how to live their lives, and generally I appreciate the same. Just because I call my boat Smuggler doesn't mean I am one. In fact, I think it should be fairly obvious I'm not, or else why call attention to it. The name on the bow when I bought her was the Betty B., but since I don't know any Betty B's worthy of naming a boat after, and since I believe a boat ought to keep her original name the whole way through, I decided to change it back. So I sent in my papers, and I waited. And the two weeks it was supposed to take turned into ten, and still they haven't come back. Without them, I was dead in the water. Literally, I couldn't go out. Well, not legally. Not according to Coast Guard Code of Regulations, Code 33 CFR 173, which states, No boat shall operate without proper documentation on board at all times. All right, so maybe this was a problem I brought down on myself. Maybe this was just my own jackass stubbornness. But hey, listen, if you haven't got that kind of stubbornness, you haven't got what it takes to make it as an independent fisherman. So now the whole thing had blown up into a test of wills. As I saw it, a case of independence versus authority, the little guy versus big government. A case of not letting some bonehead government official sitting at some stupid gray desk somewhere inland whose greatest joy in life is reaching out and making other people's lives feel like desk jobs too. A case of not letting a person like that have even the slightest say in what I could or could not name my boat. That was it. That was all there was to it. Sometimes I was determined never to give in. Other times I figured, huh, if they wouldn't let me have that name, I was going to call her Usyk, which is Eskimo for big prick. When people asked me what Usyk meant, I was going to tell them it meant good luck. But to make matters worse, the Sandwich Boat Basin doubles as the headquarters for the Cape Cod Canal Coast Guard Station. Effectively, I was under house arrest. The truth of the matter was, so far it hadn't mattered all that much, my not being able to go out. My boat still needed plenty of repairs and modifications. But, damn it, now was different. Now they were forcing me to pass up the kind of opportunity every fisherman dreams about. Well, I have a wife, and I have two kids to support, so I had a damn good reason to go out there, papers or no papers. Nobody's going to tell me I don't have the right to go out and put food on my own family's table by the honest use of my own two hands. I decided there was only one honorable thing to do. I was going to sneak out. It was Friday. By five o'clock, most of the Coast Guard personnel would be heading home for the weekend, leaving behind a skeleton crew. And they weren't the ones to be particularly interested in noticing whether or not a certain boat was still at its slip. With enough time to get ready, I could leave here by 10.30, under cover of darkness. Make Provincetown by midnight, add another 10 to 12 hours to get out there, 
Start fishing by noon on Saturday. Fish round the clock. That would give us a solid 29 hours on station. Start heading back early Sunday evening. Run all night. Get into Boston just as the 5 a.m. fish market is opening. Sell the fish, offload them, and hightail it back down to Sandwich to get here before 9. That's when the Coast Guard personnel would be just driving by on their way to work. Simple, really. Hell, if it worked, I could do the same thing the next weekend. The only thing was I had to have a crew, and that was not so simple. Not on a Friday, just as the weekend is beginning. I knew Granger was home and would definitely say yes, so I called him first. Then I made a quick visit down to a local hangout, a place called the Lobster and the Lighthouse, where I recruited four hands out of a group of strangers loitering around the bar. Sure, I got nothing better to do this weekend. Me too. Well, let's do it. I need to talk. Okay, be down at the boat by 7.30. I'm in slip 14 on the far side. The boat's name is Smuggler. And look, keep this quiet. Recruiting deckhands out of a group of strangers is not the generally approved of method for putting together a crew. It shows how broke everybody is these days that as soon as I mentioned how much each stood to make for a weekend's worth of work, nobody refused, even after I explained the risks. None of them had any experience, but I figured with Granger and me giving orders, showing them the ropes, we could manage. I loaded on three 55-gallon drums of diesel to supplement what was in the hold, stowed them up forward of the wheelhouse, and then I pulled around to the back side of the fish pier and had them pour in nine tons of shaved ice. Finally, we were ready. Quietly, around 10.45, we made our departure. Holloway, pick up those lines and stow them in the lazarette. Johansson, you and... I'm sorry, what's your name again? Crawford. Right, Crawford, Sorry. You and Johansson get down the hold and spread around some of that ice. Make some beds. Right. Granger, get the coffee pot going. That's first thing. It's already going, Skipper. It's an indication of how much I felt like a schoolboy playing hooky that I waited until we were well out of earshot before switching on the VHF. It has a roving scanner feature that monitors all channels at once, as well as channel 16, the emergency channel. I heard snatches and bits of conversations, half expecting to hear some radio voice from the Coast Guard chime in asking me where in hell I thought I was going. We passed the flashing red beacon at the end of the jetty. The fog was incredibly thick, but posed no problem. A storm passing through two days before had dragged behind it a big cell of high pressure. There would be ocean swells out on the bank, but they ought to be subsiding. We passed the last of the buoys, and I opened her up in a direct line for Provincetown, heading across Cape Cod Bay. Here's your coffee. Thanks. Right about here is where I snagged that shark last spring. I remember. You made the papers. Damn thing weighed six tons for crying out loud. Too bad it wasn't a great white. Uh, you wouldn't say that if you'd been there. A 30-foot-long female basking shark had blundered into my net. Basking sharks are harmless but grow to enormous sizes, whale sizes. When I got the net to the surface and saw what I had, there was no way to get her out of the net without first hoisting it on board. It was almost more than the winch could handle. When I did get her up, she took up the entire afterdeck with part of her sticking out the back chute. Another fishing boat snapped the picture that ended up in the papers with captions referring to Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. I worked like a madman to get her back in the water in time. Her thrashing made it difficult and dangerous. I had to cut the net lengthwise and use it as a sling to hoist her back in. In the end, I was too late, and all I could do was watch while her carcass floated away, belly up. A fisherman pulls a lot of life out of the sea. Sometimes, when things don't go right, he adds his own back into it. 
but a wasted life, a wasted death, brings no joy to anyone, particularly in this case, with a creature so large and gentle. By midnight, we rounded the hook, and I let Granger snooze while I eased us out into the Atlantic, trying not to think about the fact we were a poorly equipped, illegal fishing vessel venturing out into waters normally fished by boats twice our size. For a time, alone with my thoughts, I had to wrestle with turning back. Every mile out, the feeling got worse. We moved far out into the night. After a while, the feeling began to slip away. We were now so far out, it felt like there was no turning back, no point in turning back, which amounts to the same thing. Old fishing boats are rarely retired. They get sold and passed down, owner to owner, each guy a little broker than the guy before, each one gambling he can squeeze just a few more years. Sooner or later, they all sink. When you own an old boat like this one, you know you're somewhere down near the end of the line. You just hope you're lucky enough not to be the last one to own her before she goes down. And if you're not quite so lucky, you just hope you're lucky enough to get off in time before she takes you with her. spot where Hibbert had had his good fortune. It was coming up on midday. I was the only one who hadn't slept. Too much coffee, too keyed up, too much riding on our finding the same fish Hibbert had happened on to. A fresh breeze was blowing out of a cloudless sky. The ocean swells and the water. No other boats in sight. All night long I had been wrestling with the disturbing notion that Hibbert had deliberately led me astray, telling me this place instead of the true location. Granger was showing the others how to rig the doors while I checked the bottom sounder. Nothing showed up down there, but nothing didn't necessarily mean anything. George's flounder are bottom fish, indistinguishable from the muck and rocks until they get up to move. A funny-looking fish, built like a throw rug, both eyes on one side, dark brown on top, albino white underbellies, they move ripple-like, hugging the bottom. Unless they all get up and stampede at once, the sonar won't pick them up. We were using a drag net called an otter trawl, a long, conical-shaped net, something like a Christmas stocking. At the mouth of the net are two eight-foot-long metal plates, called doors, which help steer the net underwater and corral fish into it. Past the mouth of the net is the section known as the wings, which gradually funnels down until it opens up again into what's called the belly. It's in the belly that most of the fish congregate. I gave the order to begin the first tow. Doors all set. Hey! Let it go. Watch the doors go over, belly flopping on the crest of our wake, and then immediately diving under. The net trailing behind us with its bright orange floats bobbing at the surface disappeared into the blue, sinking its way through fifty fathoms. There's nothing more to see now, except the two cable drag lines unwinding off their pulleys, angling behind us off either side of the boat. I set a course running west-southwest, keeping an eye on sonar, making sure we didn't cross over any snags, like sunken ships. There's hardly a trip yet when we haven't pulled up pieces or other of sunken wrecks. Not so pleasant reminders. I looked back at the crew gathered around Granger on the back deck where he was giving additional instruction. Among my fishermen cronies, I had acquired a somewhat dubious reputation for several reasons. One, I had actual books in my library instead of movies. 
too, I tended to be a tad bit more ecological minded than some. Three, I had once committed the unpardonable sin of hiring a woman to crew for me on a scallop drag, a move which raised the ire of some and the eyebrows of others. Plenty would say I was lunatic to attempt a trip so hazardous with so green a crew. By green, I don't just mean inexperienced. Holloway looked like he was doing his best to battle seasickness. Besides me and Granger, there was Crawford. Tall, sort of string bean muscular. Long, stringy hair. Drooping style Fu Manchu mustache. There was Johansson, dressed like a lumberjack with suspenders. The chipperest of the bunch. Contrasted with him was Raymond, whose last name was unpronounceable. He wore black jeans, a black leather jacket, dirty white tennis shoes. He had a lot of nervous energy, plus a tendency to swagger a bit, which I took as an attempt to conceal his own nervousness over how far out we were. Last was Phil Holloway, the youngest, who was thinking about college but hadn't decided. I waited 35 minutes more, then gave the order to haul in. Okay, haul in. Let's see what we got. The moment of truth. The moment I had been both dreading and waiting for. Fishermen are known as farmers of the sea, but what we really are is prospectors. A fisherman is never sure what he's going to find until he finds it. Never sure what he's got till he brings it up. Every time you haul in, there's anticipation. But the first haul of the first day out is doubly so because so often it indicates how the whole trip will go. You stand there in the wheelhouse, looking back at the cables winding in, searching for telltale signs. But there aren't any. Not with a drag line. What may look like extra strain on the cables may only be current, or the angle of your toe, or the size of the ocean swells you're riding. So you wait. Nothing revealed until the net begins showing itself. What do you see? Nothing yet. pitching in, sharing the camaraderie of success. Johansson instantly sprouted a nickname. We called him Sven. Holloway got over his seasickness, started talking about affording college after all, how impressed his girlfriend was going to be. If only it kept on. And it did keep on. Amazing toe after toe, coming up bursting at the seams, filling the hole down below with a growing mountain of flopping bodies. We worked without stopping all that day, all through the night. Around three in the morning, a nasty, threatening wind came up that should have made us move off into deeper water. 
The bow and stern began playing an unnerving game of teeter-totter as big swells rolled under us. We should have moved off to ride it out, but we kept working anyway, ignoring the extra risk that if the net snagged on the hard bottom and we hung up, our chances of capsizing or at least tearing the net to shreds were greatly increased. After a few hours, the wind quit blowing, and the current running against the waves quickly knocked them down to size. That was the only bad weather we encountered, as if weather had anything to do with it. We were coming up on twilight of the second day. I gave the order this would be the final tow. As it turned out, I gave the order one tow too late. The golden sun was coming blinding out of the west. The ocean calm, no wind, no clouds, a clear night's forecast ahead. The dome of the heavens was so opened up, even with the sun still visible. On the other side, stars and planets were already poking through the indigo. We were all of us exhausted. It was all routine now. Hardly any talk. Exhaustion over softening our exuberance. I was up in the wheelhouse, dazed, staring down at Granger, who was aft watching the cables wind in. No running commentary this time. The others, wherever they were, were nowhere in sight. Suddenly I saw him lean forward and stare down into the water, staring hard. What is it? Stripper! We got something here! In the wings! I, I can't I can't tell what it is. It's it's my god! Stripper! It's a body! A human body! What? He couldn't tell at first. He didn't even realize it until he saw the lumberjack clothing. Stipper, my God, it's Fred. It's your handsome. He's strong. Come on, hurry up. What is it? Get him up. Get him in heaven. What is it? It's your handsome. He's in the middle. Can we revive him? I have no chance. Granger was right. There was no doubting he was dead. His face was ghastly white, frozen in a death grimace. His arms reaching around to his shoulder blades as though he were trying to scratch at something. It wasn't an itch. It was the metal buckle joining his suspenders which had caught on the nylon mesh as it was going overboard. In seconds he was yanked over, pulled under before he could even cry out. It was horrible to think about it. The heavy weight of the net dragging him downward through darkness while he struggled, vainly, until his breath ran out. Nobody had seen him go over. Nobody even realized he was gone. Holloway had been in the forecastle sleeping. Crawford and Raymond in the hold. Granger, whose job it was, along with Johansson, to set the doors before the net went over, had set his side and retired to the galley. I was in the wheelhouse. Nobody saw it happen. Even had we, it's doubtful we could have gotten him up in time. Get him in! Come on! Hurry it up! Holloway, get the Jilson line attached! Ranger, take the winch! Okay, I got it! The Jilson line is a thick, braided rope with a strong hook spliced to one end. It's attached to the net before hoisting. From there, it runs up to what's called a hanging block, fastened to the boom overhead, then down to the deck to another block. From there, it's wrapped twice around the power head. It's wrapped twice around the power head. When the winch is engaged, it provides 20,000 pounds of line pull, enough force to hoist a heavy load of fish 10 feet out of the water and deposit them on deck. It can be a dangerous moment because of a thing called a riding turn. What happens is the line wrapped around the winch drum accidentally crosses over itself. In seconds, it binds up, but the winch keeps right on pulling. Very quickly, one of three things will happen. The line breaks loose from the net and the net falls back in the water. The hanging block snaps off and comes crashing down to take the place of where your head used to be. Or else the line snaps off at the drum. When it does, it's apt to go flying through the air in a lethal arc that can slice off a limb like a weed eater cuts grass. Exactly where it snaps makes a difference. If it snaps on top of the drum, it'll take off an arm. If it's below, it's usually a leg. 
In this case, it was on top, and it was Granger's right arm. Granger, watch it! Watch it! <laughs> Look into the face of a man who has just had his arm severed at the shoulder, and you'll see a look you won't ever forget. We all just stood there, his blood gushing out, his arm lying on the deck twitching, his face passing rapidly from disbelief into deepening shock. He sat down, and I tried to help him. Then he seemed to want to lie over on his side, a rivulet of blood crossing the deck, running out the scuppers. Then, staring at the wood grain of the decking in front of his face, very quickly and quietly, he died. I should have notified the Coast Guard, but I didn't. I didn't want to take a chance on Granger's wife hearing the news from anybody but me. Ignoring one more regulation at this point wasn't going to make any difference. Not to the trouble I was already in. Certainly not to the two bodies lying ice down in the hold. If only I had quit one drag sooner, none of this would have happened. I thought I was going to make a killing. Instead, I made two. One man drowned in the net. Another, a close friend. Dead because he was so preoccupied with the first death he wasn't watching what he was doing. And so he became the second. I had to get some sleep. Nothing mattered anymore. I set a course for home. Raymond and Crawford seemed freshest, so I put them on the first watch. I sent Holloway down to sleep and left word to wake me in four hours. Nothing much they could run into out here, and I'd be up again well before we entered the shipping lanes. I went below and climbed into a bunk. I don't remember a thing past the second shoe hitting the floor. What? What? Hey! Hey, hey! Slow down! What the hell? Get up! Something's wrong! Nobody was at the wheel. Nobody at the wheelhouse. The wheel was hard over. I straightened this out, cut the engine. I switched on the outside lighting. A scene on deck leaping from blackness to fluorescent daylight. I could see fore to aft and all around us. They weren't there. What happened? Did you see Crawford or Raymond? I don't see them. Where are they? I think they're off the boat. Well, let's get outside and listen. Listen for calling. Okay. Hear anything? Nothing. Try calling. I'll look around. Raymond! 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 I circled the wheelhouse. I looked down the fish hole, checked the engine room, the galley, everywhere. How had they gotten off? The dory was still on top of the wheelhouse. Had they fallen over? Could they both have fallen over? Why was the wheel thrown hard over like that? I went back out on deck, my mind still groping for an explanation. One had fallen over, the other turning the wheel to circle back and rushed out to help and fallen over too? No, it didn't make sense. And yet, as I stood there puzzling, it was as if some inner workings of my subconscious had figured it out and was trying to get through to me. That's when I saw it. And those same inner workings knew instantly what I was looking at and was able to warn me not to go over and pick it up. Without overhead lights, I never would have seen it. The lighting made all objects on deck stand out in sharp relief. I was looking down at the snap section of the Jilson line. I could see the frayed end where the rope had separated. Then I noticed, a little bit behind that, a piece of bright metal like a nail sticking through the rope. Someone had taken a metal shiv and inserted it through the braids, leaving an inch sticking out either side. 
what would happen when that piece of metal reached the winch drum? As the rope wound tight, the metal point would pivot against the drum, causing the rope to pole vault over itself. The result? A riding turn guarantee. So it hadn't been an accident. And if that wasn't, there was the drowning. There were the disappearances. Which meant... What should we do? Should we try going back? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, tell you what, stay here. Keep listening. I'll be right back. You think they fell over? I don't know. How long can they last in the water? I ducked down the companionway steps to the forecastle. Close the door. I keep a pistol wrapped in a plastic bag stowed in a hidden compartment beneath my bunk. It was there. I checked the clip. It was gone. Yeah, I'm coming. Just a minute. I'm wondering, maybe we ought to call the Coast Guard. They can send a helicopter. Wait, hey, 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 look who's back. Where have you been? Hey! Holloway! Holloway! Get away from the door! Holloway! Holloway, the door opens out! Get away from it! Holloway! Holloway! He was on the floor. Legs outstretched, slumped over, a nine-inch-long fish pick shoved up under his ribs with only the handle still showing. I drew back in and closed the door. I had to think. It had to be Crawford or Raymond, one of the two. Whichever one it wasn't was probably dead along with the rest. It was Crawford then. It had to be. He was the only one big enough and strong enough to know that he could overpower Holloway the way he did. Why was he doing this? To, to settle a grudge? To keep the profits for himself? No, it was crazy. Should I call out to him? Try to negotiate? Find out what it was? Somehow I knew talk was useless. His stealth, his cunning, made it obvious this was some sort of game. Of survival. I had to have a weapon. A gun. Worthless without bullets. Wait. The fish pick. It was gone. Crawford had come back for it. Stupid. Dumb. Either I start thinking smarter or it was going to be all over real quick. Crazy or not, Crawford had shown amazing ability to anticipate everybody's moves as well as improvise. I had better start doing some improvising of my own. Two options. Rush him or stay put. Staying put was out of the question. Rushing him meant going up the companionway steps into the wheelhouse. The wheelhouse was definitely high ground here. The engine controls were there, the radio, the lifeboat on the roof. There was another way up. It meant going through the engine room into the fish hold and coming up through the hatch, but both ways could be easily watched by Crawford at the same time. Ultimately, rushing him seemed like a poor choice. The plan I finally decided on was neither rushing him nor staying put. It relied on the fact that there was actually a third way up, a way I didn't think Crawford would know about. I picked it also because it was probably the last thing anybody would ever think of doing when they're 80 miles out at sea. I was going to abandon ship. I removed my shoes. I opened the forward locker and took out a duffel bag which contained a survival suit. I took a deep breath and then opened the cabin door. Moving quickly, stepping over Holloway, I slipped down the short hallway past the galley and went there, into the engine room. Total darkness. The door to the fishbowl was behind the engine. I groped my way around to it and carefully began working the dogging latches free. He shut down the engine. I could almost feel his suspicions rising. The thinnest amount of light filtered down through the hatch cover overhead. The air was chilled because of the ice. I could see my breath. I wanted to switch on a light, if only for a second. There was a mountain of fish down here. Two dead bodies. Also, possibly a murderer. But I didn't dare risk it. 
The center aisle of a fish hold is called a slaughterhouse. It, as well as all of the side bins, were chocked full of fish. At first, climbing on hands and knees at the top of the pile, I had to flip over on my back and pull myself along using the underside of the timbers, dragging the duffel behind me. In the darkness and confined space, it was claustrophobic. My nerves so on edge, it wasn't helping that the dead fish were spasming when touched, a muscle reflex making them seem alive again. I was reaching with my right hand to grab another handhold when my hand closed around a tennis shoe with the foot still in it. Thank God he didn't jerk or move. It was Raymond, dead as a codfish. How he died, I couldn't tell. But that he was dead was a foregone. The underside of his body, the part in contact with the ice, was already taking on the characteristics of frozen meat. I pulled him by the legs, slid his body past me to make room for myself. I shoveled fish out of the way until I was able to clear space around a little crawl-through door that led into the lazarette. I got it open and wiggled through. The lazarette is a small stoop-over storage area back by the stern. It houses the steering assembly, connecting the wheelhouse with the rudder, a contraption of pulleys and cables. Using a screwdriver, I took a few seconds to do some anti-repair work on the mechanism. If I did make it off, I didn't want him coming after me. Quiet, quietly, I lifted the manhole cover and put it aside. I poked my head up. The overhead lights were still on. The big net drum over my head was throwing a shadow over me. The chafing gear of the net hanging down provided an actual curtain I could come up behind. I couldn't see him. Hopefully that meant he couldn't see me. Because of the bulkiness of the suit, I couldn't get into it until I was up on deck. If he saw me or heard me while I was getting into it, or while I was slipping over the transom, I'd be helpless to defend myself. Moving quickly, I was up on deck in seconds, slipping my legs into the rubber legs, my arms into the arms, the hood around my face. Now the only part of me exposed to the elements at all was a small circle around my face. I sat down clumsily, rolled onto my stomach. Holding onto a line, I lowered myself into the water. I pushed off, paddling backwards, anxious to make it beyond the circle of light into the surrounding dark. I maneuvered to keep the net drum between me and the wheelhouse as much as possible, knowing if he looks back now, under these lights I'll show up like a neon bobber on a fishing pole. Trying to move in this thing was like trying to swim wearing five overcoats. The thick, buoyant foam rubber kept me floating on my back, high up, in a sort of recline allowed your position. The little paddle stroke I was doing with my hands was the only way I could move at all. It was maddening. Here I was, racing for the dark, having to get there doing a ridiculous duck paddle. At last, at last, I entered the darkness and disappeared. Now he couldn't see me. I kept moving, further off, looking back the whole time, looking for Crawford to appear. I could see all of Smuggler now, see how low in the water she was riding, her belly so full of fish. Moving away, I kept watching, the boat showing up now like a solitary car someone had abandoned under a street lamp. Still, no one visible on deck. Just then, movement... A blur running from the wheelhouse. A shadow diving down the steps. The next instant... Things falling all around. Flaming timbers landing with a loud splash. A hiss and going out. Fish heads. Pieces of fish falling. Shaved ice drifting down like snowflakes. The burning slick of diesel fuel illuminated in a firelight glow what was left of Smuggler, still afloat, her wheelhouse, most of her deck wiped away, gone, the rest on fire. 
The propane tank in the galley had gone first, setting off the acetylene for the welder's torch, then the diesel, including the extra drum stored in front of the wheel hubs. What had Crawford done? Was it accidental or intentional? Some sort of act of suicide designed to take me with him? A murderous scheme gone awry, catching him in his own devices. I'd never find out. Another sound came into my hearing. Behind. I swiveled myself around. It was Crawford, coming at me. Stay away from me, Crawford! Oh my God! He had me by the foot. He was towing me towards the burning slick. He was hurt, badly hurt, losing blood, but it wasn't taking much strength to overpower me. I couldn't reach him. I couldn't sit up. Couldn't lower my legs. Couldn't kick hard enough to make him let go. Couldn't paddle hard enough to resist the irresistible force of him pulling me towards the burning. He was turning me, getting ready to float me into it. Next thing I knew, we were moving sideways. Not just being both of us. And towing me, something underneath the surface towing him. I saw him reach down to fend it off. The tail of a large fish swirled beside my head. His arm came up, shreds of flesh hanging down. He was trying to climb on, use me as a raft, get out of the water. But it was too late. The shark had already made its turn. <laughs> the fire slowly burned itself out. More sharks came. 30,000 pounds of exploded fish was enough to call them in from a long way off. But the ones that came fed quietly. No frenzy. Just fish going about their supper. For hours I rode the up and down seesaw of ocean swells and looked up at stars so brilliant it was like I had never seen them before. Except for a faint purplish light on the rim of the horizon, the sky above and the water beneath were exactly the same. Except in one case, the myriad stars were fixed in the heavens. The other, they swam around whenever I made a swirl in the water. Other kind of stars appeared when I dug deeper and stirred up the phosphorescence. I don't know why I wasn't worried. Not about sharks. Not about where I was. All alone. I felt completely safe. Stirring up the phosphorescence was like... Stirring my arm in champagne, so wonderful did it feel to be alive. I raised a silent toast to Granger and the others who died, and my boat now sunk. All fishermen, fishermen's wives, to the stars and sharks, yes, even to the Coast Guard, without whose meddling I never would have bothered with survival suits. In the morning, when I saw a boat approaching, I thought it might be the Coast Guard, but it turned out to be the Christina, with Hibbert poking his head out the wheelhouse. Hibbert, you fish for brains! Got off lover of a goosefish moron! Goodness gracious, did that come out of me? It's your fault I got into this! My fault! My fault, is it? I gotta let you spin back, you pirate! Bag it! Beast! Bag it! Herman, beast! Come on, now, my good Hear me! You're gonna fuck! You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of Five Fathom Rev. The actors in tonight's play. Bobby Winslow was played by Stephen Russell. Bob Gianferranti was Hibbert. Bill Dane was Granger. Art Devine played the part of Holloway. 
Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Engineering by John Todd. Original music by Mark Birmingham. Special thanks to Skipper Bobby Cole for allowing us to borrow freely from his life and to the rest of the crew of the Rams, Pete, Jeff, Rich, and Phil, for providing a little more realism than necessary on that particular Halloween night at sea. This program is copyrighted by Stephen Thomas Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. This is George McCombell wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Dear Constable. Evening, Cabby. Not the pleasantest way to spend a night such as this. Walking the beach, eh, hey, Constable? Mm. Or oh, driving a hack. What say to that, Cabby? I say right you are. I wish I was home in my bed under my covers. You can't wish it more than I. I might as well be for all the fares I stand to make. Hey, care for a spot to ward off the chill. Oh, no, thank you. On duty, you know. I thought it'd be in Christmas Eve and all. Well, here's to you mm. just the same. Quiet night tonight. Peaceful like. It's the snowfall. Makes the city all hushed and muffled. Oh, hold your horses, old girl. She thinks we ought to be moving on. She may be an horse, but of the two of us, she's got the better end for business. <laughs> she's right, too. You won't collect many fares down here this time of night. Nothing but offices, all closed. Right, then. We'll push along. Try to drum up some business elsewhere. For your own sake, Constable, I hope you don't drum up any for yourself. It'll suit me fine if I don't. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. A Merry Christmas, Cabby. Happy New Year and many more. Same to you. Pardon me. Watch it, sir. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I didn't see Just you. Just a minute. Where do you think you're going in such a hurry? Going? I'm not going anywhere. I mean, the I was just way leaving. you came out of is a dead end. All the offices down there are closed this time of night. I was visiting someone. Who? Mr. Scrooge? He's the only one who lives down there. Come on now. What's this in your hand? Uh, I, I don't know. Looks like a section of bell cord. Where did you get it? I, I'm not sure. I must have picked it up somewhere. I think we'd best go and inquire about Mr. No. Scrooge. No. Wait, you don't understand. I, I was just coming to find you. It's been an accident. Hmm? What sort of accident? Mr. Scrooge. He's been killed. Murdered, I What's think. this? All right, sir. Come along with me. We'll see no. about this. No, no. You go yourself. You don't need me. Come along now. Let's have no trouble. Please. I don't want to go. I can't. Stop, sir. Oh. Stop, I say. Stop. Good evening, and welcome once again to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Tonight we present an historical mystery thriller entitled The Case of the Murdered Miser. Why historical? Let me explain by reading to you two clippings taken from the London Herald. The first is dated December 25th, 1832. An elderly man was murdered last night in his home on Cheapside Row. The victim, identified as Ebenezer Scrooge, was found shortly after midnight. Police reports state that he had been strangled with a section of bell cord and a stake of holly driven through his heart. The incident was uncovered by Constable Delwood Perkins, who became suspicious of foul play when he saw a man fleeing the scene. After a foot chase, the suspect, identified as Bob Cratchit, was apprehended when he slipped on a patch of ice and was knocked unconscious. An investigation is proceeding. The second clipping is dated two weeks later. 
The trial for the murder of Ebenezer Scrooge is slated to begin Monday in Judge Francis Hawkins' courtroom. The case, which has received widespread attention owing to the gruesome manner in which the murder was carried out, was today made even more sensational with the announcement that the famous barrister, Sir Percy Mason, will be appearing on behalf of the defense. His counterpart for the prosecution will be Hamilton Burgermeister, Esquire. Who was Ebenezer Scrooge? By the evidence of these two clippings, there is now proof that he was much more than a fictional character created to appear in a novel written during the late 1800s. Ebenezer Scrooge existed. He was real. He lived in London, and it was there on December 25th, 1832, that he met a most untimely death. Who was the real Ebenezer Scrooge? Why was he murdered? And most importantly, who did it? To find out, let us go back to the courtroom of Judge Francis Hawkins in the old Bailey Courthouse in the city of London, where a trial is about to commence. The main floor and upper balconies are packed with spectators, anxiously awaiting the moment when the accused will be brought in and placed in the dock. Up above, in the gallery reserved for the press, two reporters are taking their seats along the rail. One is an older man whose name is Raleigh Fingers. He is a veteran crime reporter who has attended many criminal proceedings and who knows well how to gather up the most lurid details and set them forth in a manner that the readers of the daily tabloids find most informative. The other one, the one taking his place beside him, is a younger man in his early twenties and new at the job. He is a reporter for The Sun, and this is his first murder case. He has small hands and a large head with large brown eyes that seem to take in the room all at once. There is about him a sensitivity that would seem to make him ill-suited for the callousness of crime reporting. Brawley Fingers likes this young man, even though he is convinced he will never make a good reporter. He calls him Dickie Boy. Even though his real name, the one he was born with, and the one that later will become known to all the world, is Charles Dickens. There, Dickie Boy, I said you're the best seat in the house. You won't want to miss this one. Your first murder trial, and you couldn't pick a better one. They don't always come this highly recommended. Is that the accused sitting there? That's him, all right. Bob Cratchit, the murderer. Bob Cratchit, the fiend. He doesn't appear that sinister to me. He looks rather meek. Ah, that's your inexperience showing already. Of course he looks that way, sitting there in the dark. They all do. They all want to appear like perfect saints. Don't let that fool you. He looks quite small and timid. And those are just the ones most likely to commit murder. The world is always picking on them, you see. And he keeps it bottled up inside until finally the pressure gets too much. Really? Is that his family sitting there behind him? That's them. Mrs. Cratchit and the children. Peter, he the oldest. Then comes Belinda. Next to her, the pretty one with the dark hair and dark eyes. That's Martha. She's the eldest daughter. What's that she's given to the little boy beside her? Ah, that's Tiny Tim, so they call him. He's got a sickness and he's partially crippled. Uh, looks to me uh, like Godfrey's cordial she's spoken of. Combination of opium and treacle. No doubt it's to quiet his cough. Poor little fellow. Ah, and that's exactly what Sir Percy is open with all think. He's a smart one, Sir Percy is. And he's not above using any trick that'll sway a jury. Which one is Sir Percy? My boy, you really are a novice. Why, that's him standing down there in the center of that little crowd. Looking like he's got the case won already. Hmm, he does appear confident. And the less reason he has to feel that way, the more he seems to radiate. 
But look at Hamilton Bergermeister. He's confident, too, and rightly so. He knows he's got all the evidence he needs to convict a cold-blooded killer. Sir Percy may have won some cases in the past, but his being famous won't save his client this time. You really believe Cratchit is guilty? Ah, it's not just me that thinks so. I always look to a much more uh, reliable authority, the betting public. Down at the dog fights and the rat matches, they're betting 20 to 1 against Cratchit. Of course, the odds dropped a bit when Sir Percy came on, but they jumped right back up as soon as it was announced that Judge Hawkins would hear the case. Is that bad? Is it bad? Not if you're the prosecution, oh, it ain't. I... The prisoners at Newgate Hall refer to his honor as the Hawk, owing to his predatory disposition towards those unfortunate enough to appear before him. Yes, he does appear something like a bird of prey. And Cratchit is the snake that's about to be pounced on. Take my word for it. Not long after this trial is finished, Bob Cratchit will be keeping an appointment with a rope down an Irish monger lane. Sir Percy, is the defense prepared to proceed? Yes, my lord. Uh, Mr. Bergermeister? The prosecution is ready, my lord. Very well. Call your first witness. The prosecution calls Constable Delwood Perkins. Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the evidence you shall give before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Delwood Perkins. And your rank? Police constable. Now, constable, do you recall where you were on the evening of December 24th last at approximately 12 midnight? Yes, sir, I do. I was walking my usual beat through the financial district. And will you tell the court what happened? I was approaching the corner of Fleet Street and Cheapside Row when the accused, Mr. Cratchit, came around the corner at a high rate of speed and nearly bowled me over. What did you do? I asked him where he was going in such a hurry. He intimated that he was just leaving somewhere. I knew that all the business offices on Cheapside Row were closed... And so I asked him where he was coming from. What did he say? He said that he had just been to visit Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. He seemed quite agitated. I noticed he had what looked like a section of bell cord in his hand. I asked him where he got it, and he said he didn't remember. I became suspicious and suggested that we go and have a talk with Mr. Scrooge. What was his response to your suggestion? He suddenly blurted out that Mr. Scrooge was dead. I then insisted that he come along. He resisted, and then he broke free and ran. I gave pursuit, and the subject was apprehended a few blocks later when he slipped on a patch of ice. What did you do then? After turning the accused over into the custody of another constable, I returned to the scene of the crime. Uh, that is, you went to Mr. Scrooge's home? That's right. And what did you find when you arrived? I found the front door unlocked and slightly ajar. I knocked first and then called out, but I received no answer. I went in. Directly, I went upstairs where I found the bedroom door also standing open. I noticed the bed curtains on one side of the bed were pulled back. I found Mr. Scrooge lying in bed. He was dead. Will you describe for us how the body looked when you found it? The deceased was lying on his back, with his eyes staring upwards at the ceiling. He was wearing a white linen nightgown and nightcap. There were bruises around his neck that showed evidence of strangulation. The bruises showed the pattern of a braided rope that matched the bell cord beside his bed. A section of this rope was found in the possession of the accused. Go on. What else did you notice about the body? There was a piece of wood, about eight inches long and sharpened into a stake, protruding from the chest of the victim. There was relatively little bleeding around the wound, indicating that the stake had been inserted after Mr. Scrooge had already met his death. By strangulation? Yes, sir, that is correct. Did you feel the body? I did. It was still warm to the touch. Also, the blood was not yet congealed, which indicated to me that the body had not been dead for very long. How long? 
I would estimate approximately 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, death must have occurred about the same time or shortly before you encountered Bob Crackett coming out of Cheapside Road. Yes, sir. That is my opinion. Very well. Now, tell us what did you do next? I went back downstairs and outside. I wanted to make a careful study of the footprints in the snow before the other investigators arrived. What did you find? I found one set of prints, matching those of the accused, leading both to and from Mr. Scrooge's house. That was all? Yes, sir, that was it. And in your opinion, is that the only way that someone could have entered or left the premises? That's quite right. Mr. Scrooge's residence adjoins other buildings on both sides and in back. There are no windows except in the front of the house. The front door is the only way into or out of the house. So, anyone visiting Mr. Scrooge must necessarily have gone down the alley and entered by the front door and left the same way. Yes, sir. It's a dead end, you see. Yes, I think we do. Thank you, Constable. I have no further questions. Your witness, Sir Percy. Constable Perkins, let's begin with those footprints you found in the snow. You say when you examined them, you found only one set belonging to the accused. That's right. Aren't you forgetting something? No. Unless you mean my prints, of course they were there too. I wasn't thinking of yours, I was thinking of someone else's. Someone whose footprints should have been present as well. I, I don't know what you mean. The deceased, Ebenezer Scrooge. Why didn't you find his prints also? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, you see, we've established that Mr. Scrooge came home around 9 o'clock that evening. However, it didn't begin snowing until around 10, when it began to snow quite heavily. So you see, his footprints would not have shown up. In other words, before 10 o'clock when the snowfall began, anyone might have visited the apartment without having left behind any telltale prints. Well, yes, but of course we know that the murder took place at midnight, not before. Because the body was still warm? That is correct. I was going to ask you about that. You say that when you arrived, the body was warm and the blood uncongealed, and therefore you were able to place the time of the murder as having taken place ten or fifteen minutes before. That is my opinion, yes. When you found the deceased, he was dressed in a nightshirt? Yes. The covers on the bed were thrown back? Yes, they were. Did you pull them back? No, I did not. What was the temperature in the room? I'm not sure... About normal, I'd say. The fire was still burning in the grate? I believe so. The window was shut? It was. Of course, it's true that a body lying outside exposed to the cold cools down much more rapidly than one left inside a comfortably warm room. Yes. A dead body in a warm room cools quite gradually, in fact. Gradually, uh, yes. And yet, by simply touching the deceased... You were able to arrive at the conclusion that death had taken place exactly ten or fifteen minutes before. I didn't say exactly. Could it have been fifteen or twenty minutes? It's possible. Or twenty-five or thirty or even forty-five minutes? Isn't it a fact, Constable, that the reason you chose ten to fifteen minutes is that it conveniently fits the time frame you have established for when you encountered Mr. Cratchit outside Scrooge's flat? Certainly not. Uh, uh, of course, I'll admit to some leeway, but I still hold that it was probably ten to fifteen minutes. Clearly, it was not before ten o'clock, as you seem to be implying by the footprints in the snow. After you examined those prints, what else did you do? I went back inside and waited for the others to show up. Did you search upstairs? No, sir, I waited. You didn't even go up? Did no. Did you look under the bed? No. Did you look in the closet? No, I did not. Did anyone ever? I, I can't say. Seems a rather careless way to conduct an investigation. But then it's understandable, isn't it? Since you already assumed you had the killer in custody. We only assume what the facts suggest. In other words, you investigate the obvious and ignore all other possibilities. My lord, I have no further questions. Before you step down, constable, I have one further question. 
In your investigation, did you examine the windows both upstairs and down? Yes, sir. They were all locked from the inside. The front door, was there any sign of a forced entry? No, sir. None at all. The bedroom door, which the deceased normally kept locked at night, that was opened also? It was. Therefore, is it fair to suppose that whoever murdered Mr. Scrooge must have been admitted into the apartment by Scrooge himself? That Scrooge must have known the killer personally? Otherwise, it is doubtful he would have let him in at all? Yes, sir. You might call that a reasonable assumption. Thank you very much. No further questions. The prosecution wishes to call Mr. Frederick Applegate. Mr. Fingers, who oh, is Frederick Applegate? Ah, dicky boy, is Scrooge's nephew. Old Evan Eyes never married, but his sister did. Ah, is their son. I have no idea what he's going to say. But it's certain not to be good news for the murderous Mr. Cratchit. Mr. Applegate, please tell the court what is your relation to the deceased... I am Ebenezer Scrooge's nephew. And do you recall where you were last December 24th at approximately 5 o'clock? Yes, I went to visit my uncle at his office. Please tell the court, to the best of your recollection, exactly what transpired while you were there. I went to see him around 5 o'clock. I knew I would find him there. My uncle always kept very regular and punctual working hours. When I entered, I saw Mr. Cratchit uh, sitting at his desk in the outer room. A Merry Christmas, Mr. Cratchit. Merry Christmas, sir. I trust you are keeping the season well this year. Oh, yes, sir, quite well. Who is it? Cratchit, who's there? It is your nephew, sir. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right of you to be merry? What reason of you to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come then. What right of you to be dismal? What reason of you to be morose? You're rich enough. Humbug. Oh, don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them for a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stick of holly through his heart. Those were his exact words. Yes, sir. He said... Boiled in pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. And would you say, Mr. Applegate, that the person sitting in the adjoining room definitely overheard this oh, remark? Objection, my lord. The prosecution is calling for a conclusion of the witness. Uh, let me rephrase that. Mr. Applegate, if you had been in the next room, do you think you would have overheard this statement? Yes, uh, I think so, quite easily. Thank you. No further questions. Your witness, Sir Percy. Mr. Applegate, were you aware that your uncle died in test state? I'm sorry? Without a will. Your uncle left no will. Oh, yes. Well, of course, I'm aware of it now. I wasn't at the time. At the time of your uncle's death? That's right. 
And we were also aware that under English law, and as the only surviving relative, you will be entitled to the bulk of your uncle's estate. Once again, I'm aware of it now. I wasn't at the time. Hmm, yes. Tell me, Mr. Applegate, who was present in the room when your uncle uttered this inflammatory remark about the holly stake? There was no one else. Uh, there was my uncle, Mr. Cratchit, and, and me. Thank you. No further questions. Objection, my lord! This sort of backhanded, slanderous insinuation is outrageous and totally uncalled for. Mr. Applegate is not on trial here. Oh, I'm merely pointing out that the accused was not the only person present when this remark was made. Objection overruled. Very well, then. In that case, for your own sake, Mr. Applegate, I will ask you to tell us where you were on the evening of December 24th at approximately 12 midnight. I was attending a party at my own house. I was in the company of my wife, my family, and friends. Uh, the party continued until very late. There are many people who can vouch for my whereabouts. Thank you, Mr. Applegate. I feel we all owe you an apology. Objection. If Mr. Burgomaster wishes to apologize for his own behavior, he may do so. I am perfectly capable of extending my own apologies when and if they are called for. I warn you both, I will tolerate no personal exchanges between counsel. Sir Percy, in view of the strength of evidence pending against your client, I think that you will do well to concentrate on his defense rather than your own. Yes, my lord. Mr. Burgermeister, call your next witness. We call Giles Pithy. Giles Pithy, take the stand. Who is this one? Can't say, never saw him before. Judging by the nicely tailored clothes and the silver handled cane, I'd say he's been eating his bread without crust for some time. Witnesses like these always make a strong impression on a jury. State your name, please. Giles Pithy. What is your occupation, Mr. Pithy? I am senior insurance agent for Handlers of London. On the afternoon of December 24th last, do you recall stopping in to pay a visit on Mr. Scrooge at his office? Yes. Please tell us what happened. I stopped by to pay a call just after five o'clock that afternoon. In fact, I remember I was coming in just as your last witness, Mr. Applegate, was leaving. Mr. Cratchit, uh, that is the accused, ushered me into Mr. Scrooge's office. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these past seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. I have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. <clears throat> but this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are, still. I wish I could say that they were not. The thread mill and the poor law are in full vigor, then. Both very busy, sir. So, I was afraid from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. Yes. Now, as to the matter of a contribution for the poor, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask what I wish, sir, that is my answer. I hope to support the establishments I've mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir. And that is the conversation that took place 
As nearly as I can recall, it was. Mr. Fizzy, let me ask you this. If you were a man whose own family was nearly destitute and whose need for financial assistance was great, do you believe overhearing these remarks would have had an inciting effect upon your mind? Objection, my lord, objection. Sustained. Council will refrain from posing questions which call for a conclusion of the witness. Certainly, my lord. I withdraw the question. Will you state your full name for the court? Martha Pritchett. A little louder, please, so that everyone can hear you. Martha Cratchit. You are the oldest daughter of Bob Cratchit, is that right? Yes, sir. How old are you? Sixteen. You go to school? No, sir. I have a job. Who is your employer? Miss, Mr. Higgins of Higgins Millinery Shop. Your brothers and sisters also work? Yes, sir. I, I mean, no. Except for Tiny Tim. Why is that? Be because he's crippled, sir. No, I mean, why is it that you all work? Why, sir? I I'm not, not certain what you mean. Well, uh... Is it because your father did not earn enough to provide for you himself? Yes, sir. I, I suppose so. Martha, is it true that your father resented being paid only 15 shillings a week? I, I don't know. You never heard him complain about the salary he was earning? Remember, you are under oath? Yes, sir. Sometimes. But not always. Martha... Your brother, Tiny Tim, is partially crippled, is that correct? Yes. He is also of failing health, is he not? Yes. The doctor informed your parents that if he did not receive treatment, very expensive medical treatment, very soon, there was little chance that he would grow up to lead a normal life? Yes, sir. Now, Martha, isn't it a fact that your father vowed to you all that he would find some way to raise the necessary funds no matter what he had to do? Yes. Come, come, speak up. Yes. Thank you very much, Martha. Your witness, Sir Percy. Tell me, Martha, has your father ever hit you? Oh, no. Have you ever seen him strike your sister, or your brothers, no, or sir. your mother? Never, not once. Tell me, Martha. Do you suppose it is fairly common for a man to come home and complain to his family about his job or about his boss? Oh, yes, sir. I'm sure it is. And that this is rarely an indication that that person is about to go out and perpetrate a murder. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sure of it. Martha, do you believe your father killed Ebenezer Scrooge? Oh, no, sir. I certainly didn't. He just couldn't. He's not the sort of person who would ever kill anyone. Thank you, Martha. No further questions. Excuse me, Miss Cratchit. If I may be allowed one final question on redirect. Would you agree it is possible for a man, even a mild-mannered man, to be driven to commit a crime such as murder because he finds himself in a desperate situation? But my father would never... Just answer the question, please. Would you agree it's possible? Yes. What was that? Yes. Thank you. No further questions. And so the trial for the murder of Ebenezer Scrooge continued. The prosecution went on presenting its case against Bob Cratchit laying down additional evidence of guilt while Sir Percy Mason continued doing everything he could to try to soften the blows. Meanwhile, Sir Percy's trusted friend, private investigator Paul Mandrake, worked around the clock trying to uncover some new lead or some small shred of evidence that Sir Percy could use to try to build a case in favor of his client. 
It was with this purpose in mind that Paul Mandrake stopped into the Boar's Head Tavern, where Scrooge had partaken of his last meal before going home that night to meet his death. The man behind the bar was named Barney Sullivan, a big, burly man with a big, bushy mustache that from the other side of the room resembled a dead squirrel hanging above his upper lip. Or so it seemed to Paul Mandrake as he strolled in from the street and casually took up an empty place at the bar. Yes, sir. What will I bring you? A pint of bitter, please. Coming up. Isn't this the tavern that that man who was murdered... Oh, what's his name? Ebenezer Scrooge. Didn't he used to come here? That's right, sir. He used to sit at that table over there in the corner. Came in every night at the same time for years. Quite a regular customer, he was. In all that time, uh, you two must have become pretty good friends, eh? <laughs> With him? Not hardly. Fact is, he never even talked to me. He'd come in, sit down, and I'd bring him his meal. Always the same thing. And that was that. Hmm. He much of a tipper? Ah, never. He wouldn't have left me a tip if it was to save his life. If you ask me, it was that same kind of attitude that got him killed. Uh, you think they caught the fellow that did it? I don't think. I knows it. Oh? How do you know? Because I saw him. That is, I saw him coming here the night it happened. Scrooge was at his usual table, having his usual meal, and that fellow Bob Cratchit comes slinking in. I hears him talking to Scrooge in a low, imploring sort of voice. Then the old man stands up and points to the door. Get out, he says. Get out this minute. Did he go? Oh, he left all right. I saw him. But his face was all splotchy, his lips were tight, and his hands were bald in the fists. <laughs> he did it all right. Mark me. I'm not saying he didn't have some justification, but he did it. He killed Ebenezer Scrooge. That was the way it seemed to go. The more Mandrake dug into the case, the more evidence he seemed to find that pointed the accusing finger directly at Bob Cratchit. Still, he didn't give up. Meanwhile, back at the Old Bailey Courthouse, the prosecution had completed its case, and Sir Percy, left with no other choice, was forced to place on the stand the only person who could refute the charges leveled against the defendant. The defendant himself, Bob Cratchit. Now, Bob, I should like you to tell the court in your own words, and as accurately as you can, exactly what happened when you visited Ebenezer Scrooge's home on the night in question. Yes, sir, I, I, I'll do my best. Of course, I had been thinking quite a lot about the money I needed to raise for my son's medical expenses. I'd already approached Mr. Scrooge earlier that evening about the possibility of a loan. He turned me down. But I felt that if I went to see him once more and really explain my situation, he might reconsider. It was nearly midnight by the time I arrived on foot outside his residence. It was very cold and I recall it had been snowing for several hours. I climbed the steps up to his front door. I was about to use the knocker when I noticed the door was already open. What did you do? I, I knocked anyway. There was no answer. I began to wonder if something was wrong, so I went in. Mr. Scrooge? Hello? Mr. I began to feel something definitely was wrong. I closed the door and climbed the stairs to his bedroom. Hello, Mr. Scrooge? Mr. Scrooge, are you at, at home? At the top of the stairs, I found the bedroom door open just a crack. I opened it the rest of the way. The bedroom was mostly dark. There was a little light coming from the fire in the grate, and a candle was still burning on the nightstand beside his bed. I noticed a half-finished cup of gruel beside the candle. The bed curtains were pulled back on one side of the bed. I could see Mr. Scrooge lying there. 
The covers were drawn up to his chin. As I approached, thinking he must be asleep, I saw that his eyes were open and staring upwards. Then I saw the look on his face. And I knew something dreadfully was wrong. My first thought was that he must have had a seizure. I drew back the covers just a bit and I saw the bell cord knotted tightly around his neck. Quickly I untied the knot thinking, hoping it would revive him. I threw the covers back all the way, and it was then that I saw the stake protruding from his chest. After that, I don't remember. I must have run from the room, still clutching the bell cord in my hand. I don't remember, Constable Perkins. I don't remember slipping on the ice. All I remember is running. That's the way it happened, I swear it. I never killed him. I never murdered Mr. Scrooge! <laughs> Mr. Burgermeister, would the prosecution care to cross-examine Oh, the yes, my lord. Most certainly. We wouldn't miss this for the world. Mr. Cratchit, I should like to go back to the moment when you first arrived at Mr. Scrooge's residence. This was Bob. This was Bob Cratchit's own account of what happened, and although it may have convinced a few of the jurors, it took only a few minutes under skillful cross-examination by Hamilton Burgermeister for them to change their minds back again. It was said that Burgermeister could take a schoolboy reciting the alphabet and make it sound as though he were telling a pack of vicious lies. While Burgermeister was busy discrediting Cratchit's testimony, Paul Mandrake entered the courtroom and whispered something in Sir Percy's ear that made the barrister suddenly sit up. This incident did not go unnoticed by Raleigh Fingers, who nudged the young reporter at his side to pay attention. Burgermeister had no sooner finished his cross-examination than Sir Percy was instantly on his feet requesting an hour-long recess. The motion was passed by Judge Hawkins, who, although reluctant to grant a continuance, nevertheless made it clear that he was always willing to extend any courtesy that would ensure the defendant got a fair trial, regardless of how guilty he was. All right. Hear ye, hear ye. All persons having official business in the matter now before this court are hereby called to order. His Lordship Judge Francis Hawkins presiding. Court is now in session. Be seated. Sir Percy, the court has seen fit to grant your request for recess. Are you now ready to continue with the defense? We are, my lord. The defense wishes to call Davy O'Shanty to the stand. Call Davy O'Shanty? Mr. Fingers, who are they bringing in now? Hard to say, Dicky boy. Judging by the prison garb and the shackles round his ankles, I'd say he's obviously taping up lodgings at Newgate. What forever still serve today remains to be seen. Mr. O'Shanty, will you state your full name for the court? Davy O'Shanty. 
Finn, will you please tell us where you were on the evening of December 24th last? I was occupying a doorway in the hallway on Cheapside Road, just outside Mr. Scrooge's apartment. What were you doing there? Sleeping. And how long were you asleep? Till just before I woke up. <laughs> Mr. O'Shanty, I think you would be well advised to reserve your levity for some other time. Oh, certainly, your lordship. I only wish to do whatever I can that will help starve the cause of justice. Never mind all that. Just get on with it. Mr. O'Shanty... What time would you estimate it was when you awoke? Well, it were two o'clock in the morning, sir. I know it's that for a fact. It were the ringing of the bell in the clock tower that woke me in the first place. And what did you see when you awoke? Nothing at first, except the snow falling. Then from where I was, I saw the door to Mr. Scrooge's apartment open and two coppers come out, carrying a stiff. It were all wrapped up like a Christmas goose, but I figured it must have been Mr. Scrooge, him being the only person living there at the time. What did you do then? Well, I decided it might be a convenient time to pay a visit. In other words, you decided to break in. Not exactly. I tried the front door first. And finding it locked? Well, then I, I sort of negotiated an agreement with the downstairs window. It were quite dark once I got inside. There were no lights, but I could tell it was the sitting room. I started to cross over to the door leading to the hallway and... I had to be careful so as not to bump into any of the furniture. When I got to the door, I were, I were just about to open it when suddenly I hear the sound coming from the other side. Someone was coming down the stairs real quiet like, almost like a ghost tiptoeing in the dark. I stepped back away from the door, thinking whoever it was was coming in. He keeps on listening, and in another minute I hear the front door opens and closed, and whoever it was was gone. I waited a few minutes more, and then figuring whosoever it was they weren't coming back, I, I went about me business. Thank you, Mr. O'Shante. You have been most forthright in your answers. Cross-examine, Mr. Burgermeister. Mr. Oshanti, pray tell us what was this business that you went about doing. Well, I sort of helped myself to some of Mr. Scrooge's belongings. His bed curtains and sheets and the like. Stuff he wouldn't be needing no more. You stole them. Well, you could say that. Except that I was always willing to give him back any time he asked. A crime for which you were later apprehended and sentenced to Newgate. My lord, I see no reason to waste the court's time cross-examining this witness. If Sir Percy wishes to attempt to establish the innocence of his client based on the testimony of an admitted felon, let him do so at his own peril. I will not bother refuting the statements of a witness who would obviously lie as easily as he draws breath. Send him back to Newgate. That's where he belongs. Uh, that may be your privilege, Mr. Burgermeister. However, as magistrate, I should like to pose a few questions myself. Mr. O'Shanty, you admit to stealing property from Mr. Scrooge. How do we know that you did not also murder him? What? Murder him? Why, how wouldn't? Why would I? I didn't even know him. Do you suppose that all murderers know their victims? Yeah, hold up on this. You can't lay this one on me. 
You can't say I did it. I never killed him. Hey, let me lose the witness. Oh, no, I'm dying for you. I'm innocent, I tell you. I never killed him. I only stole from him. I don't want to end for you. <laughs> Now that we have satisfactorily taken care of that witness, I see by the clock that it is almost time for adjournment. We will stop for the day and resume again tomorrow at nine o'clock. Court is adjourned. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Fingers. You're right, Dickie, boy, but I saved your seat anyway. I uh, read your account of the trial in this morning's edition. Yes, and I read yours, and if you don't mind my saying so, you're making a big mistake calling on Cratchit's good points. The reading public don't want to know that. They prefer their murderers to be craven and brave without too many redeeming human qualities. But, but we don't even know that he did it. That's not the point. The point is, it's our job to report things as we see them. Always remember, we are the eyes for the public. And if the public wishes to see things in a certain way, it's our duty to do the best we can to show it to them. Sir Percy, is the defense ready to continue with this case? Uh, yes, my lord. The defense wishes to call Mrs. Bell Langley. Who do you suppose this is? Difficult to say, but it looks as if Sir Percy's got something up his sleeve. He's been known to try anything when he thinks he's about to lose a case. Judging by her appearance, so I guess she's been brought in to make an impression on the jury. Perhaps Sir Percy's open a little sex will distract the jurors from the truth. My lord, before I begin, I should like permission to treat this witness as a hostile witness. In other words, I should like to ask leading questions. A hostile witness? She doesn't seem hostile to me. She appears quite friendly. Mm, thank you, my lord. Oh, not at all, my dear. Sir Percy, your motion is denied. Proceed. Very well. Mrs. Langley, will you state your full name? Mrs. Bell Langley. Are you married? Divorced. Is it true that you were once a close acquaintance of Ebenezer Scrooge? That is true. In fact, you were engaged to be married. That was a long time ago. The marriage never took place? No, it, it did not. Why is that? It was because Ebenezer had grown indifferent towards me. Something else had come along to take his affections. Oh? Another woman? No, it was money. Ebenezer was more interested in making money than in loving me. Oh, he tried denying it, but I saw it was true. So, sadly, I, I released him from his vows. How old were you when this took place? I was 18, Ebenezer 36. Certainly those are understandable sentiments for an idealistic young woman. But isn't it true that two years later you married Malcolm Langley, himself a successful businessman, and that three years after that, when your husband's business failed and he became a pauper, you divorced him? Well, I divorced him, yes, but certainly not for the reason you suggest. Mrs. Langley, following your divorce, isn't it true that you approached Ebenezer Scrooge in a vain attempt to rekindle your relationship? That's not so. You you deny visiting Mr. Scrooge at his office? Yes. I mean, no. Of course I went there, but it was nothing more than a friendly visit. Mrs. Langley, is that the dress you were wearing when you went to see him? Objection, my lord. Not only is counsel badgering his own witness, but I fail to see what possible relevance this has to... Mrs. Langley, 
Do you know a man named Fred Applegate? What? Shall I repeat the question? Do you know Fred Applegate? Fred Applegate? Mr. Scrooge's nephew, do you know him? I, I, I don't believe so. Mrs. Langley, before you commit yourself to perjury, I should like to warn you that I can bring to this witness box a neighbor of yours who will testify that she saw Fred Applegate into your apartment every afternoon for the past six months. Now, I ask you again, do you or do you not know him? All right, yes. You were having an affair? Yes, we were, if it's any of your business. Mrs. Langley, isn't it true that Mr. Applegate promised to divorce his wife and marry you as soon as he could raise enough money? All right, what if he did? But you can't for a minute think that Freddie would do anything. I mean, he just wouldn't. Why, he's not that kind of person. No, I don't think he is. The Lord, with your permission... I would like to ask this witness to step down and call my next witness, Miss Lucy Duffy. State your name, please. Lucy Duffy. And uh, what is your occupation, Miss Duffy? Charwoman, sir. I do domestic work. Will you tell us the name of your former employer? Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. And how long had you worked for Mr. Scrooge? Uh, about 12 years, sir. Did your employment terminate at the death of Mr. Scrooge? No, sir. It terminated about two months before that. Did you quit? No, sir. I was fired. No, Miss Duffy. Will you please describe for us what your duties were under your employment with Mr. Scrooge? Well, sir, the usual things mostly. Uh, cleaning, making up his bed, uh, keeping a fire going in the grate, and setting out his cup of gruel to take at night before he retired. In all those 12 years, you must have seen Mr. Scrooge quite often. <laughs> no, sir, I didn't. You did not? Well, when was the last time you saw him? Oh, about 11 years ago it was. 11 years? You mean to say you never saw the man you worked for? Well, you see, sir, I had my own key. I always came in after he went to work. Sometimes he would write out his instructions in a note he'd leave behind. Once a week he would leave the money on the table in the hallway. Still, you must have seen him on the day he fired you. Now, sir, one day I comes to work as usual, and there was a note on the door saying me services were no longer required. The note said, leave the key under the mat. And so I did. Really, my lord? I'm sure we're all interested in Miss Duffy's employment record. However, I fail to see what possible bearing this has on... Begging the court's indulgence, my lord. One of the suppositions in this murder case has been that whoever murdered Mr. Scrooge must have been an acquaintance since there were no signs of a forced entry. However... There is another way the murderer may have gotten in. He may have had his own key. This is ridiculous. Lord, the testimony of this witness has just shown that she gave up her key. She returned it to Mr. Scrooge. He fired her. How do we know that? Anyone could have written that note. Why would an employer suddenly fire his charwoman after 12 years of loyal service? My lord, I believe that whoever fired Lucy Duffy was someone who was plotting to kill Ebenezer Scrooge. I believe that this person then took over the duties of the cleaning lady and continued performing them while she waited for an opportunity to carry out her plan. My lord, even assuming by some wild stretch of the imagination that what Sir Percy is saying is true... I submit that a woman could not have strangled Ebenezer Scrooge. He may have been old, but he was certainly not frail. A woman would not have had the strength. Hmm. Uh, 
Sir Percy, what did you say to that? Sir Percy? Oh, forgive me, my lord. I, I, I was thinking of something else. Uh, my lord, if I may beg the court's indulgence once more, I believe I can clear up much of this mystery. If I may be permitted to call to the stand a witness who has already testified. Uh, well, if, if there are no objections... My lord, the prosecution will stipulate to anything that will move these proceedings along a little faster. Uh, very well, Sir Percy. Call your witness. I should like to call Martha Cratchit to the stand. Now, Miss Cratchit, for the record, will you please tell the court where you were on the evening of December 24th last? The night Mr. Scrooge was murdered? That's right. Uh, oh, yes, I remember. I, I was at Mr. Higgins' millinery shop. I was working late that night. Hmm. Just one moment. If the court will allow, I would like to ask the gentleman seated in the back row on the aisle to please stand. Thank you, sir. Tell me, Martha, do you recognize that man? Uh, I, I don't think so. Oh, come now. You mean to say you don't recognize your own employer, Mr. Higgins? Oh. Oh, oh yes. I see I was mistaken. That is Mr. Higgins. Again, with the court's permission, I would like to ask the gentleman at the back to identify himself. My name is Everly. Jason Everly. Mr. Everly, do you own a millinery shop? No, sir, I do not. Like yourself, I'm a lawyer. Now, Martha, shall we try again? And will you tell us where you were on the evening of December 24th? Very well. You'd like to know? I'll tell you. I was at Mr. Scrooge's house. Why, stop! Judge your mother! Your father! I'm the one who did! The accused will be The Lord, your honor, double Mrs. Scrooge, she's not the one. Mr. Cratchit, you will either sit down and be silent, or I will have you forcibly removed from this courtroom. Martha, would you care to tell us about it? Where do I begin? How far back? Shall I tell you how much I despised him? Even as a little girl, he used to pat my head and leer at me with that look of his. I've always hated him. And not just because he kept my family in poverty. I told my parents I worked at a military shop. I, I did it because if they'd known the truth, it would have crushed them. Selling women's hats is not how I earn my living. You see, I am a prostitute. Oh, And who do you think was one of my very best customers? Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. But you see, he didn't know it was me. He had no idea that the woman he was paying to sleep with was the same one he used to pat on the head. The same one whose father slaved for him every day of his life for such a miserly pittance. Oh yes, Mr. Mason, you had it figured exactly right. It was I who wrote the note telling Miss Duffy her employment was ended and instructing her to slip the key under the mat. It was I who, who took her place and continued cleaning his precious house while all the while I was carefully plotting when and how to do it. Finally, my plan was ready and I'd only to choose which night to do it. Then... Christmas Eve, my, my poor father comes home from work and repeats the words Scrooge said about how every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. And I resolved then to do it that very night and turn his own words into prophecy. Never dream. 
screaming that in doing so, I would make it appear my own father was the killer. I went to his house around 8.30. I let myself in with my own key. I climbed the stairs to his bedroom. I prepared the cup of gruel he always drank before bed. Only this time, I added a dram of sleeping potion. And then, I hid in the closet and waited. Around nine o'clock, I heard him come in. He came upstairs almost immediately and got ready for bed. I heard him drink his gruel. And then I listened as he settled down for sleep. I waited very patiently until I heard the heavy snores of his drunk slumber. I came out of the closet. I walked over to the bed and pulled back the curtain. Using a knife, I cut off a section of the bell pull that hung beside his bed. Slowly, I passed it under his neck. He didn't so much as stir. I wanted to wake him so he'd know who it was who was about to end his life. But the effect of the drug was too strong. Then, slowly, I began to tighten on the rope. There was hardly any struggle. The stupor was too deep. Finally, just before he died, he opened his eyes. He seemed to recognize who I was, but there was confusion. Why was I there? He hadn't sent for me. Then, very slowly, he died. Afterwards, I used the wooden stick I brought with me to finish the job. I went downstairs. As I opened the front door to leave, to my own horror, I saw my father coming down the street. I'd only time to rush back upstairs and hide in the closet. He, he came in and discovered Scrooge's body, just as he said. When he left, I waited until I thought it was safe, and then I tried slipping out once more, only this time, Constable Perkins showed up. I hid in the closet until all the police had come and gone. And then, when it was very late, I crept down the stairs and let myself out. When I learned later that Father had been arrested and charged with the crime, I wanted to turn myself in. But I thought, perhaps... When the jury hears what a horrible person Scrooge was, they'll say it wasn't his fault. Perhaps they'll say he had it coming. <laughs> How do you do? My name is Raleigh Fingers. I write for the Herald. Yes, I know who you are. Oh, oh, you do. And this is Master Charles Dickens. He's also a reporter for The Sun. Mr. Dickens, I've followed your article in the paper. Very nicely written. Oh, oh, really? Uh, I'm honored, sir. Uh, sir Percy, I, I should like to know, if you don't mind my asking... How you managed to figure it out that it was Martha Cratchit who committed the murder? Mostly it was an educated guess. Once I had established in my own mind that a woman had substituted herself in place of the charwoman, I was naturally quick to suspect Mrs. Bell Langley. Then, as I was trying to figure out how a woman acting on her own would have had the strength to overpower Scrooge, I immediately considered the possibility that he had been drugged. Just as this thought was crossing my mind, I happened to look over and observe Martha Cratchit administering another dose of Godfrey's cordial to little tiny Tim. 
Suddenly, I realized who it was that I had been overlooking all along. Sir Percy, what do you suppose will happen to her now? What's this? A crime reporter with a conscience, how rare. Well, of course, she will be found guilty, but the sentence itself could be light, especially if you gentlemen of the press get busy and write some sympathetic articles that will make it easier for Judge Hawkins to be lenient. By the way, Mr. Dickens, if you don't mind my saying so, you have an obvious flair for writing. But I'm not sure you are cut out to be a reporter. Have you considered trying your hand at some other kind of writing? Fiction, perhaps? Why not give it a try and see how you come out? You never know. Listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of the case. Theater's presentation of the case of the murdered miser. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Oney, engineered by John Todd. Original music composed by Mark Birmingham. Assisting in the production were Carol McManus and Scott Dickey. The actors in tonight's play: Bob Nolan was Sir Percy Mason and the Cabby. Jeff Kamish played Hamilton Burgermeister, Bob Cratchit, and Bonnie Sullivan. Carol McManus was Martha Cratchit and Scrooge. Bob Gianferranti was Judge Hawkins and Raleigh Fingers. Neil McGarry was Constable Perkins, Frederick Applegate, and Paul Mandrake. Bernard Willis was Giles Pithy. Floyd Pratt, Davey O'Shanty. Eva Broderson, Lucy Duffy. Debbie Oney, Belle Langley. Daniel McLean, Charles Dickens. And Scott Dickey played the clerk and Jason Everly. This program was recorded at HT Recording Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This program is made possible with the cooperation of the Public Media Foundation. This is Fred Morey wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. It's a foggy night on old Cape Cod. A perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents a Captain Underhill mystery entitled The Case of the Shooting Star. Shooting stars. Normally, we associate them with a the night. But, of course, they're coming in all the time. We only see them at night. Most are the size of pebbles or grains of sand that streak across our atmosphere as they burn up. But once, about every two days or so, on average, one is massive enough to make it all the way down. Most land in the ocean. The bigger ones, called bolides, can create quite a show. At night, they appear as flaming fireballs. In the day, they leave a trail of smoke. Super cold, when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they quickly heat up, creating so much stress they can explode like a shrapnel bomb. In 1868, one exploded over Paul Tusk, Poland, spewing out 10,000 fragments. Another time, in 1912, in the skies over Holbrook, Arizona, there was a sudden huge cacophony of bangs and flashes, and fragments, like bullets, rained down for miles around. On a separate occasion about 15,000 years earlier, another meteor landed in Arizona and blew out a crater 500 feet deep and a mile across. Two of them, landing inside the same state, might make one think that Arizona is not such a safe place to live. But if you play the odds and believe in the law of averages, it's probably even safer. Of course, all of us do play the odds every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. After all, it was a meteor the size of the rock of Gibraltar that most likely made the dinosaurs disappear. And who knows? Another one, the same size, arriving tomorrow, 
might make us disappear too. As for Gerald Marshall, living on Cape Cod, he might have wished he had paid more attention to the odds. He might have wished he had moved to Arizona. But Gerald Marshall is done playing the odds. He's done wishing. And he's not moving anywhere. Gerald Marshall is dead. My name is Alexander Schofield, M.D. In preparing this account and thinking of the role my friend Captain Waverly Underhill played in it, I was musing about how people's names sometimes get associated with celestial objects. Usually it's for discovering them, but not always. For example, think of Neil Armstrong and you think of the moon, Mark Twain and Halley's Comet. Actually, Halley and Halley's Comet, I suppose. Well, now Underhill has something to hang his name on, something originating from outer space. Not a moon or a comet in this case, but a meteor. Captain Underhill's meteor. It's on its way to a museum, too. I insisted upon that. Although it's not the kind of museum I had in mind, something dignified like a natural history museum. Instead, it's going to one of those seedy tourist trap museums in Niagara Falls that caters to tabloid tastes, featuring objects of the curious, the grotesque, and the bizarre. This establishment is located next to Ripley's Believe It or Not, just up the street from Louis Tussaud's Wax Museum. And it's not just the meteorite that's going, but the whole end of the house, rebuilt. The floorboards, the roof, the walls, the ceiling, the bureau, the bed, the bed sheets, blood-stained. I think the way the whole thing is being handled is distasteful. But Underhill doesn't seem to mind. He likes the idea. I told him if that's the way he feels about it, he belongs in a waxworks, along with his meteorite. Still, there's no denying the brilliance with which he pursued the case. Jack London once said, I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy permanent planet. Underhill was both, combining both the brilliant flashes of a meteoric mind and the steady, dogged persistence of a permanent planet. So, naturally... It has to be Captain Underhill's meteor. After all, he was the one who discovered it, even though all of us attending the lawn party that night all saw it at exactly the same time. We all saw it, but it was only Captain Underhill who saw something different. I'm enjoying the stars. I get tired of all that talking. I'd rather listen to the marsh. Do you see that tall grass, the Phragmites? It's full of red wings. I watch them fly into roost. Where's that plane I'm hearing? Come up and join the group. Oh, I don't know, Alex. Sometimes being around youth is rejuvenating. <sighs> Other times it just makes me feel old. Well, you're not old, and you don't need to be down here brooding about it. Come up and have fun. If I wanted fun, I'd go swimming. Oh, no. Well, they are the only ones who seem to be enjoying themselves. Oh, be ridiculous, and don't you even think about it. Not in this chill night air. You're not that young. Hmm, thanks. You know, having one's personal position at parties is worse than a chaperone. Why don't you go home so I can cut loose? Don't use me as an excuse. Besides, you didn't bring your bathing suit. Go away. If you stay down here much longer, people will think you're sulking. Solitude is not sulking. If it makes you feel happier, I'll keep a smile plastered on my face. Go away, Alex. No, oh, fine. But if I encounter any other curmudgeons, I'm sending them down. As long as they're female. Not more than half your... Your age. Never mind. <sighs> Stars are lovely. Oh, 
Yes. That's the biggest one I've ever seen. Don't you want to go look for it? This is exciting. I think it broke up. Well, there may be fragments. I doubt you'll find it. Hmm. Maybe there is a fire. Well, come. Let's go see. No, you go chasing after sirens if you want to. I'm going home. Well, you're acting pretty blasé about this. No, no. I just don't want to be out too long in this chill night air. I'll read about it. Or you come tell me. Well, everybody's going. Hurry. Right. Come see me tomorrow. Tell me what you find. Well, I'll bring you back a piece. Probably you won't. But good luck looking. Well, it's a waste of time. They're not going to find anything. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. That's what a marsh is, after all. It's a haystack. <laughs> Uh, maybe the Martians have landed, and they're all fools for rushing over there. Serves Schofield right if he becomes a specimen. Or is burnt to a crisp by a death ray. Too much boundless enthusiasm. Always has that. It's bad for him. Oh, well, what's that saying? Fools rush in. Oh, but Underhill goes to bed. I'll read about it to... Wait. Wait, what's that down there? Looks like something on the bottom. I can't tell. Well, only one way to find out. I don't think anyone will mind. <laughs> Hope nobody comes back too soon, but... Well, if, if they do, they do. No shirt. Trousers. Here we go. Huh, huh. Oh, my. That, that's Nicky. Huh, huh, huh. That's cold. I'll get, I'll get used to it. Next time. Next time I'm going in all at once. All right. I can, I can see it. Let's see. One. Two. Huh. Sounds like a cold to me. That night air got to you, didn't it? 
Stick business a little slow these days. Making door-to-door house calls. You asked me to drop by, remember? You didn't find anything, I know. I read the paper. No fire either. Ah, but do you know the latest? Someone was struck and killed by a fragment. How did you know that? I used to be a policeman, remember? Oh, since when have you stopped? Well, now this information I happen to have is that... The body was found lying in his bed at home. That the meteorite, the size of a pea or smaller, penetrated the roof, the ceiling, the body, passing through a major organ. Or was it the head? Continuing through the mattress, the floorboards, or... How deep was it? You found all that out? No. I assumed it. Am I right? Yes, it was embedded in the floorboards. How did you know? A man or a woman? A man. But how did you know the body was in bed? I guess. It was nighttime, after 11. Where are most people at that hour? Besides, when we're lying down, we're exposing much more of our surface area to objects dropping in from outer space. Well, yes, but still, how did you know it was the size of a pea? Come on, let's walk down to the library. What for? Uh, I I want to look up about meteors. Oh, no! Bless you. You ought to be in bed. Uh, no, no, Alex, it's mild. Uh, I warned you about that night air. It wasn't that. It was the swimming. What? Swimming? When? Last night, after you all left. But you didn't have a suit. I said, after you all left. But why in the world? For this. What? What is it? What you were all looking for. I noticed it's on the bottom of the pool. Without the underwater lights, I never would have noticed it. Are you sure? Reasonably. In the pool? My God! It's a miracle no one else was struck. Maybe. Maybe not. Let's go. I see I found two more books that may help us. Are you learning anything? It says here that each square mile of Earth... Shh, be quiet. Oh, be quiet yourself. My ears are plugged. I have to speak up. This isn't a funeral parlor, you know. It says each square mile of Earth receives one hit about once every thousand years. There's no preference for geographical locations, although most meteorites have been found in temperate zones. Uh, Why? More people to find them, I suppose. It says the chances of someone being struck in the next 100 years are 3 out of 10, but the chances are increasing. Why is that? Same reason. More people. Like shooting fish in a barrel. Oh, no, that's not a very good way to think of it. Here's something here in this book. It says the speed of a meteor is hundreds of times the speed of a bullet. And here's a quote. The white heat produced by their velocity can be so explosive, despite their small caliber, that to be hit by one may feel more like a thunderbolt than a bullet. Not always true. It depends on which direction they're moving as they enter the Earth's atmosphere. If they come at us dead on, like a moth flying into a car's headlight, they move faster, burn hotter and bluer. But if they come in from the side or behind us, matching our own orbital velocity, they can fall in quite slowly. Hmm. Here's an account of one that landed on a frozen lake near Hasli, Sweden. It just dropped in and bounced off the lake without breaking the ice or even melting it. Read me what it says in that book on accidents. What do I look for? Oh, I don't know. Try meteors. Uh 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 Uh-huh. Uh-huh. False alarm. Look here. It it says finding a meteorite is quite rare. There are an estimated 1,400 samples in museums around the world. I shoot! Waverly, keep it down. What do you want me to do? Hold it in? You're a physician. You know how dangerous that is. Oh, it is not dangerous. My head could explode. Don't be ridiculous. There now. You see, they are rare. That's why you've got to turn your piece in. It belongs in a museum. The mine's only little. South Africa has one weighing 60 tons. In Mexico, a two-tonner was found wrapped in mummy cloth in a Montezuma grave. The famous black stone of Caba at Mecca is almost certainly an enormous meteorite. What did you find? Well, mostly just statistics on accidents caused by natural disasters. Read me some. Well, they are grouped by year. Well, pick a year and let's hear it. All right. 1988. 
deaths by lightning, 82. Deaths by cataclysmic storms and floods. That would be hurricanes and tornadoes. And high winds, too. Total, 59. Cataclysmic earth surface movements. Earthquakes, volcanoes. Right. Total, 7. What else? Well, here's a category. Struck accidentally by falling objects. 835 fatalities. Hmm, that's quite a few. Hmm, falling stones, falling rocks, falling boulders, falling trees, snow slides, objects falling from buildings, objects falling from stationary machinery. Nope, no meteors, though. I'm not surprised. My book is older, but it says there is no recorded instance of anyone ever being killed by a meteor. Of course, I'm sure there have been some unrecorded instances... People were living here a long time before records. Maybe the one in the Montezuma grave killed the guy it landed on. Well, some people have been wounded, I think. That's right. Here's the most famous case. Mrs. Ann Hodges of Silacaga, Alabama, was taking a nap in December of 1954 when a brilliant fireball trailing smoke exploded overhead. Mrs. Hodges, being asleep, didn't hear it. But she was awakened soon after by her mother, who thought the house was falling down. They found a hole in the ceiling, a nine-pound black stone on the floor, and a big bruise on Mrs. Hodge's hand and hip. According to this, it also says that since 1847, only 11 meteorites have been known to strike buildings. The last was in 1971, when one crashed through the roof of the home of Mr. and Mrs. Casarino, outside Hartford. When that one hit, they were asleep, too. Next morning, Mr. Casarino discovered plaster dust on his living room floor. Looking up, he saw the meteorite embedded in the insulation of the ceiling. The sample was sent to the Smithsonian. Ah, exactly. And that's where yours belongs, too. At least at the Cape Cod Museum of Natural History. You want me to turn it in to the lost and found? Do you think anyone's going to claim it? Of course not. But it's, it's not a keepsake. It has scientific value. I doubt it. Well, now, how do you know? You're not a scientist. You just told me these objects are rare, plus the fact this is the first recorded instance of anyone being killed by one. Ah, uh, sure. Waverly, you should get home and get into bed. Why? You ought to want me out and about infecting everybody. Drum up more business for you. I don't think of it that way. That's the same as you going out and committing crimes to have more things to investigate. Hmm, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Or a fireman starting fires. Or an arms maker starting wars. What do you mean? I mean when you're investigating certain types of crimes, that's exactly what you look for. Someone who's knowledgeable and who stands to gain. Such as a doctor causing illness. A cop creating crime. A fireman starting fires. Or an insurance man causing an accident. Wait! What are you saying? I'm saying this may not be the first time anyone's ever been killed by a meteor, but I'm fairly certain it's the first time anyone's ever been murdered by one. What? What are you saying? Wait a minute. Waverly, what do you mean? Where do you think you're going? Come on, Frank. I want to get home. Mm, what's your hurry? It's late. Come on. It's practically lunchtime. Oh, Frank. Come on. I mean it. Frank, wait a minute. Someone's here. Who is it? I don't know. I don't recognize the car. Is, is somebody alone? A reporter, probably. Find out. Wherever it is, get rid of him. Tell him it's old news already. Who is it? Mrs. Marshall, my name is Waverly Underhill. New reporters! I'm not a reporter. I'm here from your insurance company. Oh, uh, just a minute. I'm not dressed. Frank, the insurance man is here. I heard. What's he doing here? We haven't even filed the claim. I don't know. I don't know. 
Do you recognize him? No. And he's probably an investigator sent out by the company. Frank, I'm not ready for yes, this. Yes, you are. It's just a little off the plan, I know. But you still know what to do. He should have called first. He should have made an appointment. If he didn't call, it's because he didn't want to. He's an investigator. Oh, God. Come on, come on, get dressed. If you don't see him now, he'll get suspicious. Oh, God. Calm down. Now, you listen to me. If he's an insurance investigator, he's going to be trying to trap you. Oh, Lord. Don't let him catch you in a lie. He may have been watching the house. No. So don't say I'm here. But don't say I'm not here either. You get me? Oh, God. Get a grip on yourself. Now, look. He's going to try and trap you, even if he doesn't suspect anything. That's just the way these guys do their jobs. I know. All you have oh, to do Frank, is just try to... If you knew somebody was going to be watching the house, then what are you doing here? All right. That was a little careless. I admit it. I got cocky. There's nothing we can do about it now. You ready? Where will you be? Not here. Come on. Talk to him in the kitchen. I'll be in the study. In here in the closet. Frank, I'm scared. Yes, it's the plan. Act like you don't know anything. Don't ask too many questions. Let him do the talking. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. 
It's a lovely day. You can come in now if you like. Thank you. I don't usually sleep this late. Kept you waiting. It's a lovely day. You can come in now if you like. Thank you. I don't usually sleep this late. I haven't been sleeping well. Understandable. My condolences. Thank you. Well, my husband Jerry used to handle all our insurance matters. If this is about our homeowners, I'm sure the house. Homeowners? Oh my goodness, no. You mean you don't know? Know what? About the life insurance. What life insurance? You know, I was wondering if this might be the case. So this was something your husband handled privately. Well, that's not so unusual. Of course, if the person taking out the policy doesn't know, that's a different matter. In fact, that's illegal. But for the beneficiary not to know, well, that does occasionally happen. What are you talking about? Would you mind bringing me the policy? I'll explain. I don't know about any policy. Exactly, which means it will be some place your husband knew he would be sure to find it. Shall I help you look? No, I'd rather myself. Fine. While you're looking, I'll just take a glance here in the back bedroom. That's where it happened, isn't it? Yes, but. Is there a problem? No, I mean you can look. Well, I'll have to sooner or later. It's not cleaned up. <laughs> that makes no difference to me. My own wife's passed away. I've gone back to being a bachelor. You hunt for the policy. I'll be in here. Frank, he's in here. I heard. So what? He's not going to find anything. But he wants me to find the policy. He'll find it. What do you mean? Open the file drawer. Start looking. But I. In a few minutes, we'll take it to him. He can't tear it up, so that's no danger. I think I know what he's up to. He knows the insurance company is stuck. They're going to have to pay. You can expect him to offer a deal, some kind of quick cash settlement. For a few reasons, probably he'll say it'll end up in court and drag on or something. Oh, he's nice now, but watch out. Pretty soon he'll start to bully you. Oh, now, wait, don't you pick up yourself. Get rid of him. Yeah, now listen. Here's one more thing. If he offers you a deal the first time, it's not a deal. It's a test. He's not offering. He's fishing. Fishing to see if you're guilty. Uh, these guys know that only guilty people make deals. Only guilty people want to stay at the court. Don't go for it. Don't even act interested. Gotta watch out for these tricks. These guys have a whole bag. Oh, God, Frank. Hey, hey, you're doing fine. You're doing it. Just relax. All you have to do is act honest. And remember, he's not. So what? Okay, get going. Mr. Underwood? Mr. Underwood? Would this be it? Let's see. Let's see. Why, yes, that's it. I knew you'd find it. <laughs> it was right under insurance. Not surprising. By the way, it's under Hill. Underhill, the underwriter. That's what I was before I retired. Now I only work when they need me. Better than Underhill, the undertaker, I suppose. Yes, I suppose so. You know, I used to know an undertaker. Grim fellow. Used to say all our lives follow the same progression. From undertakings to undertaken to undertaker. Still, I suppose the mortuary business and the insurance business are not too dissimilar. We both have to deal delicately with the unpleasantness of sudden death. Yes. Has that bed been moved? What? Yes. When they were searching for the fragment. Do you mind if I roll back the mattress? No. Mm. Ah. You know, you know, I was I was thinking this whole room almost belongs in a museum. It's so amazing. Your husband was sleeping at the time. Yes. Were you sleeping too? No, I was in the kitchen. I heard the blast. I felt it shake the house. I ran outside. You didn't know then that your husband had been struck? No. Didn't it surprise you that he didn't wake up to all that commotion? Not really. My husband was a heavy sleeper. Must have been. Also a heavy drinker. Oh. And you didn't realize what had happened until the next morning? You didn't suspect anything when you went to bed? 
I was sleeping in a different room. Is this something you need to know? Oh, no. No, of course not. I apologize. I'll keep my morbid curiosity to myself. Although with an accident this bizarre, I'm sure you can... Under- I'm going back to the kitchen. I-, I don't like being in here. I'm coming, too. Now... Now, Mrs. Marshall, so I don't take up too much of your time, let me try to explain what you've got here. This is a twin policy, a combination life insurance and AD&D. What's that? Accidental death and dismemberment. Oh. A normal death pays face value of the policy, and accidental death is double indemnity. It's twice the value. You mean... Now, 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 just wait, wait. Just let me look this over and get it straight. I don't want to give you wrong information. Hmm. Yes. You know, back in the old days of patent medicines, when the fear of being struck by a meteor was actually something people worried about, there were policies that listed death by meteors specifically. They were gimmicks, mostly, so the salesman could wave the policy under the client's nose and say, this could be worth a million dollars. Same sort of come on they use in Atlantic City. Naturally, since it's just another form of gambling. <laughs> and I'm, I'm still looking here, still looking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Back in those days, there were also phony devices sold that were supposed to protect you. Special clothing, hats, umbrellas. There was a thing called Dr. Whipple's Meteor Bumper. Oh. A thin metal sheeting, guaranteed to shatter 99 out of 100 small meteors. You don't say. <laughs> really. Designed for spaceships. But it could work on clothing, I suppose. Or bed sheets. You know, after this, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see this kind of insurance make a comeback. Sometimes it takes a freak accident like this to create the fear to generate the demand before you can sell the insurance. Maybe travelers should come up with an umbrella that bounces meteors. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Ah, here we are. Triple indemnity. Accidental death by... Hmm. Public conveyance. Trains, buses, planes. Death by falling debris. Yes, planes, satellites, and... Yes, here. Here, it even mentions it. Meteors. This policy was written for $500,000. Triple indemnity makes it worth $1,500,000. What? Congratulations, Mrs. Marshall. You're a wealthy woman. Oh, my. My... Are you all right? Yes, I think so. This is quite a shock. No doubt. I'm sure you wouldn't like to think of it in these terms, but you have really hit the jackpot. Tell me, was your husband afraid of being struck by a meteor? What? No, I don't think so. It's just a little odd that he would carry two policies like this. He must have had some concerns about dying in an accident. Oh, you know what it was, Mr. Underwood? Uh, Underhill, I'm sorry. You're getting it. Think of Underhill and Over the Hill. Same thing. What was that? Hurricanes. He was terribly afraid of hurricanes. Living on Cape Cod every hurricane season, he would get very nervous. Ah, well, that makes perfect sense. Certainly that's the reason why many people purchase policies. For peace of mind... I guess knowing you would be well taken care of must have really eased his worries. I guess so. If he only knew how well he succeeded, think how pleased he would be. Mr. Underhill, I'm feeling very tired. Yes, of course. I'd like to deal with this later. Well, certainly. You have an entire year in which to file this claim, so there's no hurry. You just take your time. Thank you. You just file whenever you're ready and we'll cheerfully pay in full. Thank you. I meant that suggestion, too. About the museum, I mean. You can certainly afford to build on a new edition. You know, it's, it's just impossible to get over what a fantastic coincidence this was. I know. When you consider the chances of something like this happening, the odds are simply astronomical. Oh, dear. That's a pun, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, what are the odds of someone, anyone, being hit? Scientists say three chances in ten over the next hundred years. Then you have to multiply by the odds of that one person turning out to be your husband. That would be one out of the entire population of the planet. Say, 
Oh, say one in five billion. <laughs> I'm not too interested in numbers. Ah, but you should be. Because, again, you have to consider the odds of that one person just happening to carry this type of insurance. Or any insurance at all, for that matter. After all, most people don't have any. Again, multiply by several billion. And if that's not enough, then you have to factor in the odds that if an object smaller than a pea passes through the human body, how many places can it hit and not be fatal? This one just happened to strike through the heart. Taken all together, why the whole thing becomes so wildly improbable, you can actually say, it never happened. What do you mean? What I said. You can actually say, it never happened. But of course it did happen. You mean your husband was killed? Yes, killed by something. But what was it? Not a meteor. Wait a minute. What's going on here? You're saying you're not going to pay? Afraid not. You have to. No. We'll sue. Who's we? I mean, I'll sue. I doubt it. You... You little shyster, what are you trying to pull? More like, what are you trying to pull, Mrs. Marshall? Do you want to hear my theory? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to talk about this. Then don't talk. Just listen. The night this all happened, I was not far from here. I was just over there on the other side of the marsh. You can see the house if you look outside. I was attending an outdoor lawn and pool party. I was standing off by myself, just listening to the night sounds, when I became aware of the sound of an approaching airplane. I could hear it, but I couldn't see any wing lights, or navigation lights. In fact, no lights at all. And then I was distracted. How early there you are. Why aren't you up in At the same time, you were outside, too, over here, watching the skies and watching your watch. Your husband was already sleeping. Or is that a misnomer? He was drunk. Or drugged. Or both. Whatever. He was already in position, let's say. Back at the party, I was still being distracted, although perhaps I was just slightly aware that the sound of the high overhead airplane engine had cut out. Some time passed. Then, of course, came the biggest distraction. Pandemonium for a while, and then, and then everybody went piling off to search for where it landed. I was leaving myself when I walked by the pool and noticed a piece of black rock lying on the bottom. I went swimming for it. And then, from very far off, I noticed the sound of that airplane. I asked myself, what was a plane doing practicing stalls in the nighttime without lights? Maybe the plane was there on purpose. Maybe its purpose was to launch the pretend meteor. Something military, was it? A sidewinder rocket? Or something just left over from the 4th of July? Whatever it was, it made a dandy imitation as it streaked across the sky. Its nose cone was full of meteorites, real ones, from outer space. But that's not where you got them. You stole them from a museum. That was your irrefutable evidence. But really, it was just a new wrinkle on the old trick of peppering a gold mine. Of course, you didn't put all the meteorites in the nose. You kept back one piece, smaller than a pea. That was the one that was going to kill your husband. Metaphorically. And where were you through all of this? As I say, you were in the backyard handling that other problem. How to murder your husband and make it look like a meteor had done it. A rifle wouldn't do. You needed something that would tear through the human body quickly, leaving behind the kind of searing wound like a red-hot meteor. What else, of course? but a laser. A desktop industrial strength welding laser of the pulsating variety, capable of delivering one massive jolt. Did you have it mounted on the roof? Had you already burned a hole through the shingles and the ceiling so you could line up the body? I wonder. 
Did your husband Jerry look up and notice that hole as he was lying there? In his condition, probably not. But even if he did, he wouldn't have realized it was the equivalent of staring down the muzzle of a gun. Lying down, he didn't know it. But in effect, he was standing up before a firing squad. You waited. And then, at the appointed moment... You threw the switch. <laughs> then it was done. Nothing to do but check his pulse. Drop the meteor pebble at the bottom of the burned hole. Remove the laser machine from the roof. And then what? Go to bed? Or did you stay up to celebrate? Crazy. What? That's crazy. Crazy? No. Outlandish, maybe. But not as outlandish as what supposedly happened. I guess when you set out to perpetrate a hoax, sometimes bigger is better. Oh, don't look so worried, Mrs. Marshall. I'm not with the police. I'm only an insurance investigator. So long as you never file a claim, I'm not really interested in what you and your accomplice, your boyfriend, I assume, are going to do. Of course, if I really wanted to investigate this, I I might check with the airports to see which planes were in the air that night and, and check on their pilots. I might look to see who had recently purchased or rented a laser machine. I might find out which museum is missing some of its meteorites. But I don't want to go to all of that trouble. I just want you to bury that policy. And tell me, how right was I? You're... You're not going to tell? Hmm. Thank you. You answered my question. I'll be going. Wait a minute. Wait. Aren't you going to offer me a deal? A deal, my dear? I'm too old for deals. Deals are for younger swimmers in the game. How did you know? I thought I'd explained. Although I must say, I've never seen anyone say they were tired after just being informed they are a million and a half dollars richer. But if we don't file, you won't tell? No, I'm, uh... I'm going to explain something else to you. I'm not really an insurance investigator. You're not? No. I'm not a police officer either, although I used to be one. I'm just an ordinary citizen who read about this in the papers, put two billion and two billion together and figured out what you were up to. And if I can figure it out, so can others. And now I'll give you a little advice. Don't try to run. If you do, you'll be caught. When you are, you'll be sentenced to death. You can ask the judge. Maybe he'll let you substitute a laser beam for the electric chair. Or you can take this policy and go down to the police and turn yourself in. The courts look favorably on that. You can paint yourself in a minor role. Say you were duped, coerced. Your husband beat you. Blame it on your boyfriend. It was his idea. He was the mastermind. Well, that sort of... What? Nothing. Well, anyway, it's, it's your best option. That way you won't die. You'll only go to prison for the rest of your life. At least there is this consolation. Those extra thick prison walls will provide plenty of protection against incoming meteors. Nobody goes to prison. Ah, don't go stay right there. Your boyfriend? You forgot to introduce me. That's right. You think you're pretty smart because you figured it out. Well, you're pretty dumb, too. Mm. No argument there. <laughs> you would have been safer not reading the papers. Frank, what are you going to do? Our guest is so fond of firing squads, I think we'll arrange one. Down basement. Let's go. Frank, shut up. Follow me. Bring on that pair of handcuffs. Move slowly. Don't try anything. Stand over there. You mean over here? Don't move. I got it, Thomas. Here they are. They're for him. No, you idiot. Don't hand them to him. Slide them across the floor. But give me the key first. All right, mister. Pick them up. I'm sure you know how they work. Yes, I do. That's good. Now pass the other end over the pipe before you fasten the other one. Quit stalling. Do it. 
That's good. Their arms may get a little tired, but don't worry. They won't be tired for long. Frank, let's just run and get him here. No way. Even if you kill me, they'll find out. Maybe. But maybe they won't. I'm willing to bet you haven't told anyone. You're just that cocky. Interested in lasers, hmm? You're in luck. So happens we have it right here, all wrapped up. But I'll unwrap it for you. You know, the nice thing about a laser is it's so neat. Bullets are so messy, so much bleeding. The laser has the added advantage of cauterizing the wounds it creates. So little blood. How you feeling there, Mr. Detective? Frank, you shut up and plug us in. This will just take a minute to build up the charge. You got a minute, don't you? Frank, I told you to shut up. Go upstairs if you're squeamish. You don't have to be down here. Get out. But... Go on. Go on. Go all the way. Get out. This is almost ready. Then you can have your demonstration. What? No deals now, Mr. Underhill? No. No deals. I should think you might be wanting to make a deal right about now. You have no scruples, my friend. Any deal with you would be worthless, so why try? You know what? <laughs> You're right. You know what else? This first one's not going to kill you. Hmm. Sadistic on top of unscrupulous. It's a bad combination. You should be in therapy. You know I have a close friend. Stop. I like, oh! <sighs> Bravo, my dear. Excellent. You did it. I knew you could. I did it. I did it. I did it. I thought you never would. Uh, Quickly now, pick up the gun. Oh, what? Marsha, the gun. Pick it up. Um, I'm trying. Very good. Now get the handcuff key out of his pocket. I can't. Yes, you can. Just reach in. Oh, oh my God, he's waking up. The key, Marsha, get the key. No, no, I can't. He's uh, waking up. You'd better hit him again. Wait, no. Oh, I meant with the board. All right, all right. Now, the key. You can do it, don't worry. Oh, no. He's not going to move anymore. Wait, wait, what are you doing, Marsha? Don't do that. I deserve to die. No, you don't. I killed him. I killed my husband, too. You killed your husband, but they're not going to mind that you killed Frank. Oh. It'll count in your favor, oh. believe me. Oh. And they're going to know you saved my life, because I'll tell them. Marsha, oh. Marsha, don't waste your life. Not now, especially now that things are looking up. Oh. Schofield, Schofield, we're down here. It's my friend. He's a doctor. He'll help you. Oh, God. I heard a shot. Wait for me, what happened? Oh, my God. Never mind. Never mind. He's dead. Marsha, this is Dr. Schofield. Alex, would you mind letting her hand you that gun? Good. Ah. Now, Alex, there's a key in that dead man's pocket. I don't think Marsha is up to fishing it out. But first... Would you mind unplugging that thing? What is it? I was scheduled for some non-elective laser surgery, but I think I'll get a second opinion. Unless, of course, you think otherwise. You're the doctor. It's good to see you, my friend. Oh, I went to your house. I had a hunch you might have come here. I, I, I saw your car, but I was hesitating about coming in, not knowing what you were up to. Then I heard the shot, so I rushed in. Of course, as usual. But this time... Perfect timing. <laughs> and so ended one of Captain Underhill's most spectacular cases. It was a long time before the local newspapers could stop writing about it. The supermarket tabloids all featured it on their front pages, and for once they didn't have to lie too much. It was difficult to tell if Captain Underhill's brush with death had dealt him a setback. 
his tendency toward solitude and moodiness was at least no worse than before. I remember one particular impression I was struck with when I first came running down those stairs. Somehow, even with his hands handcuffed above his head and a laser pointed at his heart, he still looked like he was in charge of the situation. But as for me, it definitely had its effect. Now I shiver when I think of the cruelty and callousness some people are capable of. I can't see a firework or hear a plane overhead without thinking about it. And now, whenever I see a shooting star, instead of making a wish, I say a prayer. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Case of the Shooting Star. The actors in tonight's play, Dave Ellsworth played Captain Waverly Underhill. Wally O'Hara was Dr. Scobie. Kevin Grotty was Frank. And Anne-Marie Lang played Marcia Marshall. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Audio engineering by John Todd. Original music by Mark Birmingham. Special thanks to the Center for Short-Lived Phenomenon and credit due to Guy Murchie's fine book, Music of the Spheres. This program was recorded at HT Recording Studio, Cape Cod, and Rosemead, Los Angeles. Copyrighted by Stephen Thomas Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. This is Lou Dumont wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. It's a foggy night on old Cape Cod. A perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents an alarming tale of treachery, buried treasure, and intrigue in a Captain Underhill mystery entitled The Golden Idol, The Magwitch, and The Donkey's Tale. Captain Waverly Underhill the retired Cape Cod police captain, is about to have an opportunity to test one of his pet theories, that weddings are dangerous events. People fail to look beneath the surface, Schofield, beneath the white lace and crossing. I've never seen a wedding yet that wasn't laden with the potential for violence. He's right, too. And the bigger, the richer, the more dangerous. Which, if that's true then the wedding coming up should be about the most explosive of the century, at least on Cape Cod, where there hasn't been an official royal wedding since the last Kennedy got hitched. It's the Kemp's this time, the second most famous family on Cape Cod, who are about to withstand a wedding. The beautiful granddaughter, Carmeline Kemp, is engaged to marry a dashing young Frenchman, and Lady Kemp... The Grand Lady Kemp is not exactly giving away the bride. Enter Captain Underhill, who is about to be invited, not invited, more like summoned to the occasion. And it's certainly not for the purpose of being best man, more like just the opposite. After all, what would you call it when you were hired to come in and break up a marriage before it occurs? I'm the worst man? Waverly? Waverly, you're not still reading that newspaper. I've never seen anyone slower finishing a Sunday paper than you. Not slow, just thorough. What are you reading now? Oh, honestly, wedding announcements. Yes, I've taken up reading them to balance out the obituaries. 
It's getting too depressing. No, honestly. And apt to be just as informative as any crime story on the front page. Sorted, too, in a similar way. Are you equating crimes with weddings? Oh, why not? Look at these pages. You see a hundred smiling faces. I see a hundred reasons for doom and heartbreak. No, come now. Your marriage was a good one. I don't mean marriage. I mean the wedding itself. The nuptials. I've never seen one yet that wasn't an open invitation for violence. Two strange families coming together for the first time. All the stress and nervousness. It's an atmosphere for irrationality and rash acts. Well, then, you'd better turn the page. Oh? Why is that? You'll see. Oh. Oh, I do see. A camp getting married. Carmeline, is it? Which one is she, a niece? No, a uh, granddaughter. The matriarch, Lady Kemp's favorite grandchild. She's been living abroad two years, finishing her education. Hmm. Often that's code for getting her away from a relationship the family disapproves of. That was it exactly. And now she's back. Yes. With a French fiancé. Yes. Mm hmm. Hmm. I noticed the photo credit is from Paris. Studio Le Pont Neuf. Taken over there. That, plus the fact this story is not carried on the front page where you'd expect it. I wonder if Carmeline submitted this to the paper herself without the family's approval. That's exactly what it was. Excuse me, Alex. You don't seem to be guessing quite as much as I am. Lady Kemp, a patient of yours by any chance? Waverly, you know how I feel about patient confidentiality. I'll take that as a yes. What about the granddaughter, Carmeline? Is she a patient, too? I'm not answering that. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, all right. Lady Kemp is a patient. I see her a couple of times a year. I used to treat Carmeline's mother, too. That was many years ago. As for Carmeline, only once have I seen her. That was 23 years ago when she was being born. You were the attending physician? That's right. And that's something you don't get out of your newspaper. Birth announcements never give the doctor any due. When an orchestra plays a piece of music, the conductor at least gets some credit. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you deserved it, too. Well, I could tell from the delivery exactly what kind of a personality she was going to be. Stubborn to come out, stubborn to take her first breath. She had a hold of the umbilical cord in her fist like it was the reins of something. Headstrong little tyke even then. Scrawny, too. Hard to imagine she's grown up into such a beautiful young woman. Yes, quite beautiful. Very attractive. And so's the groom. Wait a minute. Her parents are divorced. Father, long since out of the picture. Mother living with her second husband in Texas. An oil baron who turned out to be more of a robber baron. They've been living off the family dole, but they never come home to the Cape. It's the grandmother, Lady Kemp, who's the real guardian, the one most concerned about Carmeline's welfare. You seem awfully up on this. Well, maybe I am. Has Lady Kemp been to see you recently? That's privileged. A medical problem? I can't tell you what it was about. It's totally confidential. Hmm. Not ill, is she? No comment. Okay. Okay. Let me ask this. Did my name come up? Waverly, what a completely egocentric thing to say. Just tell me. I can't tell you. Yes, you can. If my name was mentioned, I have a right to know. No, you don't. And what if it was? I told her you never handle these kind of cases. You're a retired police captain, not a gumshoe. When was this meeting? Yesterday? Waverly, I already told her that... Mm, what time is it? I'd better get dressed. If she arrives, entertain her, will you? Waverly, she's not coming. I... Oh, my God, there's, there's a limo pulling up outside. That's her chauffeur. Waverly, how did you know? Sorry, Schofield. Confidential. But you don't do marital investigations. Ah, uh, but this is more than that. Quite a bit more. Uh, Mr. Underhill, I'm Attorney Dix Braggers, and I represent Lady Kemp. Yes, yes, why don't you come in? Uh, Lady Kemp wonders if it would be convenient for you to uh, meet with her in her office. 
Uh, Dr. Schofield, she wishes you to come, too. The car is waiting. Very well. All right, I'm ready. Oh, you're the driver, too. Yes. That's very nice of you to come and pick us up. Allow me. Thank you. Dr. Schofield, watch where you're sitting. Oh, goodness, Lady Kemp, you're in here. I thought, well, I, I thought we were meeting you in your office. This is my office. I found it more efficient. Mr. Underhill, how do you do? Nice to meet you. As you see, we have all the necessaries of a modern office. Fax machine, copy machine, conference table, cellular telephone. Uh, Mr. Braggers is my attorney as well as my chauffeur. Must be convenient when you have accidents. You can sue and settle right on the spot. I don't have accidents, Mr. Underhill. Braggers, shall we drive? In neighborhoods like this, a limousine park for more than five minutes attracts attention. I thought that was the point. No, it is not the point. Braggers, begin when you're ready. Gentlemen, Lady Camp wishes to have a private conversation with you that will not go beyond the walls of this meeting room. As her attorney, I am bound by attorney-client confidentiality. Therefore, anything you say will be held in strict confidence. I hope we can have the same assurances from you, gentlemen. I won't say anything. You mean, do I promise not to sell the story to the tabloids? Precisely, Mr. Underhill. How much are they paying for that kind of story these days? Are you attempting to bargain or blackmail? I'm curious, that's all. Yes, yes, I'll promise. Would you sign these, please? What is it? Oh, just a statement uh, confirming what you promised. Now sign here and right here. Thank you. Now I'll just fax these to our files. Amazing. You can do all that and drive, too. Mr. Underhill, do you know why I've come to see you? Not ten minutes ago. I do now. Dr. Schofield has told you. I saw the wedding announcement. Congratulations. Please, this is not a happy occasion. It's a disaster. Are you sure? They look like a handsome couple. Handsome is not the issue. He calls himself Fabulous. Victor Fabulous. Ah, I see. Sounds like fabulous, fatuous, or flatulent. Waverly! My granddaughter says they met in Paris. Actually, it was Monte Carlo where he was working as a nightclub singer, crooning to all the ladies. The man is French. He speaks no English. So? My granddaughter speaks no French. Yes? What attraction can there be if they can't even communicate? Hearts have their own language, and so do hormones. So do bank accounts, I'm afraid. My granddaughter is due to inherit a great deal of money, Mr. Underhill, when I die. This man has set out to ensnare Caroline's affection for the purpose of getting his hands on it, I'm sure of it. Well, he's gotten this far, but he's not getting away with it. He's nothing but a charlatan and a gold digger. Oh, now, Lady Kemp, can you really say Yes, for Doctor, certain... I can. Because I now know a great deal more than when I spoke to you yesterday. This man is an imposter. Do you know what his real name is? I believe it's Count de Voyant. Count Fabien de Voyant. Waverly, how, how do you know that? I might say that's confidential, Alex. Or it could be I read the European Herald once a week. I recognized his face from a courtroom photograph that appeared a while back. Courtroom? His father, the Marquis de Voyant, is quite famous. Well, I never heard of him. You would have if you lived in Europe. Not quite as famous as the Marquis de Sade, but a dilettante playboy who married wine country royalty. He was recently put on trial for poisoning his wife. Oh, no. Yes. And the tabloids say it runs in the family. Apparently, there was an ancestral relative, oh, great uncle or something, also accused of the same crime. Good heavens, this, this is serious. You understand why something has to be done? Not necessarily. The man is a fraud. Using an alias, yes. Wouldn't you? He may be trying to escape his family's bad reputation and start over. Start anew. Does this look like starting over? No. No, I admit it. It does look suspicious. So, you want me to investigate? No. 
I want you to put a stop to it. End this relationship. Find some way to prevent this criminal travesty, this marriage from taking place. I agree, Waverly. It's far too dangerous. Why not simply go to Carmeline and tell her what you found out? Because I believe she already knows. She lied about how they met. I can tell she's concealing other things. She's very determined. Maybe she has a right to be. Mr. Underhill, are you married? I was. Was it a good marriage? Yes, it was. Well, mine wasn't. And I know the pain of it. My daughter had two marriages, both disasters. Her life is ruined. She's living in Texas now beyond my reach. Beyond help. But Carmeline has not ruined her life. Not yet. I intend to do anything in my power to save her from make, being the biggest mistake she'll ever make. Maybe you've never had grandchildren yourself, or you may... No, no, I, I understand your concerns. They're justified. If I were in your shoes, I'd be doing something about it, too. Well, it's lucky you came to me. How much time is there before the wedding? Two weeks. Hmm. Well, that may be enough. Yes. Yes, all right, Lady Kemp. I'll handle this case. I'll accomplish what you're asking. In the meantime, you can go home. Even go along with the wedding plans. You don't have to pretend to be happy about it, but don't do anything forceful or rash to prevent them. We don't want to precipitate any moves such as them running off and eloping. Mr. Underhill, one other thing. Whatever you do, you must do it in a way that Carmeline never suspects I had a hand in it. I've been accused once before of meddling, getting her away from that first horrible man she was going to marry. She's told me exactly what will happen if I interfere again. I want to save her, Mr. Underhill. I don't want to lose her forever. You understand that? Of course we do, Lady Kemp, of course. All right. I'll do it in a way that will not involve you. Thank you, Captain Underhill. Thank you very much. Don't thank me too soon. In this case, my fee is $25,000. What? Which Waverly. I'd like up front as a retainer. Waverly! Ridiculous, Underhill. She won't pay that. Then you'd better take me home. Now, now see you a minute. Never mind, braggers. Uh, but, ma'am... We'll pay. Mr. Underhill has accurately sized up the situation. There is no time to waste. He knows I'm desperate. I'm willing to pay for results. And you'll have them. Money back guarantee. I accept. Braggers, print out a check. But... I'll sign. Yes, ma'am. And drive these gentlemen home. Yes, ma'am. Be sure to get a receipt. Mm, yes, ma'am. Yes. This is certainly a serious situation. Mm-hmm. I agree. This Victor Fablu's character, she can't be marrying someone like that, an impostinator, I, I mean impersonator, an imposter like that. You're right, Alex. Well, what are you going to do? Well, right now, I'll go sit on the porch and think about it. Whatever it is will have to be done soon. There's not much time, and the closer we get to the wedding... Waverly... Why in the world did you demand such a hefty fee? You don't usually take advantage of clients that way. Oh, it wasn't that, Alex. But if you're going to bait a trap, you have to have a little cheese, don't you? What sort of trap? Well, that's the question. Something tempting. Something tailor-made for a phony French aristocratic dilettante gold-digging playboy. Hmm. Maybe it's time, Alex, to do a little gold-digging ourselves. Entre femmes, a mistake. J'ai fait une réservation pour deux à sept heures. I am sorry, Mr. Fablos. We have no record of any reservation. 
I simply have no table to offer you, Memno. It's not that possible. Desiree, monsieur, if you and Mademoiselle will wait and have a seat in our lounge, we shall serve you a complimentary cocktail. Putain, c'est incroyable. Come on, shall we go? Oh, Brad, it's the only fancy French restaurant on the Cape. I really wanted to take you here. I'm starving. Everything smells so good. Bob, look at la foule de crabes. Il sera neuf heures avant que nous puissions dîner. Pardon me, I, I couldn't help overhearing. I have a table coming up in a little while, and I'm not in any hurry. You can have mine when it's ready. That's very nice of you. Uh, merci, monsieur. Are you certain? It'll be my pleasure. Lady says she's hungry. I always say it's important to keep beauty well fed. Now you're being flattering. I have to accept. Then I'm flattered. Are you vacationing on the case? No. No, I wish I were. I expect you are, though. Not really. Oh? And when I noticed you come in, you seemed quite content and happy. Not newlyweds, are you? You see, Victor, it shows. What is this? Congratulations. Actually, not yet. We're only engaged. That's even better. Then it's all before you. Let me buy you a glass of champagne. Ah, uh, do not think that you... Oh, don't worry. Uh, I make a point never to intrude on newlyweds. Or most newlyweds. When my table comes up, I'll insist that you two go off alone and enjoy yourselves. Yes, we'd love a glass. Come on, man. Fine, fine. Just let me order a bottle. Come along. Do not have him join us. He's not going to. He's being nice. I'm not going to be rude. Uh, and poli. One glass won't hurt. One drink. Two more. Uh. Here we are. Glasses. And I pour. Ah, to your happiness. Thank you. Well, merci. Uh, moment, Victor Fablus. Victor, how do you do? Waverly Underhill. Uh, je présente ma mariée, Carmeline. Carmeline. Victor, here's to you again. Victor, you, you sound like an authentic Frenchman. Are you? Yeah, uh, we oui, am. In a French restaurant on Cape Cod? How rare. It's like finding a real cow at McDonald's. Pardon? <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's nothing. Are you here on business, then? Well, I'll, I'll tell you if you want me to, but I don't think you'll believe me. I can believe a lot of things. Well, actually, I'm, I'm here to do a little prospecting. For what? Gold. There's no gold on Cape Cod, is there? It's all sand. Oh, what about lost gold? You mean pirate gold? Oh, not quite. Not pirate gold. In this case, the other way around. A gold pirate. A what? Would you like to look at a treasure map? Treasure? What is? Uh, treasure? A uh, pirate door map? Oh, tresor. Ah, carte tresor, oui. Do you have one? Yes. Yes, I'll show you, but not here. Do you mind? Can, can we move to that empty booth back there? Maître D. Uh, oui, Monsieur Landerville. This couple is going to have my table when it comes up. We'll be back there in the lounge. Will you come and get them? Uh, certainly, only a few minutes more. Here we are. Slide in. Now we won't be overheard too easily. Should we lower our voices? Do I seem foolish taking these precautions? No. I don't know. Is it a real treasure map? No, not really. But it leads to a real treasure, so I, I guess it is. Ah, you will show us. Then you will sell us this map, oui? No, no, it's not for sale. This is nothing like that. Although you'd better watch out. You know what they say. It takes a con to spot a con. This is just a regular map, showing the outer arm of the cape. It's a national seashore map. Now look, look on it. You see out here near the tip below Provincetown? You see Truro? Yes. You see this thin line? That's the Pamet River. The cape is narrow across here, only four miles wide. The Pamet River, spring fed, starts right about here, very close to the Atlantic side. And then it flows across and empties out here into Cape Cod Bay. There's only one thin strip of dunes right here providing the separation. That's right about where the gold is. Uh-huh, and you will guide us and we will pay. How come he's so suspicious? You think I'm trying to tell you something? 
Well, this isn't really a treasure map. How do you know it's there? Well, take a look at this. What is this? It's a magazine advertisement. It appeared in Travel New England and 17 other major magazines from here to Florida. Come to Cape Cod. Discover the key to your golden dreams. Highgate Properties. What is this, a, a contest? It's a treasure hunt. Highgate does hotels, timeshares, and condominiums. Many onion? What is? I, I do not know. No, Sherry. A condominium, like um, l'appartement. Ah, ah, oui, condominium. Of course, the whole purpose with this ad is to lure people to the Cape. Come to Cape Cod. Search for our buried treasure. And while you're here, invest in vacation land. So you've come to search for it? Yes, but not exactly. These are the clues? Only the first set. Nobody will be able to actually figure out where it's buried. They won't have enough clues until six weeks into the ads. This is only week two. But you've already figured it out? Yes, but, well, not exactly. Here's a photograph of the prize. That's the big giveaway. A pirate ah, That's right. A gold pirate. How big? About the size of a chocolate Easter bunny, but solid gold. 70 troy ounces, 5.8 pounds, $25,000 worth. Oh, it's me. It really does look like a pirate. There would have been a wooden leg, but pure gold made the base too weak. I wonder what it feels like. It's heavy, believe me. And quite a paperweight. So how were you smart enough to figure out these clues in advance? I didn't need to. Why not? Because I wrote them. You did? That's right. I designed the ad. I buried the treasure. I did the whole thing. It was all working out so well. People were already showing up. Highgate was getting lots of business, and even the Chamber of Commerce was pleased. And then overnight, the whole thing fell apart. Now I've got to retrieve it. If only I can find it. But if you buried it, you ought to know exactly where it is. I don't. Was it a long time ago? Two weeks. Do you have amnesia or something? No. No, senility, maybe. You see, the problem was I thought I had picked the perfect location to bury it. Public land, so no disputes about ownership. A place with lots of ready-made clues, landmarks, and history. The Pamet River goes all the way back to the pilgrims who looked around here for fresh water. It was all perfect. Except... Well, I, I didn't reckon on Mother Nature and her perverse sense of humor. Ah, pourquoi? This thin stretch of dunes, this... Well, right here. Right here, last October 19th. Something happened here that hadn't occurred there since before the pilgrims. What was it? It was an ocean storm, combined with a whole bunch of other factors. Full moon, high tide, strong winds, plus... Uh, who knows? Maybe the greenhouse effect... But for three hours, a week ago last Friday night, the ocean breached the dunes right here and went over. For three hours, the Pamet River became an ocean channel. Pilot whales even swam up it. For three hours, the entire tip of the Cape was cut off. It became a separate island. Of course, when the tide went back down and the storm had passed, everything returned to normal. But by then, the damage, as far as I was concerned, had already been done. Millions and millions of cubic yards of sand got shoved around like a bulldozer did it. Much of the dunes got swept away, carried a hundred yards inland. Oh, my. Then you... That's right. The treasure may no longer be buried where it was. Or even if it is, who can tell? Because the whole landscape has changed. Many of the landmarks have been wiped out. What a shame. Well, to put it mildly, yes. Here I am, designer of a brilliant ad campaign that's working nicely. The company is pleased, even hitting about a bonus. And then this happens. Now, when the public finds out that the clues are worthless, it'll mean bad publicity. People will say it was a swindle. The whole ad campaign will be a waste. The company will look bad. Not only will I lose my last advertising account, but, but the $25,000 will come out of my retirement. Well, it's Mother Nature's fault. Only she won't pay. Just a very unlucky break. Literally. However, if I can find it, all is well. How will you try? With a metal detector. Tonight. 
Only one thing worries me. What? If it's buried deeper than before and... Well, truthfully, maybe Victor was right to be slightly suspicious. I'd like to invite you both to accompany me. My doctor says no digging. I did notice you two coming in. You seemed... Well, you, you seemed reliable. After all, newlyweds are the safest people you can trust. And it won't cost you. I'll pay you $200 just to accompany me. $2,000 if we find it. It'll be worth it to me, and, and Victor won't think he's being cheated. Oh, oh, what an adventure. Of course we'll go. You don't have to worry about paying us. We'll go right now. Come on, this is not no, one. Excellent, 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 but I do want to pay. Come on. Very well. I'll go. Uh, you're sweet to be so enthusiastic. Victor, I, I think you've chosen a marvelous woman, but we'd really like your company, too. Oh, it's we, is it? Is that we, meaning yes, or we, meaning Carmeline and I? Victor, why are you acting this way? Don't go getting so upset. I am not upset. Well, well I, I will do it, of course, shall we, if you wish. Ah, fine, fine. But let's have a meal first. Gather our strength. Let the moon get up to light our way. And then, after dessert, we'll all go out for a genuine cake cod treasure hunt. We'll attempt to show Victor why he shouldn't always be so skeptical. see it even in daytime. It flows through a tangle of cattail and alder bush. Now, step over here. You see up ahead? There's a break in the dunes. In fact, you can see a patch of moonlight on the ocean. I see it! That's where the breakthrough occurred. Here. Here, why don't you take the lantern and lead us? Victor, you might as well carry the shovel. Be useful, even though I know you'd rather be elsewhere. No, no, it is a beautiful night for... Uh... Now, how you say, a uh, uh, fox uh, goose chase? <laughs> you mean wild goose chase. Keep talking that way. Carmeline won't share the reward with you. That's right. I'm keeping it all for myself. Well, it's a beautiful moon anyway for chasser la goose. Aha, that's where the metal. Yeah, metal detector. Gold master too. Top of the line. Special attachment allows me to read down feet, not just inches. Hmm. It's ready, too. Let's go. Head that way. A lot of people consider metal detecting a fun hobby, especially retired folks my age. Ah, and you will sell us this machine. Oh, Victor, you are too much. No, I am not a salesman for metal detectors. On the Cape, scavenger hunters always come out after big storms and see what the ocean's uncovered. The same way arrowhead collectors search plowed fields after heavy rains. See what's turned up. What's turned up. This, this sand is loose, isn't it? I know. Walking in it. I won't have to do my aerobics in the morning. I'm sure hobbyists have already been out here sweeping the area. Could someone have found it? Don't say that. It might turn out to be true. Oh, this is the best of excuse. I'm not. I'm not making excuses. Not yet. <laughs> let's let's turn here now. Head more away from the ocean. Hmm. Besides, most collectors are lazy. They don't. They don't want to bother digging deep holes. So they. So they only scan a few inches beneath the surface. Uh, I think. I think they might have gone to more trouble if they knew what was out here. Hey, let's. Uh, let's slow down a bit. Yes, of course. Rest. Uh, 
I'm out of breath. Did your doctor say you should be doing this? No, no, no digging. He said he he didn't say no walking. I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. Anyway, I I th- I think we can begin right here. I'm just I'm just going to try guessing and see if I get lucky. If not, we'll we'll set up the grid. But a little cold fishing first. I'm I'm picking up something already. It's it's right down there. Only about a foot under. Should we dig? No, no, not yet. Take take readings first. This device is a marvel. You make several passes over the target, and each time it records the response, stores it, analyzes it, compares it to known objects, and then makes an educated guess what it thinks is down there, which which is aluminum foil, <laughs> gum wrapper probably. The bane of beach collectors. That plus old bottle caps, pull tabs, and fish hooks. Wait, wait, here's here's something. Something different. Ah, this is a good target. Sixteen to eighteen inches under. And the probability is gold. Oh, all right, all right. Let's try. Dig in, Victor. There. Look. What is it? A ring. A gold ring. Wonderful. Oh, but the stone's missing. Anyway, that's exciting. Oh, we found something. Uh, let me see. Well, it is not junk. Anyway, it almost fits. Victor, you should be excited. Now you won't have to buy her a ring. Who says? And so now I can afford to buy your machine, eh? Oh, never mind. Fill in the hole. I'll keep sweeping. Another gum wrapper. Foiled again. Wait. Wait, here. Here we go. Here we go. Now, this is looking promising. Deep enough. Nine or ten feet. A larger object, too. Non-ferrous. I'm getting a good, strong reading. It says... It says gold. Okay. We dig. Let me dig. Uh, no, Charlie, I will do. Why don't you let her start? You take over when she gets tired. Carmeline to spell you? No, I do not want any spelling. Sorry for that. It's sliding back in almost as fast as he can shovel it out. Make the hole wider. You may have to. 
You should be getting close, though. We found it! What is it? Can you see? Hand in the lantern. It's this. It's wood. It's wood. It was... It was packed. It was packed in wood. A wooden chest. All right. All right. Be careful. Don't... Don't damage it. Be careful. Uh, He's got it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hand it up. Hand it up. That's it. That's it. Here. Carmeline, open the lid. I'll hold the lantern. Oh, it's so neat. Look, look there. It's weird. It's really cool. I'll be up. Right. Right. Let's get you out of that hole. After all, you've gotten me out of a... Out of a real financial. But you must have two minutes on the doctor. We need an ambulance. Yes, you go. I stay. I'll dig it. Oh, all right. All right. Here, put my sweater under his head. Go. Be proud. I'll be back as quick as I can. <sighs> and China. And China. Attack. A pain. Uh, you, you have loved you. Bill. Pills? No, no, no pills. Dumb of me, pain. Pain won't go away. <laughs> Take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> always up by this hour. How come he's not answering? He hasn't picked up his papers. What? Who? Oh, good morning. I say, he hasn't picked up his newspapers. When did you last see him? Not since before last night. Well, do you know if he's home? No, but he's usually up by now. Waverly! 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 Oh, Schofield, for heaven's sake, will you keep the racket down? I should call the cops. Oh, you're a doctor. You know how important it is for people our age to get rest. I'm surprised at you. Well, what are you doing sleeping so late? What's all the sand on the kitchen floor? Oh, it's from my clothing. I got a little sandy at a beach party. A party? What party? With our friend, Carmeline Camp and her fiancé. They helped me recover that little lost trinket over there on the bookcase. Oh, so you tried your plan. How'd it go? <laughs> Very well. I provided the temptation, and even the means and the opportunity. A frail old man, me, a statue worth $25,000. I even fell in the hole and faked a heart attack to make it extra easy. She ran off with the doctor. He could have finished me off, Alex. He could have filled in the hole and buried me right on the spot, taken the gold statue and made up some story to satisfy Carmeline. But he didn't. I think that speaks well for him. Or is he simply playing for bigger stakes? How oh, honestly, Alice, you're so cynical these days. When have you taken such a dim view of humanity? Yes, and who taught me that? Well, in this case, it's undeserved. When I fell in that hole, the sides were caving in. He jumped in after me without a thought, without a moment's hesitation. 
A con man never would. Cons are predictably selfish and self-centered. A con man, a playboy gold digger, a potential poisoner, they're all the same. Not one of them would risk himself for the sake of a stranger. Victor Fabloose is a fine boy. I intend to inform Lady Kemp exactly that. I think they ought to get married. Uh Uh-oh. Well, get ready. You can tell her now. Her limo just pulled up. Here comes her chauffeur, Mr. Braggers. Coming to check on the retainer. He tells Lady Kemp you're recommending the boy. She'll demand her money back. And she'll have it. I'll give her the gold pirate. Mr. Underhill? I know. you come about it. I'm, I'm looking for, for Dr. Schofield. Is, is he here? He's here. Yes, sir. Here. Uh, Dr. Schofield, come quick. You're needed. Lady Kemp is gravely ill. We, we, think, we think she's being poisoned. Lady Kemp. Oh, Waverly, there you are. A wrestling. The crisis seems to have passed. What's your diagnosis? Well, I can't be sure. Something ingested. She complained of stomach cramps, nausea, just after her mid-morning tea. Hmm. So the servants told me. I've rescued the teacup. It was washed, but the cup is old. The glaze crackled. But it's possible enough of a trace has been left behind. Waverly... I'm thinking we should call the police. Oh, don't do that. Why not? There's been an attempt. Yes. Well, look at the boy's family history. I am looking at it. People don't inherit becoming poisoners. But environment does count for something. His father didn't exactly set a good example. If that boy is not going to be arrested, he should at least be kept away from the family. You're forgetting, Schofield. He has to be married first before he can benefit by someone in the family dying. Exactly. And who is standing in his way? Lady Kemp. Does he know that? He must suspect. Oh, don't assume that. Waverly, I can't just sit back. I have a responsibility. I'm her physician. Now, hold on, Alex. You're analyzing this all wrong. Well, how am I? There's a great deal of difference between actual murder and attempted murder. Between attempted poisoning and poisoning that succeeds. I don't see any difference. What if Victor Fablus didn't do it? Then someone else did. Someone who has a motive for framing him. Well, who? I can think of quite a few. What about Carmeline's mother in Texas? What about both her husbands, including the phony billionaire? What about Carmeline's first fiancé? Not Victor, but the first guy she was going to marry, whom she jilted. Oh, yes. What about Attorney Braggers, hmm? Oh, yes. What about Carmeline? No, no, that's ridiculous. Is it? Isn't Lady Kemp standing in the way of her plans as much as Victor's? And have you thought about Lady Kemp herself? Isn't it possible she's not entrusting this to me? She's trying her own scheme, implicating him. Oh, oh. Tell me, Alex, how well do you remember your Charles Dickens? What? Oh, balderdice, Waverly. Why do you always bring up something like that? Do you remember Great Expectations? Some of it. Uh, it's been a long time since I... But why, why do you... Because there are certain parallels. You recall it was the young man, Pip, who was confident he was going to come into a great inheritance? I guess I do. And remember there was Miss Havisham, the bitter old lady who appeared to hate all men, including Pip, and whom Pip thought was secretly his anonymous benefactor. Well, now that you mention it all, I I do. You're you're saying Victor is Pip? Yes. And Lady Kemp is Miss Havisham? Yes. Now... Do you remember what was the final twist in that story? No. It was that Miss Havisham was not his secret benefactor. In fact, she never had given him a penny. Miss Havisham turned out to be exactly as she appeared, hating all men, including Pip. Miss Underhill is here. Where is he? Lady Kemp, you should be back in bed. It's all right. I'm feeling better. Mr. O'Neill, how are you succeeding? Making progress. Progress won't do. The wedding is only days off. I may not be around for it. So I understand. Doctor, would you mind if I had a few words alone with Lady Kemp? Oh, no. Uh, yes, of course. Of course. Lady Kemp, may I confer with you... 
Hypothetically. Hypothetically? Yes. Yes. There are certain difficulties I'm having with this assignment. I'm sure you'll agree events have taken a dangerous turn. I hardly would argue. I intend to have this teacup analyzed, and if it does show traces, would you agree that whoever did this deserves something similar? In what way? Well, it's simply that it's possible to arrange for a price. You wouldn't have to know or to be involved. You'd only have to give your approval and get results that way. Mr. Underhill, I couldn't authorize anything that drastic. You still have a few days, can't you? Isn't there some means, some legitimate means? Of course, if you could prove he did it, I could press charges. Would you? Of course I would, definitely. But only before the wedding. It has to be done before the wedding. Well, Waverly, what was that all about? Oh, not much, Alex. Just satisfying a small question. One thing I wanted to ask you. Oh, what's that? Who was the anonymous benefactor? You mean Pip's anonymous benefactor? Yes. You mentioned it wasn't Miss Haversham. Who was it? <laughs> You've forgotten the story. It was Magwitch, remember? Who? Magwitch, the escaped convict. Pip helped him get away. He fled to Australia, got rich, and secretly sent back money to the boy. And you say this case is like that book? In many ways. So, if Lady Kemp is Miss Habersham, and Victor is Pip, and Carmeline is the beautiful Estella, with whom Pip was in love and was going to marry. All right, then who is the Magwitch? Ah, who? That's what we're going to find out. And I think I've figured out exactly the way to do it. Captain Underhill, I assume you have some good reason for this. I do. Tomorrow is the wedding. I'm aware of that. You haven't accomplished anything. They are still together, still going through with it. Be patient, please. We're about to find out. But I'll need you to keep an open mind. It's possible Victor Fablus may not be the mountebank you assume. Oh, really? A man who goes about by a false name? He did give up the count. The what? His title. Count Fabian de Voyant. He dropped it. He dropped it because he knew it wouldn't work in America. Title sounds silly over here. I understand what you mean, Lady Kemp. Dr. Schofield, would you mind escorting your friend out? I am not accustomed to being insulted in my own home. Waverly. Sorry. For your information, Mr. Underhill, my real name is Addie. Lady is a nickname that was attached to me as I was growing up. I had nothing to do with it. I apologize. Lady Kemp, you sent for me? No, Braggers, I did not. I did. Have a seat. Here's Carmeline and Victor, too. Now we can get started. Grandmother? Grandmother, what is... Mr. Underhill? Mr. Underhill, well, what are you doing here? I'll explain. I'm here to help clear up a very important matter. And what is that? The attempted poisoning of Lady Kent, Victor. Someone put arsenic in her teacup. Grandmother! Oh, yes. This has been confirmed by laboratory analysis. Now, I have to inform all of you, though we don't know for certain who it was, we do know it was someone in this room. We already know who did it. Nothing of the kind, Mr. Braggers. Let's be fair. I doubt if any of us would appreciate being judged on the sins of our relatives. What is this? Some kind of inquisition? Exactly, Carmeline. Could we have that cart wheeled in, please? This is the means by which we're going to determine the culprit. Another machine, Mr. Underhill. Découvert de metal. True, Victor. Only not a metal detector this time. 
A lie detector. This polygraph comes compliments of my friends in the FBI. Left over from when I was a fully functioning police captain. So you're a cop, a detective. She hired you, didn't she? Oh, geez, Please try detective. not to interrupt, Carmeline. Things will move along. You a lot hired back. him, didn't you, Grandmother? Well, what difference does it make? We know who's guilty. You surprise me, Braggers. Don't lawyers know a person is innocent until they he's... also know that if something walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's very often a donkey. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Now, wait, wait. Let me explain. I'll explain everything. But first, let me show you how this machine works. It's a simple device. It works on the same principle as the laser beam in the checkout line. You don't have to be hooked up with wires. All you have to do is insert your right hand, palm down, into this small unit on top, and then make any statement you wish. The machine will be able to tell if you're lying or telling the truth. I'll demonstrate. Insert my hand through this collar, palm down, and then I say, My name is Waverly Underhill. You see? It's true. I live on Cape Cod. True. I have gray hair. True. I have a six million dollar bank account. Hmm, you see? False. I often have bananas for lunch. True. I eat five thousand bananas a week. You see, it's quite sensitive. I fooled around with it last night. Wasn't able to fool it once. Oh, wait a minute. We're not doing this thing. Nobody's forcing anybody. I have nothing to hide. Now, I'm going to push the card into this next room. It's a connecting closet. It'll be dark in there, so no stray light interferes with the sensors. Each of you will step in one at a time. Insert your hand, as I showed you, and say out loud three statements. State your name. My name is... And say something else that is true. How tall you are, your hair color, whatever. And then say, I did not attempt to poison Lady Kemp. After that, step into the opposite room and wait until we all reassemble. Now, I'm just going to wheel it in. This is totally without legal precedent. It's all strictly voluntary. Well, I advise everybody... Stop. We're all going to do it. I'll go first. But Lady Kemp... I said we'll all do it. Braggers, you after me. All right. We're ready. Close the door. My name is Lady Annie Kemp. I have silver hair. I did not attempt to poison Lady Kemp. All right. Who's next? I'll go. My name is Carmeline Kemp. I have blonde hair. I did not attempt to poison Lady Kemp. Next. Victor? Enchanté. Tu m'appelles Victor Fablus, comme Fabien de Bruyon. I have black hair. I did not attempt to poison Madame Kemp. Who's next? How about you, Scofield? You want me? Everybody who's willing. Oh, fine. Well, right. My name is Alexander Schofield. I don't have much hair. I did not attempt to poison Lady Kemp. Well, Braggers, how about you? He had better do it. Close that door. Jason Dix Braggers. I have brown hair. I did not attempt to poison Lady Kent.
Well, Waverly, we're all reassembled. That's right, Captain. Are you satisfied? Quite satisfied. And do you know who did it? Yes, I do. Excuse me, Bob. What is it, Bridget? There's a police officer here to see Mr. Victor Fablos. Wait, oui, that is me. Victor, you are under arrest for the attempted murder of Lady Kemp. I advise you that anything you say what, can't... What is this? Ridiculous. I'm sorry, not ma'am. guilty? He'll have to come along with me. He's not going. I will go. Harmonite, don't interfere. No, Grandmother, don't you interfere. He didn't do it. I know he couldn't. He's innocent. Harmonite, don't anybody try to take him. Sorry, ma'am. Stand aside. Victor, I'll have to handcuff you and take you down to the station. No! Don't! You can't! It is all right, I'm sorry. Victor! 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 What was that still all over your hand? Look! M- my hand, too! Look at all your hands. My hand is dirty. So is mine. Say, what is this? By the way, that's very nicely done, Carmeline. You score big points for that. For what? Captain Underhill. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Bill. Bill's not a real police officer. Are you, Bill? Building contractor. How do, everybody? Miss, that was a real nice job sticking up for your fiancé like that. Captain Underhill, what is the meaning of this? Just doing what you asked me to, Lady Temp. Asked you to? Grandmother, I warned you about... Don't be so quick to judge your grandmother. She's a born warrior, I'll grant. But she loves you very much. So much so, she hired me. You may take that as an insult, but the fact is her concerns about Victor were reasonable and legitimate. Fortunately, I understood better than she. You'll, uh, you'll forgive me, Lady Kent. Why she was hiring me. She really wanted someone to set her mind to rest. But what was I to do? Merely investigating Victor's background was not going to solve anything. Was it, Victor? That had already been done and turned up your father's criminal record. That is true. But the fact your father may have poisoned his wife doesn't make you, the son, automatically a poisoner. It does not. Far from it. Let's not forget it was your mother he poisoned. Monsieur, that is something I will never forget. What was really needed was a test of character. So I devised one. The gold pirate? Exactly. That was all a fake. No, no, it was all a test. Real gold, mind you. Planted deliberately by me for the purpose of seeing how Victor would react. I'm pleased to report he reacted beautifully. I was going to say as much to Lady Kemp. You shouldn't fake heart attacks. No, no doubt I shouldn't. But I didn't fake the danger. That sand slide was real. I was about to be buried under, but Victor jumped in and held me up. Never hesitated. Did you, Victor? If I had thought first, I might have done. (laughs) I doubt it. Anyway, before I could report this, along came the poisoning incident. That threw an entirely new complexion on things. Yes, Waverly, you haven't told us. Well, who was it? Do you know? Look at your hand. They'll tell you. That polygraph was just a modified wrinkle on an old police trick. Developed in India a thousand years ago. It wasn't quite pin the tail on the donkey. It was more like pull the tail of the donkey. Their polygraph was a donkey, a real one. But the Punjab police told the simple villagers it was a magic donkey. Whoever pulled its tail, if that person were innocent, the donkey would not bray. If guilty, it would. They would round up all the suspects and make them go into a dark room alone with the donkey. Those who were innocent, believing in their innocence, would naturally pull the tail, not being afraid. The guilty one would only say he had pulled the tail without touching it at all. All they had to do was dust the tail beforehand with a little black powder. And whoever doesn't touch it incriminates himself. Look at your hands. I've got a mark. I do. I do. So do I. We all have. Exactly. You all pass. Fabluz passes his second test, showing he believes in his own innocence. Well, somebody tried to poison me. Somebody did. The Magwitch. Exactly. The person whose hand is unsmudged. But we all... Doctor, it's right in front of your face. Captain Underhill's hand is unsmudged. He did it. You, you're the Magwitch. 
Didn't I say it was someone with a motive for framing Victor? Well, didn't I have one? This was his third test of character. Instead of dangling a gold prize, I throw up a cloud of suspicion. See how he would handle it. Would he run? No. No, he did fine. He never flinched. But, Waverly, you didn't put arsenic in her teacup. No. No, of course not. There was no arsenic. No lab test either. There was only a mild emetic. You remember I was asking you how they were? Waverly, I, I thought you were asking hypothetically. It's a rule, Alex. When people speak hypothetically, they often speak the truth. Is that what you were speaking to me when you spoke hypothetically? No, Lady Kent. That was a test of your character. I figured it was only fair if I was testing Victor without his knowledge to test yours. I gave you the opportunity to descend to the level of a thug. You refused. So you passed. Did I pass? Yes, Carmeline. All three times. When you helped me dig the treasure, when you passed the donkey box test, and when you stuck up for Victor just now as our policeman was hauling him away. You see, this is one of those rare cases, all too rare, I'm afraid, where there are no bad people, no villains, only people of goodwill a little misled, a little mistrusting because of suspicions arising out of their love and concern for each other. Not bad. You can't beat that. As for Victor, three times he was tested and three times he rang true. Carmeline, I think you've got a hell of a catch there. You better snatch him up. And now I suggest we get down to rehearsing. There's a big day tomorrow. Captain Underhill, I'm glad to see you got through at least one public occasion without creating a disturbance. <laughs> yes, perhaps I have. Braggers informs me they are letting you drive them to the airport. They've allowed me that privilege, but one has to sit in the front and one in the back. Why? Fulfilling my guarantee. My promise was to drive them apart. <laughs> Braggers wouldn't like it, but I might forgive you. I should have liked to have seen the wedding present you gave them. I saw the metal detector you gave Victor. Goldmaster, too. The other gift said a treasure not to be opened till after the honeymoon. Well, I opened them all at once. It had a curious heft. You think so? I should say a familiar heft. Well... Goodbye, Mr. Underhill, and thank you for my granddaughter, for myself. Enchanté, madame. Carmeline, Victor, come here. I want to say something. I heard all that, Waverly. You ought to be exceedingly proud of yourself. Look at all the happiness you've created, all thanks to you. I'm just so proud of you. Thank you, Alex. I'll marry you, too. Well, you know, you were tested, too. I was? Uh, many another man in your position might have kept that gold. Might have tried running off with a girl, too. You didn't. That shows... Well, that shows your ethical judgment. Ethical? Not running off with a girl. Hmm. Has more to do with age than ethics, I'm afraid. As for the gold, what are you talking about? The gold pirate is sitting at home on my bookcase. What? You're keeping it? Well, sure. They certainly don't need it. I might need some crown work someday. But what about the hefty wedding present? The treasure they're not to open until after the honeymoon. I gave them a complete set of the works of Charles Dickens. Not some piece of junk metal. I said a treasure, didn't I? <laughs> Besides, who says I'm not running off with her?
You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Golden Idol, The Magwitch, and The Donkey's Tale. The actors in tonight's play? Dave Ellsworth played Captain Waverly Underhill. Wally O'Hara was Dr. Alexander Schofield. Ed Cochran played Attorney Dick Spraggers. And Anne-Marie Lang was Carmeline Kemp. Victor Fablus was played by Stephen Russell. The Major D was Henry Morlock. Police Officer Bill by Dan Yance. And the part of Lady Addie Kemp was performed by Bernadette McPherson. Tonight's play was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Audio engineering by John Todd. Sound personnel, Debbie Oney. Original music by Mark Birmingham. Special thanks to White's Electronics, to Rick Marceau for the metal detector, to Anne Toole for the French, and a tip of the hat to William F. Buckley's story of the lost silverware. This show was recorded at HP Recording Studio, Cape Cod, and Rosemead, Los Angeles, and is copyrighted by Stephen Thomas Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. This is Stephen Russell, wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Grateful acknowledgement to the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. It's a foggy night on old Cape Cod. A perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents a Captain Waverly Underhill mystery entitled The Whereabouts of Heidi McNone. <clears throat> a strange case. No doubt about that. Unusual. Extraordinary. And as it turned out, highly personal. As it concerned my good friend, Dr. Alexander Schofield. It all began with the first headline that appeared on the front page of the Cape Cod Times on Thursday, July 17. Lightning strikes Cape. Cape Cod couple hit lottery jackpot worth record millions. The next day's photo on the front page shows a flabbergasted Henry McNone standing behind a giant-sized bank check, big as a beach towel. His ecstatic wife beside him is holding their cute little girl. She is looking very nonplussed about it all. And the caption reads, Henry and Pamela McNone hold aloft their first installment from Wednesday's record jackpot. Daughter Heidi, age four, can't figure out what's the big deal. The, the next important one isn't until approximately two months later. Ah, oh, yes, here it is. Double capitals on the front page. Lottery child stolen. Heidi McNone abducted from parking lot. Mother hospitalized in serious condition. The next day, still no trace of Heidi. Mother's condition is upgraded to stable. The police and family are expecting a ransom demand. Henry McNone offers a substantial reward and pleads for information. Still more headlines. Lottery couple await word. Search for Heidi is widened. Mrs. McNone released from hospital. And let's see, here is, you know... Lottery couple pledge entire winnings for safe return of Heidi. And at last, a real development. Stolen car recovered near main border. Link to missing child. And a week after that, this big headline. Heidi found. But the next edition proves the rumor false. Cruel hoax. Family faces bitter disappointment. Pamela McNone committed to sanitarium. And after that, not much. More stories, of course but only rehashing what we already knew. This story had all the elements of a Greek tragedy, fate decreeing great wealth followed by tremendous loss. And the public's insatiable appetite for human interest stories guaranteed there had to be at least one mention in every day's edition. See, 
A month later, a fragile Mrs. McNone is released from the sanitarium, and the family enters seclusion. Henry McNone changes their plea for information to a plea for privacy, which gradually they get, not because the public loses interest or the press suddenly gains respect. But with no new developments, the inexorable tide of human activity, like drifting sand dunes, covers yesterday's news while it exposes tomorrow's. The story gets buried. After that, it reemerges only in the troughs, on anniversary dates, with headlines that read, Missing Child, Still a Mystery. Missing Child, One Year Older. And this one, Heidi Turns Five. Finally, on page three, near the bottom, Heidi Memorial established. The McNones were gradually rebuilding their lives. Henry McNown went back to work. They were trying to have a second child. Recovery seemed a possible thing. And then came the beginning of their second nightmare. Waverly, when was the last time you came to see me for a checkup? Oh, a month ago, wasn't it? It was four months. What was the last thing I did when we were finished? I forget. You gave me a lecture, I suppose. And I charged you. I always charge you. Yes, I try to overlook it. Well, that's because I believe it works better keeping things on a professional basis. I'm the doctor, you're the patient. You come to me seeking medical advice. Not exactly seeking... I can supply it freely without our friendship interfering. Well, that's your way of looking at it. Yes. Are you leading up to something, Schofield? Here. What's this? Five hundred dollars. You're buying me dance lessons? I want to hire you. I'm serious, Waverly. You must be. What is it you want me to do? I want you to take revenge on someone. I don't care how you do it. Hmm. Sit down, Alex. A personal vendetta? That's not like you. It's not personal. It's professional. Anyway, I'm not the injured party. But I will definitely feel better when you do something about it. Who is the injured party? I'd, uh, I'd rather not say. All right. Who is the injuring party? Since you want me to take revenge, I'll have to know. And since your medical ethical dander is up, I, I assume we're talking about another physician. Uh, worse. Worse than a physician. It's hard to imagine. Waverly, I'm not being funny. But you're right, she is worse. She calls herself a psychic healer. Who? Madame Pasconova. A psychic healer, my eye. If psychic healing means ripping open the wound of someone who's suffered enough already. Tell me again, Alex, is this professional or personal? It's professional. It's also personal somewhat. I happen to care about who's being injured. Family member? No. A patient? Is it necessary for you to know? Probably bound to be if I'm going to help you. Waverly, doctors aren't supposed to let this happen. I think I've fallen a little in love with one of my patients. What? My goodness. Schofield. Oh, she doesn't know. Nobody knows. But this is something I want to do. That's why I'm hiring you. I can't do it myself. I'm not clever enough. Of course you are. Oh, no. Clever enough. Of course you are. Oh, no, I'm not. You hang out with me, don't you? You know what they say. The clever cleave together. Oh, conceited. All right. Call it devious, then. You're, you're more devious than I am. But I want to hire you myself so I can feel like it was my doing. What a romantic you are, Alice. Oh, nonsense. Probably never tell the girl, will you? 
It's not for her I'm doing it. It's, it's for... For the, the profession. profession. I know. Yeah, that's right. All right. All right, I'm hired. You hired me. Now, who are we talking about? Well, you'll find out for yourself when you listen to this. Uh, cassette, a recording. Not too good, but audible. Of Madame Pasconova conducting her psychic seance for the benefit of my patient and her husband. Good grief. Your patient... Alex, you mean she's married? Yes, and so am I. I, I know that. I wasn't going to point that out. Well, I told you why I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. For the profession. All right, give me my money back. No, no. No, I, I understand your motives perfectly. I see this is important to you. Besides, I really do want dance lessons. I've been trying to teach myself, but getting nowhere. Let's listen to this cassette. How did you come by it? It's... it's... Pamela McNone, Waverly. Heidi McNone, the missing child. Her mother? You're in love with Mrs. McNone? I, uh, I don't love her. I, I admire her for all she's gone through. You mean Pamela McNone has been your patient all this time? Yes. Totally unmcnone to me. I don't talk about my patients, Waverly. Waverly, if you had seen the pain this poor woman has gone through, it's been years, both she and her husband. I'm just getting her back on her feet and... Oh? Have you had her off her feet? All right. That does it. That does it. Give me my money back and hand me that tape. I'm sorry, Schofield. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I stepped over the line. You certainly did. And furthermore, for your information, I love my wife. Waverly, we're men, so I don't think either one of us can understand the pain a mother goes through when she loses her child. Never have I seen a patient more crushed. She's gone through therapy. I've taken her from sedatives to tranquilizers to placebos and meditation. She was making it. And then to have it all destroyed in an instant because some fake charlatan, some gypsy carnival fortune teller, comes over here and starts selling them false hope in exchange for their lottery winnings. I understand. Now, answer my question and tell me how you came by this tape. Did the McNones have a hidden tape recorder? No. Madame Pasconova made the recording herself. She claims to conduct these seances out of a trance. She claims she never knows what goes on in them unless she records the session and plays them back. Malarkey. The McNones got the tape. Pamela. Oh, all right, Mrs. McNone. Let me listen. I'm holding on to that tape. It's going to be evidence in a criminal fraud trial someday. Hmm. Then we'd better listen. Turn down the lights a little. Ah, I am so glad you have decided to come, Mr. McNone. Ah, Madame McNone. I am Madame Pazikanova. Welcome. Hello. Uh, come in. Thank you. Thank you. Please, come uh, sit down. Uh, please sit here. There, there is light for me to see you, Mr. McNoon. Uh, sit here, Madam McNoon. This is your chair. You are comfortable? Yes. Are you? Yes. Good. I am very much relieved you have come. You are both very much like I am being expecting. Such strong impressions I am being having of you, sir, of you, madam, that I am very... I'm sorry, do not move your chair. I'm sorry. Push it back. That is right. Thank you. You see, it is a matter of maintaining proper alignment. You see? Yes. Do you see uh, alignment, yes. Here, we are creating a human tuning fork. Mm, transmitter and receiver to beyond. I, the antenna, you, the conducting wires. This room, the sound chamber. What we call the psychic magnifier to boost the signal. Will I be able to talk to her? I can make no promise. If, if only I can talk to Please. her. Do not say her. 
Do not say him. Do not say anyone. I am a psychic channel. No more than telephone operator. He's an operator, all right. I have Hush. no reason to know anything. So tell me nothing. She knows plenty. She's only pretending. But I will help you as much as I can. Oh, please. Do you know how I find you? First, I visualize the word. I see K-Quad. I order a phone book from K-Quad. I wait six weeks. It comes. I run finger up, down, up, down, up. Down, stop. I see Mr. Mrs. McNoon. I say, okay, time for vacation. Now, Madame Pazikinova never goes out seeking her own clients. Madame Pazikinova hates traveling, hates even to cross street, to cross ocean, to go around the world. Impossible. And yet, I am here. Why? Because I am forced to come. I am compelled to come. It is my mission to find you. You see, when you are a sensitive medium, as I, you are receiving messages all the time. Messages like little vibrating, high-pitched, like little telephones going off. And this one telephone is ringing and ringing and ringing, so urgent, so desperate. Someone is trying to get through to you. Oh, how she's setting them up. Oh, Quiet. I do not know. I think maybe you do, or else you would not be coming here. There's only one person we're interested in contacting. Our daughter, Heidi. Ah, can you tell me anyway? No. I cannot tell it is Heidi for sure. I cannot guarantee it. Mm, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot of money. Yes, but it is not likely. Uh, you searching for someone, someone searching for you. Well, yes, but, but if there's no guarantee... I, I feel it is a child's energy. I believe. Beyond that, I cannot say for sure. If you can't say who it is, or whoever it is, does that mean that, that that person is dead? Of course. Yes, it must be. God in nature, look what she's doing. Quiet, Sophia. So very sorry, my child, but it must be so. You see, when it comes to contacting the young, I am extraordinary, true. But contacting someone on this side of the veil... I am quite ordinary, I assure you. I must use the telephone for a letter. <laughs> Shall we go, honey? We can postpone. Postpone, of course. Yes, you may always do that. Let's yes. go, honey. But my advice to you is to go through with it. You have come this far. Do not turn away. It is scary because you feel the pain. It may cause, but do not turn away from the, the healing. Uh, I, I, I believe... Well, we'll come back. No, no. We have to go through with it. He's right. We can't turn away. We can't. If there's any chance. Except, I don't know if I can stand it. If it's her. And yet, I've been lying to So lying. Will you help us? Please, get through to her. Please. Madame McNuna, but do not overstrain yourself. You will be in contact with her presence very shortly, I am sure of it, if you only stay calm. Have a glass of water. I will talk to your husband. I'll do it alone. No, it is much better for the both of you. A human tuning fork, stronger connection. Besides, I think she, more than you, needs to receive this message. You have deposited the money in the account as I directed? Well, not quite. I opened a new account. I put the money in there. Here. There's a certified check drawn on the account in your name. Very well, my niece will do. And uh, thank you for your generosity. I guess if it works, it's worth it. It will work. 
is their little hit. So what do we do? We simply sit just as we are doing now and be comfortable. I will put off some lights. Put on some candles. We will just chat. Just as we are doing now. We are going just to talk. Gradually, I will stop talking. But you may continue on. Do not pay any attention. I will be daydreaming. Then I will be sleeping. Who knows? Maybe snoring. Sometimes I do. After that, I will be in a very deep state of trance. I cannot come out. You cannot wake me. Talk loud, shake me, whatever. Only if you touch me. Right here. Right on the back of my right wrist. Till I come back into possession of my body. But you must give me time to come back. I would have thought it has been my experience. But every experience is different. I told you when I wrote to you, you may hear voices. You may see objects move. You may hear my voice talking. It will not be me. You may see things materialize. Will I be able to... It's also been my experience that not all questions will be answered. Do not keep asking. It is better to move on and come back to it. But do not be afraid to ask any questions. You have one hour, unless you call me back sooner. While I am in France, you will be in direct contact with the beyond. I will be the opening. This room will be the magnifier. But there are two conditions. Since the rules in the spirit world have contact with the past, the present, as well as the future, you may not ask any questions that is meant to bring you personal gain, nor cause anyone any harm. Only healing must come, or nothing shall. If she says Just healing me. one more time, I'll go. Oh. Alex, did you ever sit in a movie theater behind someone with a hat on that was way too big? No. Well, that's what your mouth is to my trying to listen to what's on this tape. Oh, sorry. The second condition, as I wrote to you in my letter, as you see over there, I am recording this session. Here is the microphone here. See? I am in a trance state. I cannot know what is happening. But I am curious, I admit. I would like to listen afterwards. That only with your permission, which I will ask for you after we are done. Unless and without you give me your permission, the station shall be strictly private. For your ears only. Now we begin. And it will not be very long, I think. The spirit is very anxious to make contact. She's already gone on. What do we do? Keep talking, she said. Do, do, do you hear something? I as well. There. There. It's her well. It looks like. Oh, Brother Daddy. Baby. Honey. We're here. It's all right. Mom is right here. Honey. I'm right here. Honey, Heidi, it's Daddy. Where are you? Tell us where you are. Can she hear us? I'm right here. Heidi, I'm here, baby. Oh, God. She's going away. She can hear us. She's just going away. Heidi. Heidi, come back. I'm lost. 
Don't let me lose you too. No. You've got to come out of it, Pamela. Oh, why did I let you go on with this? That's it. That's enough. I'm ending this right now. Madame, wake up. I touched your hand. Wake up. Pamela, don't fall over. I'm going to help you with your coat. Stand up. Here now. Now, other arm. Okay, sit back down. I'll carry your handbag. I'll drive you to the sanitarium. What happened? Stop! You are finished? We're finished. You're right. What is the It was too much for her. I called an ambulance. No. I'm driving her. You can help me get her down the stairs. This has happened before? Yes. You will not blame me, I hope? I'm not blaming anyone. It worked. You got through? Yes. It was not healing. No, it was horrible. You should leave the dead alone. Come on, darling. Let me meet you. You will not leave me. You will come back. Wait. Wait. You forgot your escape. Her recovery is starting all over again. I'm a charitable man, Waverly, but I want to avenge this. I can see why. And yes, you are a charitable man, Alex. I agree with you. You can see why that tape is going to be evidence in a criminal fraud trial. I take it you weren't impressed. With what? The psychic phenomenon. Uh, a couple of parlor tricks. Heidi's voice, the baby rattle. They both recognized them immediately. A plastic baby rattle? There must be millions just like it. Heidi's voice? A child's voice, yes, but I've doctored thousands of children. They all sound alike at that age. And to you, maybe, but not to their parents. What are you doing? I'm consulting my stacks of newspapers. I want to see if that photo is... Ah, here it is. Which one? The one taken just after the McNones won the lottery. You're right. There's Heidi. She's holding the rattle. Just exactly so. That's how Madame Pasconova knew about the rattle. It's a snooker game, Waverly. She's setting them up so she can charge even more next time. I think it's very strange that she made this recording. What do you mean? Well, you said yourself, this could be evident. Normally, a person committing fraud would not want a recording made. Well, I think she did it for the reason she said. That means her trance was real. That makes her real. No, it doesn't. Not necessarily. It's just part of the act she's putting on. This is a confidence game, Waverly. That's plain, isn't it? She's after their money. You're inclined to think that way because you suppose the child's voice could be any child. I'm inclined to think it's the real Heidi. That makes Madame Pastanova a likely candidate to have stolen Heidi in the first place. This recording proves she either has Heidi captive or... Or did at one time. Oh, I am stupid. Why didn't I... After this long, it's likely she's dead. That could be the reason Madame Pasconova is taking this seance approach. Not a straightforward ransom, but still an effective means of extorting money. And at less risk. If she's charged with a crime, most likely it'll be fraud, not kidnapping and murder. Not unless we can find more evidence. Why was I so stupid not to think about... Not the... stupid, Alex. A little love-struck, maybe. You're concentrating on Pamela. I'm thinking about Heidi. I'm thinking about Heidi, too. Hmm. There is very little chance she's still alive. Waverly, I'm so relieved you're going to be handling this. Don't be too relieved. If I'm handling it, so are you. You can't just hire me. If you're going to play Sir Galahad, you have to be willing to pick up the lance. Waverly, I am finding your teasing to be intensely irritating. Mm-hmm. Will your patient and her husband be going back for another session? Her, definitely not. She's back at Clovernall Sanitarium. She's in no shape for it. Henry McNone, however, has already made an appointment for going back next week, next Friday. Good. Then we have some time to figure out what you're going to do. Well, now, look here, Waverly. Uh, of course I'm willing to help. But this romantic notion is ridiculous. Chivalry has nothing to do with it. I just think you should use whoever is best qualified, you or the FBI, but not me. I'm only an old physician, 
not an expert in law enforcement. I, I'm not trained for this. It's just that you are so much better at knowing what to do in situations. I, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I'm Alexander Schofield. How do you do? Please to come in. I am Madame Pascanova. You are comfortable, Mr. Schofield? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You are relaxed? Yes, uh, I'm relaxed. Please, uh, loosen your tie. Everything will go better if you are more relaxed. No, right? How's that? I'm relaxed. You are acting nervous. No need to be nervous. Well, I, I can't help it. Contacting the spirit world is not something I do every day. You're used to it, I imagine. If this is what you do all the time, so of course you must be used to it. True. Many times I have done this. But of course I am always sleeping through it. You will be awake. Tell me, um, this Mr. Underhill, uh, he was good friend? Oh, certainly he was. Do you have a photo of him? No, I, I don't carry one. Then to please describe him? Well, uh, you know, uh, tall, white-haired, uh, florid complexion, wears a bow tie. Wears a bow tie? Oh, I mean, he did, uh, Actually, he still does. He was uh, buried in his coffin wearing one. And you wish to contact his spirit. Uh, That's right. Ah, uh, yes. I fear it will be quite possible you will be successful in contacting the spirit of your departed friend, uh, Mr. Waverly Underhill, and that he will reach out to you. Across the void. That's what I'm hoping. We shall see. I have your payment. You understand all conditions? I understand them. Please, do not be nervous. Take more breaths. Ah, you have one half hour, or you can always wake me sooner by touching right here on my wrist. I've got that. Are you sure you're going Yes, yes. Never mind my nervousness. I, I just like to get started. All right. Very well. We shall now begin. It shall be my fondest wish to help this person, Mr. Scofield, contact his friend, Mr. Waverly Underhill. Waverly Underhill. Uh, Madame Pascanova, uh, wait. Uh, uh, can we start again? Wake up. Wake up. Waverly! Waverly! Is everything all right? No, I, I, I was horrible. I was so nervous. Is she, is she in her trance? I think so. Take a look. Hmm. Hmm, she looks, she looks pretty out of it. How do you do, Madame Paskinova? Are you hearing me? Are you faking it? Anyway, we're about to find out. Here's your doctor's bag, Alex. Get started on her. I'm going to search this room. Here's a tape recorder. Uh, should we switch it off? No, no. No, let it run. We'll decide what to do once we determine whether... whether Madame here is faking or for real. Your brainwave monitor is going to tell us. She's about to find out. You can fool some of the people all of the time, but you can't fake your own brainwaves. There's a closet over here, and... I better have a look into that. Let me have that flashlight out of your bag. Mm. Candlelight is the worst light in the world to examine anything by. The light it throws is obfuscating and illusory. Probably why they all use it. 
Stop, stop. What are you doing? Well, you said candlelight was bad. Well, not to blow them out. That will leave a sooty smell. She might notice it when she wakes up. No, well, what do I do? Well, relight them. Stop. What? Not with a match. They stink, too. Light them off one of the candles that's already lit. Waverly, I, I hate this. I told you I'm no good at it. Oh, shut up and examine her. Hmm. Seems a pretty normal closet. Clothes, shoes, and hat boxes. An exceptionally large number of feather bows. Seem to be no hidden panels, no, no hidden speakers, although they could take much longer to locate. For example, Heidi's voice could have come from that light fixture up there. I could, I could stand on the desk to reach it, but... Now, uh, I think I'm going to concentrate on this desk first. Why? She came from around the world, remember? She couldn't have brought this entire room over, but she might have had this desk shift over here. Now, exactly where did the baby rattle materialize? I think right on that corner there. Mm. It, it feels solid, but what's underneath, I'd, I'd like to tip it up, but we'd better not. Hmm. Just as I thought, this this whole side of drawers is locked. I think I can manipulate this lock, but I need a little operating room. Can, can we slide her back? Well, uh, it appears you can do anything. She's completely limp. She has no flinch responses when I touch her. Her eyes are rolled up. I, I, I can't even see what her pupils are doing. Never mind. Never mind. Set the brainwave monitor. Then we'll know for sure. Well, now, Waverly, I've, I've got to hooch her forward again. These wires won't reach. Don't fuck me. Sorry. Anyway, she did it. It, it was her knee. Oh, darn it. What? These little stickum patches are supposed to peel off. Oh, there, I've got it. That goes on her left temple. Yeah, that one peeled off a lot easier. Goes on her right temple. Now I switch this on. Oh, darn, one fell off. Oh, my God, Waverly. Don't bump me. One of the patches fell off her forehead. So put it back. It landed on her wrist. Her wrist? That'll wait her up. Oh, my God. Quick, pack everything up. Mm -hmm. Clean it up. The flashlight. Mm -hmm. Take it. Uh, I'll let you out. Uh Mr. Schofield, you are finished already? Oh, I'm, I'm finished. It has only been five minutes. Yes, well, nothing much was happening, so I... Mr. Schofield, you are finished already? Oh, I'm, I'm finished. It has only been five minutes. Yes, well, nothing much was happening, so I decided to bring you back early. You did not hear from your friend? No. That is too bad. No, nothing much happened, I, I'm afraid, so I guess I'd better... My chair is moved back. How did I move? Uh, you you did uh, you did that yourself. At, at one point, you suddenly jerked, and it made you roll backwards. I thought you were going to fly over backwards. I did that. Well, you never know. Look at these wax. These candle drips of wax. 
How did they get here? Uh, uh, candle wax. Did you do it? No, that was uh, uh, the wind. What wind? Uh, this big gust came along all of a sudden out of nowhere and almost blew them out. It was the darndest thing. And what happened after that? Nothing. That was it. Uh, I, I'd really better be going. Uh, say, would, would you walk me out to my car? What is this on the floor? Uh, what is what? Uh, I, I'd better be going. This on the floor a doctor's scope? I, I think it is, uh, you're right, a, a, a stethoscope. It must have materialized then. Yes, I think it did. Come to think of it, I remember uh, there was a sound I heard, like something fell into the room. I didn't see it. It must have been this. Was your friend a doctor? Uh, that's right. Uh, I almost forgot he was. Dr. Uh, uh, Underhill. So, how about that? This proves he actually sent me a message. Isn't that great? Uh, can we walk out now? Well, yes. But don't forget your tape. Oh, my God. Uh, the tape. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, I don't want to forget that. Of course, it is yours. But may I first rewind to hear the cost of wind? That is strange. I have never oh, heard no, that. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I couldn't let you. Why not? You said nothing happened. No, there, there was more, but it, it, it's too personal. Of course. I respect your right to privacy. Only there is no need to lie. Huh? What? Oh, what was that? Waverly's ghost. Spirits. From the otherwise, trying to reach me. Quick, quick, Madame Paskinova. Go back into your trance. I don't think so. Who are you? <laughs> Come out. <sighs> Sorry, Alex. Feather boas. Who are you? My name's Underhill. Any calls for me? You are Dr. Underhill? I am. He's not. Which is it? He's, he's not the doctor I am. I'm Dr. Schofield. He's Waverly Underhill. Waverly Underhill? You don't look dead. How did you get into my closet? I materialized. No, you did not. No, Waverly, let me handle this. You do not need to explain. Madame Pasiklinova knows why you have come to prove me a fake, aren't you? I believe you are a fraud, yes. And I believe you are a quack. Maybe so. But I know neither one of us is qualified to be called a healer. I am a psychic healer. Why not I call myself that? Because you don't heal anyone. No. Let us say I can see you are walking towards a hole and you don't see it. If I can warn you so you do not fall in, is that not healing? If I can cure you on a deeper level so you need not manifest on this level, is that not healing someone? No, it isn't. That's ridiculous. It, it lets you say anything. It lets me say what I see. Oh, right. For example, I see you. You are a doctor. I told you. You are not quite as tired what you are thinking about it. That's a safe guess. You have a little palsy that makes you think you should retire soon. Yeah, you can see that. You had a brother who was in the military. Oh, you're stabbing in the dark with safe guesses. Anyway, it's not true. Not true? He not wear uniform? Did he? Mm, Salvation Army. Uh, that doesn't mean... I see also that you are wounded in love. Look here. We are not discussing me. Hmm. And what about you, Mr. Naughty Boy, hiding in the closet? What do I see about you? I see you are his friend. But you also like to investigate. I think you think this whole plan up. It was your idea. You are someone who is thinking all the time. You have impressive powers of concentration. Most people can concentrate at most for one hour or two. You can concentrate for a whole week. You are thinking even now. Hmm. I'm thinking it's time we apologize, Cofield, and ask to excuse ourselves. Waverly! Wait! Wait! There is someone here who knows you, who is here now. I feel you know this person. You knew her, a woman 
I dress, white hair, I wear glasses. She is reaching out to you. She is smiling. I see that she could be your grandmother. But she is warning you. Watch out. She is shaking her finger at you. No, not shaking it, wagging it. Like this, like windshield wiper. She is saying, beware. Watch out for flying objects. Oh, stop this. And you, you should be careful of stairs. Oh, stop this. I see what you're doing. Some form of hypnosis, but it's not going to work. You're still going to be arrested. You arrest me? How about I arrest you? What else did you do while I was in France? Did you steal? Oh, of course not. Did you touch me? <gasps> you touched me, didn't you? Uh, I, I, I examined you as a physician. As a physician. Examining woman while she is sleeping without her permission. What will happen to your fine reputation as doctor if I have you arrested? All right, fine. Let's do it. Let's call the police. Hold on, Alex. You were doing fine up to that point. But Waverly... Madam Pastanova, now is when you must decide if you're going to press charges. Otherwise, we'd like to apologize for our behavior and, and excuse ourselves. Waverly! Very well. I will accept. Thank you. Waverly! Let's go, Alex. Yes, you may go. But Waverly, we, we haven't even confronted her. Not now. Wait! Wait, wait! Just one moment before you go. I have something for you, Mr. Underhill. It is in my desk. I will get it. Ah, there is a paper clip in this lock. <clears throat> it's, it's mine. I, I left it. Next time, try asking me for key. You see, I have nothing in here but junk anyway. But I know I will find something. Ah, yes. That woman tells me to give you this to you. Goodbye, gentlemen. A daffodil. What, what does that mean? It was my grandmother's favorite flower. Waverly, every grandmother loves daffodils. She... she did used to wag her finger that way. They all do that. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute. Why? The, the stairs. Oh, ridiculous. Let, let me go first, anyway. Don't you see? Her answers are so general. It lets her say anything. All of us should be careful on stairs. Beware of flying objects. Beware of falling objects. Beware of frozen objects. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, oh, I see you changed the room. Some more of my things I have had sent over. My books, my paintings and portraits, my favorite figurines, uh, my chandelier. I am enjoying Cape Cod. I am planning to stay a while. Yes, those are my statues. I, I was just going to ask... Uh, who are these two on your mantelpiece? You do not recognize them? No. No? Each bust is the face of famous person. He was a famous American. Hmm. I, I don't know him. That is Harry Houdini, born in Appleton, Wisconsin. Although actually he was born in my native Budapest. This one is an Englishman, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. There was Martin Blavatsky, too, but she broke. Coming over? No, it was a book fall that did it. Once, during seance, suddenly, out popped out of nowhere a golf ball, ricocheting off the walls, off the ceiling, bang, smash, broke it. A disappointed golfer, I think. The same way Heidi's rattle materialized? That is right. Around me at any time things may drop in. 
I had a doctor's stethoscope recently. My desk drawers are becoming cramped. I will light the candles now. How is Madame McNoon? Uh, let me do that for you. No, thank you. How is Pomina? Better. She's still in the sanitarium. That is too bad. The strain was much too much for her. It was. Uh, why Houdini? Why Conan Doyle? They were both great crusaders against false mediums and mystics. Yet both were believers, too. In fact, while Arthur Conan Doyle was writing The Last of Sherlock Holmes, he was traveling around the world preaching his belief in spiritualism. <laughs> you are a believer, Mr. McNaughton? Well, I, I look foolish coming back if I wasn't, but... Oh, I do feel a little foolish. That is all right. What is it you wish to do? Contact her again. I want to find out more about what what happened to her. I see. Now, um, do you have your payment? Oh, yes. Uh, right here. It's a little more than last time. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your generosity. It is always a pleasure to stop. Who is there? Who is that? Oh, oh, it's you, Madame McMahon. Pamela, you shouldn't have come with you. No one, no one has the right to deny me my daughter. I'm her parent, too. But you're not up to it. Look, you're not even dressed. You're, you're in your slippers. You're wearing a nightgown under that coat. I had to come. Then we're, we're not going through with it. Not at all. Henry, no. Henry, don't deny me this. No, I, I forbid Stop. it. There is another way. A way that will save your life too much suffering. How? Last time when you spoke to Heidi, it was like an open telephone line. Hmm? It was too direct. This time will be more indirect. Less like a telephone, more like telegram. How do you mean? By using one of the very oldest instruments. The VG. A Ouija board? How does it work? The same as before. I will enter my trance. You will ask your questions. They will be answered by the Ouija. You will have 20 minutes, or you may touch me on the wrist any time to come out sooner. Shall we now begin? All right. It shall be my fondest wish to help Mr. and Mrs. McNaughton contact the spirit of their missing daughter. Heidi, please come to us. How do you like my room? What? Oh, I... It is all right. We may chat. I was telling your husband I have had more of my things sent over. I am very much enjoying my stay on cave. She's under. What do we do? I, I guess we wait. Look, the candles are getting brighter, aren't they? They're twice as bright. Now, wait a minute. They're, they're dimming down. I... Listen! I... I hear wind. But, but look. The candles are blowing out. One by one. There's no wind, I tell you. We're in the dark. What do I do? Sit here. Heidi? Heidi? I see a light. Where? There. Against the wall. Traveling up. It's reaching the Ouija board. Heidi? Heidi! It's spelling. M. O. M. M. Mommy. Heidi, honey. Where, where are you? D. E. A. Dead. You're dead? Oh, you are, baby. Oh, I'm so sorry. Where are you now, Heidi? H. E. A. V. E. F. Heaven? You're in heaven? Oh, that's so good. Why? Oh, you? 
R in H E L L. You're in hell. That's right, sugar. That's right. That's what it feels like every day. That's what I've been going through. C A N T B R E A T H E. What's that spell? Breathe. What does she mean? I can't breathe. That's her ass. Heidi, tell us what happened to you. D E A D. Yes, I know, but how? Henry, don't ask it. I can't stand it. I don't want to know. Well, I want to know. Heidi, tell us how you died. And you. R T E R murder? Did those people who took you murder you, honey? Why O U R in hell? Henry, don't ask any more. I can't stand it. If you don't stop, I'm just going to go crazy. Go crazy then. Well, is that how it is? Heidi. Go ahead then. Heidi, honey. You know we love you. Both your mother and I, we, we'd never do anything to intentionally harm you. It was an accident. You you just got spanked. Instead of your asthma, asthma that's why you died. Isn't that right? M O T H E R. Yes, your mother spanked you instead of your asthma. S M O T H E R. Mother, you, you suffocated because of your asthma. P I L L pillow pillow. Pamela lied to me. You told me. The best of Houdini. Come and Doyle. Hang on. Pamela, what are you doing? Put that gun down. Don't point it at me. Don't. Wait. Pamela, behind you. There's a ghost. A ghost. Look. A ghost. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Shut up, you imbecile. I'm not going to. Unless you force me. Oh, why did you shoot her? Because she was a fake. I, I don't think she was. You don't, huh? Take a look at your ghost. <laughs> Seems a pretty solid ghost to me. I thought she was a real medium. I know you did. I know. That's why you came back here, isn't it? Because you doubted me. Only now, see what you've caused. These two people had to die. Oh, I thought she was real. It was a shakedown from the start, like I thought it was. Only they thought they saw a way to turn it into blackmail. Pamela, did you lie to me? No, Henry. Oh, oh Henry, Henry. Why are you letting yourself be fooled? They were lying. That guy lying there was providing the answers on the Ouija, not Heidi. Only he was guessing in the dark. Henry, look what they've done. Now they've made you doubt me too. You don't trust me. I could never kill Heidi. But who's going to believe me? Who's going to? If even my husband won't. Say it, Henry. Oh, I believe you. Where's the money you paid her? Put it in that drawer. It's not locked. Here, look, her address and appointment book are here. Take them. What are you doing? She was recording the seance too, wasn't she? 
I think we'd better not leave this behind. Now, I lost any fingerprints. Did you touch anything else? N- no. Then let's go. Uh, close the door. No, don't touch it. Leave it open. All right. That's everything. Waverly! Waverly! Waverly, where are you? Uh, Waverly, lie still. Don't move. Uh, Let me examine you. What happened? Shot. Shot? Yeah, my vest stopped the bullet. A vest? Go and, go and check on that and pass it over. A vest? Yes, you are wearing one. Yes, yes, we go and check on her. You're all right? Yes, yes. Uh, except I feel like I got kicked by a mule. Well, lie still. Don't talk, Waverly. Well, what's been going on? I don't know. You, you've been up to something in secret. I followed you here. I saw you enter. Then Henry McNone. Then a little while later, Pamela rushing in, in her nightgown. Then I just saw the two of them rushing out. I couldn't figure it. How is she? Looks like... Waverly, she's dead. Oh, no. No, how? My God, did the, did the bullet miss her vest? She's wearing one, too. No, I, I can't find a wound. No blood. Possibly a heart attack. I, I can't... I, I, I'm not getting any pulse. Wait a minute. Try... Try touching her on the wrist. The wrist? Oh, oh yes. Uh, on, on the wrist. Uh, I'll try it. Let's pray it works. Waverly, who shot you? Was it Henry McNone? I'm very sorry, Alex. It was Pamela. That's not possible. She pulled the gun. She pulled the trigger. Oh, you frightened her. You were up to one of your tricks. She tricked us, Alex. Tricked us? You and me. Especially you, I'm afraid. No, that's not... Thank God. She's all right. You were right. She's reviving. That brave lady did a very courageous thing. What? Helping me to stage this phony seance. She put herself in the line of fire. Lie still, please. I'm Dr. Schofield. You may be injured. Don't move until I examine you. Waverly, what do you mean she tricked us? The first seance was phony, Alex. Not because Madame Pastanova was faking it. Because they were. As soon as Madame Pastanova slipped into her trance... The two of them put on a performance. A performance? What for? For the sake of the tape recording that was being made of the seance. For the sake of anyone who listened to it, who was bound to believe forever afterwards that Pamela McNone was totally innocent of her crime. What crime? She murdered Heidi, Alex. Oh, oh, I, I don't believe that. That's not possible. It's true, Alex. Pamela McNone represents a certain class of criminal. The kind who will commit a crime but feel no guilt about it whatsoever. And yet what obsesses them is the possibility that someone might think they are guilty. And for that, they will go to extraordinary lengths to prove to others they're not, even when they are. A very unbalanced person. Very self-destructive. May I move now, Dr. Schofield? Slowly does it. Ah, Captain Underhill, did I do right? You did perfectly. When I heard that first shot, I quickly decided a trance is best place for me. I will come out later when it is safer. It is safer now? Yes, it is. I'd better call the police. Don't have to. They'll be coming back. Who will? The McNones, Pamela and Henry. Back here? Why? Yes, why? To retrieve what they forgot to take with them. The tape recording of this seance. Except now, it's a taped confession. Perfectly legal, too, since they knew they were being recorded. No, Waverly, I'm afraid not. The tape's missing out of the machine. They they took it. Not really. Check where the microphone cord leads to, Alex. The tape recorder I was using is located behind that wall. The cassette they took was a copy of my dance lessons. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, five, and six... (laughs) <laughs> when they discover what's on there, they'll have to come back. This time I'll be the one with the gun. We should be ready in case they come back soon. 
Madame Paskinova, when they arrive, if you'll... If you'll hide in the closet. No, I think I should be in the same position on the floor where I was. Don't you think? All right. All right. Alex, you hide in the closet. I'm not hiding in a closet. Oh, fine. Everybody do exactly as they please. Just don't get in the way. I will lie down. I'll be over here. How long will we wait? My guess is not long. What sort of seance did you put on in here? Where did that chandelier come from? Props. Oh, it was marvelous. He did everything. He made the candles to burn brighter. Extra oxygen I pumped into the room. He made a mysterious wind blow the candles out one by one. It wasn't wind. I had pre-cut the candle wicks. He made the room to shake. I borrowed something from the local hardware. One of those machines for shaking up cans of paint. He made Heidi's words spread out on the Vichy port. A holographic projector I acquired from a scientific catalog. Waverly, you said she murdered Heidi. But how? How is that possible? Give some of the blame to the lottery system, Schofield. People always imagine that winning is going to solve all their problems. What it does, actually, is to give rise to a whole host of temptations. New temptations, evil temptations, temptations that otherwise would never come up. Suddenly free of all financial constraints, Pamela faced a huge one. The temptation to really start over. The only thing standing in her way, a little runny-nosed nuisance of a kid she didn't want to be saddled to anymore. Oh, it's hard to believe a mother could... I know, it sounds monstrous. But ask yourself how many monsters might be lurking in all of us, ready to come flying out if we are suddenly granted the means to do exactly as we wish. Some winners are wiser. They do good. They give to charities. How did they produce Heidi's voice if she was already murdered? It wasn't necessarily Heidi's voice. Mama and Papa only had to pretend that it was. But I think it was her voice anyway. Possibly a tape recorder left on in the child's nursery to record if Heidi woke up while her parents were out celebrating. It could have been the real Heidi waking out of a nightmare, crying out for her mummy. As for where it came from, it came from the same place as the baby rattle materialized. It came out of Pamela's handbag. Oh, poor Heidi. Imagine crying out for a mother who could murder you. I'm sorry, Alex. I'm sorry you had to be so badly disappointed. Oh, it's all right. I'll recover. That's certainly no less reflection on you, on your good intentions. Madame Paskinova, I suppose I owe you an apology. You are being careful upstairs? Maybe I am, uh, a little bit. That is good. Keep it up. <laughs> Do you know what I find very ironic? I have come all this way. Across the ocean to use my special powers to be of service. Three times we have seance, not once, was real. First time I am in my trance, make no speaking. Second time I am in my trance, you and Dr. Schofield are thinking. Third time, Waverly and I are thinking. Not one time was real. But you did prove your powers. To me. Mm, did I? You warned me about flying objects. I chose a bulletproof vest to protect me from the most obvious type. Schofield is now being more careful on stairs. No, that doesn't mean I'm admitting to believing in any of this. Admit what you want, Alex, but I'll give you something to mull over. During the height of our fake seance a few minutes ago, I had everything orchestrated to go off at once. The room shaking, the chandelier tinkling, books flying off the shelves, porcelain busts falling off the mantelpiece, and the portraits you see hanging on the walls were swinging on their hooks. So? They were swinging by themselves. I never arranged it. You said yourself the room was shaking. Not enough to cause that. That is very interesting you say that. Ever since I woke up, I have not been having the feeling that the spirit is trying to get through, trying to deliver a message. Whatever it was, 
perhaps the message has already been delivered. Then that means after tonight, you're on vacation. Vacation? Katrina is going to be staying. Katrina? I have decided to stay a while on Cape Cod. Waverly has offered to show me around. Yes. Yes, we're going to take dance lessons together. You come too. Bring that fine wife of yours. Yes, do join us, please. I need much more help to conquer these complicated dance steps Waverly is teaching me. I might, except, well, I thought you just said, uh, uh, be careful of steps. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes another car. It's them. Get ready. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Whereabouts of Heidi McNown. The actors in tonight's play, Dave Ellsworth played Captain Waverly Underhill. The inexorable tide of human activity, like drifting sand dunes, covers yesterday's news while it exposes tomorrow's. Wally O'Hara was Dr. Alexander Schofield. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, and almost blew them out. It's a darndest thing. Bernadette McPherson played Madame Patrina Paskinova. Nowhere, a golf ball, ricocheting off the walls, off the ceiling, bang, smash. And Marie Lang played Pamela McNone. Jeff Tamish was Henry McNone. Hello, Pamela. You lied to me. And Catherine Oney was Heidi. This show was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Audio engineering by John Todd. Original music by Mark Birmingham. Recorded at HT Recording Studio, Cape Cod, and Rosemead, Los Angeles. Copyrighted by Stephen Tomasoni for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. Special thanks to Debbie Oni, Peter Whittia, and the keeper of the Nobska Light. This is Bob Nolan wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater.
Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents a gothic tale of mystery and suspense in a story entitled The Curse of the Whale's Tooth. Tonight, we witness the fulfillment of an ancient family curse, a curse spun by greed and carried forward death by death, generation by generation, until it comes to reside most frighteningly in the present. A curse whose talisman is an unusual piece of scrimshaw, whose focus is a terrified young woman, and whose manifestation comes in the shape of a creature, part real and part ephemeral, whose prowling in the night foretells that the curse is no longer dormant. Another death is about to take place. Astonishing. That's really the only way to describe it. A strange and interlocking chronology of events dating back to the whaling days of New Bedford. It continues as one of the most remarkable cases Captain Underhill has ever been associated with. I'm speaking, of course, of Captain Waverly Underhill, the ex-police captain, whose retirement did not signal an end to his career of solving crimes. Captain Underhill likes to represent himself as a basket case of old age and senility. A basket case, indeed. A basket full of brains is what he is. As for me, I'm Alexander Schofield, a not-quite-retired family physician. My own involvement in the case began on the day I decided to pay a visit, unannounced, on my friend at his home in Hyannisport. My own arrival was preceded by another unexpected visitor, whose purpose in looking up Captain Underhill was more serious than my own. Excuse me, I'm, I'm looking for Captain Waverly Underhill's house. You've got the wrong one. This is number 18. You want number 16. Oh, sorry. That's all right. These bungalows all look alike. I get confused myself sometimes. Are you looking for Underhill? Yes, I am. Who sent you? A uh, Mrs. Theodora Langhorn. She she recommended him very highly. Uh, is he at home, do you know? Right at the moment, he's not. What did you want to see him about? Well, it's uh, a professional matter. Whose profession? Yours or his? Well, his, actually. Are you in some kind of trouble? Well, that's something I would rather discuss with him. Hmm. Well, go ahead. I'm Underhill. You are, but I thought you just said... Don't you... worry, I may be senile, but I'm not that senile. My front porch just got painted. I'm using this one till it dries. Where are the people who live here? Dead. Or on vacation. When you live in a retirement village, you can never be sure. Now, what did you want to see me about, Mr., um... Penniman. Roger Penniman. Oh, I see. That explains a lot. I'll tell you what, Professor Penniman. Suppose we adjourn to my house. I'll fix us both some iced tea... And you can tell me about it. If you want lemon or mint, I have both. Oh, no, this is fine. Oh, damnation! Excuse me a moment. I think we have another visitor. Hello, Alex. Having trouble? Waverly, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see the sign, and I didn't realize the porch was wet until it was too late. <laughs> that is quite the fancy footwork. Reminds me of an Arthur Murray dance chart. What were you doing, the rumba? I'm sorry I made such a mess of it. <laughs> Never mind that. Come on into the kitchen. We have a guest. Oh, well, I, I don't mean to intrude. You won't be. Professor Panaman, I'd like you to meet my friend and physician, Dr. Alexander Schofield. How do you do? Dr. Schofield is what is known as a reverse hypochondriac. He imagines that everyone else is sick. Oh, Waverly, please. Professor Penniman, how do you do? Have a seat, Alex. Professor Penniman was just about to tell me about the animal problem he's been having recently. 
Professor, I'll appreciate it if you will also take my friend into your confidence. You seem to know quite a lot about it already. Only what I've read in the newspaper, which likely has very little to do with what really happened. I'll be much more interested to hear your account, complete and from the beginning, please. That is, if you'd like me to help you. To understand it all, you have to go back nearly 100 years to the city of New Bedford, to a man named Jacob Penniman, who was my great-grandfather. Jacob Penniman was captain and part owner of a whaling ship that hunted in the waters off Nova Scotia and Greenland. Profits from these commercial expeditions were always handsome, largely because of the methods employed by my great-grandfather to hunt the whales. Methods that ensured that the hold of the ship was never less than completely full each time it returned to harbor. And yet, they were methods that were considered cruel and ruthless, even in those times, even among the whalers themselves. One of his favorite techniques, whenever he happened upon a mother whale and calf, was to kill the calf first, and then leisurely slaughter the mother, knowing full well she would never abandon her young. In a sense, it was this sort of practice that was also the reason that a tooth from one of these slaughtered baby whales came to be transformed into a most unusual piece of scrimshaw. There will be much to say about this later, but for now I will simply describe it. A small, slightly curving piece of whale bone, perhaps half again as large as a rabbit's foot. The tooth was not adorned with the usual familiar scenes of a square rigger riding the waves or a harpoon boat pulled along on a Nantucket sleigh ride. Instead, there was a strange collaboration of astrological symbols. A crescent moon with a dark face barely visible, a kettle of stars with an unknown constellation hovering above, and a strange swirling spiral like the, the shape of a hurricane. Jacob Penniman acquired this unique piece of scrimshaw from a sailor who carved it on board ship during one of the voyages, and my great-grandfather took to carrying it with him always as a talisman of good fortune. And good fortune it seemed to bring, at least financially. Jacob Penniman might easily have been the role model for Melville's Captain Ahab, except there was no white whale he chased after. The only Leviathan Jacob Penniman pursued was the leviathan of his own greed. Like many other whaling captains of his time, Jacob Panaman supplemented his income by engaging in smuggling. Little contraband on board ship helped ensure that the success or failure of each voyage was not solely dependent upon the profits from the whale oil. Gradually, as he became more prosperous, he took to the sea less often. He became more of a financier of whaling ventures. He also took, for the first time, a wife. Her name was Hester Penniman, and she was half her husband's age. Together, they managed to produce a son they called Nathan. Within a year, however, the marriage had dissolved into hatred. Unfortunately for Hester Penniman, the concept of mental cruelty was not so well established in those days. Unable to obtain a divorce and being unsuccessful at convincing the pillars of New Bedford society who refused to believe that the respectable Jacob Penniman could possibly be guilty of mistreating his wife, Esther Penniman was finally left with no alternative but to take her baby and flee. Jacob Penniman, of course, did the only dignified thing. He publicly renounced his wife and proclaimed in so many words that he would no longer bestow the beneficence of his generosity upon so unworthy and ungrateful a woman. Soon afterwards, however, in the face of opposition from certain members of the clergy, who felt that perhaps it was he, and not she, who was in the wrong, Jacob Penniman scornfully removed himself and his money from New Bedford and relocated upon the outer reaches of Cape Cod. There he built what remains today the most lavish and ornate example of a sea captain's house ever constructed along the eastern seaboard. Resplendent with columns and scrollwork and gables and, and dormers, the house Jacob Penniman built was located a hundred yards inland, within sight and sound of the ocean, and looking eastward across a high escarpment of sandy cliffs. 
set within 10,000 acres of privately owned land. The only way into the property was along a, a winding sand driveway that stretched for several miles before allowing a visitor his first glimpse of the solitary house. Perched on his promontory, surrounded by a sea of seagrass, and made all the more mysterious by the twin jawbones of a sperm whale that framed a prayerful arch above the pathway that a buggy must pass under to reach the house. There, Jacob Penniman chose to live, alone, with little contact with the outside world, save for the goods he had delivered, and a cleaning woman named Esmalina Saffron, who came once a week. It is a testament to the depravity of his own soul that Jacob Penniman, out of boredom and evil-minded malice, could turn about and prey upon the same men whose livelihood he had once shared. During the height of the gale season, when deadly northeasters came sweeping in from across the Grand Banks, on moonless nights or on nights when the clouds were so thick they shut out every ray of moonlight, Jacob Penniman would venture out with a lantern and a pole. There, upon the cliff, he would set the lantern on the pole and point the pole into the air as a signal light, proclaiming to any passing ship a safe harbor for the night. Then, secure in the knowledge that he had done all that he could, he would return to his house and retire for the evening, allowing the elements and chance and his shining false beacon to conspire together to lure ships to their doom. Such was the fate of the cargo ship Lucinda, bound from Liverpool en route to New York, which saw the beacon that stormy night and, mistaking it for a refuge, steered directly onto the shoal. In the morning, when the storm had passed, and the only evidence of its ever having been was the pounding of the surf, Jacob Penniman awoke from an untroubled sleep, got dressed, and walked out to the cliffside to see what the storm had brought. His first sight was of the ship itself, 300 yards out, lying swamped and broken upon her side. Looking down, he saw the bodies of the men and women on the beach, some who had drowned, others who had died from the battering of the waves. His sharp eye was attracted to a large, unidentifiable shape rolling in the breakers. Puzzled, he moved over to the path that led down to the beach and followed it down until he was standing at the edge of the waves, still trying to make out what it was. It appeared to be the carcass of an animal. A whale, he thought. At least the color and thickness of the hide made it appear so. Here and there were places where chunks of flesh were torn away by the sharks that had already been to work. Finally, a larger wave came and rolled the animal over, and he saw for the first time what it was. An elephant. He stood there, trying to comprehend the impossibility of what he was seeing, until gradually it dawned on him what the ship had been carrying when she went aground. A circus. A European circus bound from England on its way to a tour of America. The thought struck him as funny. Indescribably funny. He began to laugh. And his laughter rose and blended with the raucous cries of the seagulls. His laughter continued to grow until it was joined by another sound. A low-throated growl that came from directly behind him. He turned to look. And his laughter was transformed into a scream that barely escaped his lips before the lion leapt forward and struck him down with a single swipe of his paw. No one could say that justice had not been served. Jacob Penniman's death came about as a direct result of his own wickedness. His corpse, when it was finally discovered in the underbrush where the lion had dragged it, was so badly mutilated it was beyond recognition. However, there was no doubting it was him. In the pocket of his torn trousers was found the object he had carried with him every day without fail. 
The Whale's Tooth Pendant. This, of course, was the beginning of the curse. The Whale's Tooth Pendant was handed down to Jacob Penniman's son, Nathan, who kept it until the age of 29, when he was crushed to death in a bizarre industrial accident. The family Nathan Penniman left behind included my father, Philip Penniman, who became the next owner of the heirloom. Was your father aware of the risk involved in owning it? No. In, in fact, up to then, no one had even considered the possibility of there being any sort of bad luck associated with it. The notion was first put forward by a magazine writer, who, while uh, doing a story on Scrimshaw, and after seeing the piece my father owned and listening to the story behind it, suggested, obviously as a way to make his article more interesting, that there might be a curse connected with it. Three weeks after the article appeared, my father was transferred to Pearl Harbor, where he became one of the earliest American casualties of the Second World War. When his personal effects were sent home, it was discovered he had had the whale's tooth with him when he died. The same writer wrote another article, and it was from then on that the popular notion of a family curse took firm hold. And now the scrimshaw has passed to you? Actually, no. Upon my father's death, the keepsake passed to my older brother, Remington Penniman. Hmm. And where is he? He and his wife were both drowned 14 years ago when their car slid off an icy bridge into a river. I see. Another example of the curse. The um, heirloom now belongs to Nora Penniman, their only child. When my brother and his wife were killed, my wife and I took Nora and raised her as our own. As we've had no children of our own, Nora has always been very important to us. The scrimshaw was kept for her in a safety deposit box until she reached the age of 18. How old is she now? At 19. She asked me for it. I, I felt I had no choice but to give it to her. But you don't feel good about it? Well, no, naturally. How can I? Especially in light of what you have recently read about in the newspaper. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with That's the... all right, Alex. I'd like to hear Professor Penniman tell us his own account of what happened. The first time was five nights ago. Nora was up in her room. Priscilla and I had just finished watching the 11 o'clock news, and, and we were getting ready to go to bed. We have an old dog, a, a mastiff named Gladiator. He was outside barking barking quite emphatically about something. Roger, go and see what's bothering Gladiator. It's nothing. Probably just the moon coming up over the ocean. He's done it before. Well, whatever it is, I think you should go and see. Oh, all right. Gladiator is not accustomed to barking at every little noise in the night. Naturally, I, I wanted to find out what it was that was disturbing him. I went out into the kitchen. I tried switching on the outside light, but I forgot the bulb needed replacing. I picked up the flashlight off the windowsill, and I went outside. Gladiator? What, what's the matter, boy? He was barking in the direction of the tool shed. His hackles were raised. Even as I spoke to him, his attention remained riveted on the shed. What's the matter, boy? What, what is it? I shone the light in the direction of the shed. There was nothing visible that appeared out of the ordinary. Then, as I moved the light a little more to the right, the beam of the flashlight penetrated through the hedgerow at the edge of the yard, and I caught the reflection of its eyes. It, it appeared to be a large feline animal crouching down, poised as if to leap. Oh, my God! My God! Roger? What is it? Get inside! Hurry, quickly! Get inside! I will admit I, I was a little startled when I saw the thing, and as I think anyone would be, I I backed up quickly, which caused the thing, whatever it was, to suddenly move away. And so that was all the time I had to form any kind of opinion about what it was. What opinion did you arrive at? I don't know. I, I mean, how could I? I? I was baffled. I had never before seen or encountered anything like it. And so what did you do? Well, well, of course, we immediately closed and locked all of the windows and doors on the ground floor. I, I called the National Seashore people and finally got hold of one of their rangers, uh, uh, Mr. Wendell Johnson. Quite naturally, he was skeptical at first, but I, I finally persuaded him to come out. 
He arrived in half an hour, excited and no longer skeptical. He, he had seen the beast himself as he drove in. It had darted in front of his truck. He had had to swerve to avoid hitting it. Of course, there was nothing we could do about the problem right then. We, we discussed what we had both seen. We, we talked about what should be done. He promised to take the matter up with the proper state officials first thing in the morning, and so we left it at that. All this I'm sure you have read about in the newspaper. They, they were quite accurate in reporting what I had seen and what the park ranger had seen. What they did not report, and what I have not told anyone else up to now, is that I saw the creature a second time. Oh? When was that? Later that same night. After the park ranger left, Priscilla and I stayed up. Finally, she went to bed, but I, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I was still agitated about what had happened. I, I put on my robe and I went on up to the roof. The sky was clear. Thin ice clouds were moving in from the west. There was a faint corona around the moon. I was standing at the railing, looking down at the path of moonlight that came across the water, when suddenly I saw it. Out in the dunes, a darker shape moving against the darkness. My eyes followed it as it raced up the incline of one of the dunes. As the creature crested the hill, I saw its silhouette for a moment in the moonlight across the water. It was definitely the shape of a male African lion. So I thought. Of course, there was no opportunity for a second look. Frankly, if you ask me now, I could not say with absolute conviction that I did see it. That I did not somehow imagine it, owing to lack of sleep and, and feeling overwrought. Which is why up to now I have chosen not to mention it to anyone. And yet, at the time, it seemed quite real, but, but also not there, if you know what I mean. I know what he's saying, Waverly. It's quite true. Medically speaking, it is an easy thing for the mind to play tricks, especially late at night, especially when there had been a shock to the nervous system. Though I'm not suggesting that what Professor Penniman saw was in any way a delusion. Yes, thank you, Alex. Tell me, Professor, were these sightings only that, or was there more than the visual aspect involved? You're referring to the strange animal cries reported in the paper. Yes, we have heard them continually, off and on since the first night. They always occur at night. It is a sound like you would expect a large cat to make, but there is an eeriness about it, an unearthly quality that I, I don't know how to characterize, except to say that it is quite chilling, and, and once you've heard it, you, you never quite forget it. I see. Please go on. Well, of course, I, I, I'm sure you read about the hunt that took place. It, it was covered in the media in some detail. I would still like to hear your version. Well, as you may know, our property is the largest private inholding within the National Seashore. It was decided by park officials, with permission from state and federal authorities, that they would attempt to run the animal to bay using hounds. You see, they had come to the conclusion that the animal was possibly an eastern mountain lion. Of course, mountain lions were once native to this area, but that was many years ago. Even so, it was felt that there still existed enough habitat and food supply of deer and so forth to support a small population of this species. The hunt was planned for midnight of the second day. By now, news of what had happened had unavoidably spread to the public so that when the van pulled up with the hounds, it was accompanied by several other cars full of reporters. The television crew had come to film the beginning of the hunt. I had mixed feelings about the publicity this would bring, but there did not seem to be anything I could do about it. Cat was already out of the bag, so to speak. The rear of the van was opened, and the dogs were let out. Approximately half a dozen hounds, each in a separate leash. The dogs were alert and excited. They seemed to know that some game was afoot, but just what particular game it was going to be... They had yet to be told. The reporters would have had us standing around forever. I, I was anxious to get started, and so were the others. 
Hamlet took the dogs one by one over to the spot where I was sure the beast had lain. After 24 hours, I assumed whatever scent still remained would be extremely faint, but not so faint that these amazing hounds were not able to pick it up. In a very short while, we were off. The group consisted of myself carrying a 12-gauge shotgun, Wendell Johnson armed with a service revolver, the handler carrying a pistol and holster, and the state biologist carrying a rifle equipped to fire tranquilizing darts. The conditions that night as we trudged along silently behind the rapidly working dogs were less than ideal. Not because of the moon, which was bright enough that it might have helped, nor the fact that there was no wind, which only would have disturbed the scent. The problem was the fog. A heavy fog had rolled in off the ocean and taken refuge behind every dune. It lay especially thick in all of the kettle-like depressions. The effect was quite unnerving. As the trail led upwards to the crest of a dune, we would emerge out of these mists into the clear, crisp night air. It was going back down that was the worst. It was like going underwater, descending into a, a suffocating, dense packet of water vapor where the shapes of things could only be made out at close range and where the beams of our flashlights were transformed into magical wands of light. The thought of actually cornering the beast under these conditions was terrifying. I, I thought several times of suggesting we call it off, but no one else seemed to be interested in doing anything of the kind, so I said nothing. We followed the trail for a good distance, the hounds keeping up a steady working pace. We emerged one last time into the night air and then began another agonizing descent into the murky abstract where the only recognizable feature in the ghostly landscape was the full moon hanging above us like an ineffectual light bulb. We were working our way down the backside of a dune when I noticed that the hounds barking had suddenly changed. It was now almost feverish with excitement. I assumed this meant we were closing the gap. There was no longer any need for silence. We moved ahead cautiously, talking back and forth, making sure at all times we knew exactly where the other person was. At the bottom of the basin, the trail led directly toward a dense thicket of alder bushes. The behavior of the hounds left no question that the animal was somewhere within. With all of us stationed at points all around the thicket, and with a biologist with a tranquilizing gun positioned in the most likely spot where the creature would emerge, the hounds were let loose from their restraints. They charged violently into the underbrush. At any moment, I expected a confrontation between the hounds and the creature, or the creature and one of us. But instead, after a few minutes, the hounds stopped barking. We were all of us amazed. There was no question in our minds that the hounds had followed the scent, that the scent had led us to this spot, and that the excited barking of the hounds indicated that the animal was very near. And yet there was nothing. The creature had disappeared, completely vanished, as if the earth had somehow opened up and swallowed it. You searched the thicket? We did, but, but there was nothing. No trace. What about tracks? Well, we looked for tracks, naturally. And we found some, but unfortunately none of them were very distinct. As you would expect, sandy soil is not the best terrain for preserving animal tracks. I see. Is there any more information you have to tell us? That pretty much sums up everything that has happened up to now. Then let me see if I understand the implication. So far, in addition to hearing the animal at night, there have been three confirmed sightings. Twice by you and once by the park ranger. There's also been an unsuccessful attempt to run the animal to bay with hounds. This by the park service who believe the animal could be an eastern mountain lion. From what you've told us, I assume that among the many possibilities, there is one the media has not yet picked up on. A possibility connected to the Peniman curse, which suggests that the curse is no longer dormant and that Nora's life may now be in jeopardy. Well, I'm not saying that's true. That's not my contention. The Peniman estate is still a private inholding inside the park? Well, that's right. What happens if you sell? If we sell? Well, if we sell, it would then be included as part of the National Seashore. However, as, as long as it stays within the family, it can remain in private hands. If you are thinking the Park Service is trying to drive us out... 
force us to sell. If you do sell the property, who benefits? What do you mean? Who gets the money? Well, me, I suppose. Although a small share would pass to the niece of my sister-in-law who drowned in the car accident. Once again, if, if you're thinking this is some sort of attempt to frighten us off the land... Do you live on the property year-round? Oh, not year-round, no. Summers, of course. During the academic year, I stay in our apartment in Cambridge. Both Priscilla and Nora are down here much more often than I. Do you have a groundskeeper? We have a gardener. Hmm. Any other hired help? No, my wife does all the house cleaning herself. I see. Is there anyone else? Anyone who has unrestricted access to your property? I don't think so. Of course, with 10,000 acres, almost anyone could hike in and would never be aware of it. Wait a minute. I just thought of someone. A former student of mine. An aspiring writer. He, he was looking for a remote place to spend the summer and do some writing. Several months ago, I gave him permission to use an old abandoned hunting shack on our property. He may be there now. I hadn't even thought of him until you brought it up. All right, Professor. All right. I'll look into this if you'd like. Oh, excellent. I, I was hoping you would agree. Theodora Langhorn had high praise for your abilities and your, your discretion. I promise to do what I can and to do it quietly. In the meantime, I suggest you return the whale's tooth to the safety deposit box. I'm afraid it's too late. I've, I've already given it to her. Is it too late? Captain Underhill, I don't know if you have ever had to cope with raising a teenage daughter, but I can assure you Nora is quite typical. In other words, she listens continually to loud music, she is obsessive about her appearance, and she is very headstrong. Extremely headstrong. Well, Waverly, this sounds like quite a remarkable case. Yes, it does. I take it you don't believe this business about a family curse. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, your questions seem to imply that you think someone is behind all this. That's just my training. I can't help but look for ulterior human motives behind even the most supernatural of events. Well, then, have you considered that Roger Penniman may be making this all up as a publicity stunt to draw attention to himself? The park ranger didn't make it up. The hounds who followed the scent didn't make it up. No, I don't believe Roger Penniman is looking for attention. In fact, I'm quite sure that's something he wants to avoid. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come to me. There is something we should keep in mind about Professor Penniman. He teaches at a prestigious college. I suspect, considering his age, that he may be in line to become head of his department. Having to go on record as publicly stating you have seen a monster prowling around your property is not likely to improve his chances. In fact, it might be just enough to dissuade a conservative faculty committee from voting for him. Well, then you think that... I think his concern about his daughter is genuine. But I think he is also aware of his own desire to protect his reputation. Waverly, you don't suppose this could be the reason... Yes. Yes, I do. Which is why I think one of the first things we should do is go pay a visit on the young writer in the woods. Before beginning side two, please fast forward the tape.
And so began Captain Underhill's involvement in this strange case, a case that was to become even more strange and more threatening as time went on. Our first move was to drive down and check into a motel in Truro that was nearest to the Panaman property. At least one other guest was there for the same reason. We met him, a young man sent down by a Boston magazine to do a story. It was obvious when we talked that, like the others, he had not yet made the connection between the strange appearance of the creature and the curse of the whale's tooth, a connection that was bound to be made sooner or later. We drove out to visit the Peniman home and met Mrs. Peniman. Roger was not yet back, and Nora was up in her room. Priscilla Peniman greeted us. And so began Captain Underhill's involvement in this strange case, a case that was to become even more strange and more threatening as time went on. Our first move was to drive down and check into a motel in Truro that was nearest to the Panaman property. At least one other guest was there for the same reason. We met him, a young man sent down by a Boston magazine to do a story. It was obvious when we talked that... Like the others, he had not yet made the connection between the strange appearance of the creature and the curse of the whale's tooth, a connection that was bound to be made sooner or later. We drove out to visit the Peniman home and met Mrs. Peniman. Roger was not yet back, and Nora was up in her room. Priscilla Peniman greeted us with an artificial show of politeness. Oh, oh, yes. Won't you come in? She remarked how pleased she was that her husband had enlisted Captain Underhill's help. How nice that you were able to find the time to help us. The impression was that she felt exactly the opposite. Captain Underhill asked to meet Nora. Uh, why not come back later, when she's in a little better mood? The implication here was that mother and daughter had just finished having a terrific fight, and Nora could not be relied upon to be civil to strangers. On our way out, we stopped and talked to the gardener, who was raking up grass clippings in the side yard. Not a very tolerant man, a Bible-thumping extremist, whose opinion of the Penimans had categorized them as some sort of original sinners. Do I believe it exists? It does it. God wills it. Have you seen any evidence of it being around? Omens. What sort of omens? None that you would understand. The Lord hath dominion over all creatures. It exists as he wills it. And it will cease to exist when it has served his purpose. Hmm. That purpose being? It is not for me to divine the ways of the Lord. I will say this. They have called this curse down upon themselves. The mother is a Jezebel. The daughter a wicked harlot. A temptress of the flesh. Why work for them? All oh, my work is the Lord's work. Have you heard about the family curse? Do you believe in it? I believe in the wrath of God. And I say this. Abide not with the sinners, else you yourself become tainted. Following our conversation with the gardener, we drove off the property and south on the Mid-Cape to the National Seashore Headquarters. We found Wendell Johnson in his office. He mistook us for reporters until we set him straight. We finally managed to convince him to go over once more what had happened the night he saw the creature. It was the damnedest thing. He told of driving his panel truck in along the road that led into the property. It was pretty dark to begin with. The trees along the drive had grown in close, so there wasn't much visibility on either side. The moon was only halfway up through the trees, so it wasn't doing much good. And the stand driveway was full of bumps, 
so the headlights, they were bouncing around a bit. When I first saw it, it was moving like a streak, right to left, directly in front of the truck. Holy jeez! I swerved when I thought of it. Underhill began to ask questions. Wendell Johnson became instantly more defensive, as though recalling the dubious looks he had seen on the faces of the reporters. This wasn't a bobcat. I spent six years studying wolves in the wilds in Minnesota. I've seen bobcats before. Whatever this was, this was not a bobcat. All right. What do you think it was? Well, let me tell you. You know, people who have never been out to these dunes before usually picture them as big piles of drifting sand. <laughs> these dunes don't drift at all except right down at the beach. Inland, you've got plenty of vegetation. There's seagrass and heath, and just mile by square mile of alder bush and scrub oak that never grows higher than your waist. But it's just impossible to walk through. I know, I've tried. It's stiff. Half an hour of walking through that stuff, and it raises welts all over your legs. You can't duck under it. You can't walk through it. But it's just right for a big cat to move through it with no problem. So... You ask me, is it possible for a population of eastern mountain lion to live out here undetected? And I say yes, it's possible. As a species, they like to stay away from people. They don't go after garbage, and they're mostly nocturnal. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that that's what I think is out there. <laughs> More likely it's somebody's pet that was brought out here and let loose. Roger Penniman mentioned another possibility. Yeah, I know. We talked about it, and it would be nice to keep a thing like that out of the papers. There's been enough wild speculation going on around here as it is. You don't put much stock in it? All I know is I know the difference between an African lion and whatever this was. And I don't think it was an African lion. But you're not sure. I probably would have been if I had seen it longer. As I say, the headlights were bouncing around. And the animal, whatever it was, was moving like a shot. I mean, it was moving. Who is it? Miss Penniman, I'd like to speak with you. Just a minute. Miss Penniman, my name is Waverly Underhill. I know. You're the guy Roger hired to take care of our pest problem. May I come in? I guess so. What did you want to see me about? Well, for one thing, I was hoping you'd let me see the whale's tooth. Sure, why not? Here, look at it all you want. Hmm, it's quite a remarkable piece. I like it. I take it, Nora, that you're not overly concerned about the so-called curse connected with this? Really, Mr. Underhill, we're living in a nuclear age. Don't you think there are enough bad omens in the world already without our needing to invent more? Even so, with a beef prowling around and you theoretically next in line, that ought to make you stop and think. Sure it makes me stop and think. Sometimes I think I'm the only one around here who stops and thinks. I mean, this is just so stupid. So, what if some of my relatives died strange deaths? They all died differently. There's no pattern to it. What about the beast? Which I've never seen. And the only time I've heard it is late at night. When I'm half asleep. Oh, it's obviously somebody's pet that was let go when it got to be too much to handle. People are all the time driving out here and ditching their dogs and cats. Why not other animals? You know, I was talking to your mother downstairs. She tells me you've been having dreams about it. I had a dream about it. Why shouldn't I? It's all anybody talks about around here. Would you mind telling me about it? It was just a dream. That's all it was. I'd still like to hear, if it's not too personal. Oh, well, it was a couple of nights ago. I was asleep, and I started having this dream. Sort of a nightmare, really. I was in a large room, like the inside of a barn. It had thick wooden beams overhead and light that filtered in through cracks in the walls. All I can remember is that all of a sudden I had this feeling that there was something up in the rafters. I couldn't actually see it, but I could hear it pacing back and forth on the beam right above my head. I knew that all I had to do was look up, and 
I would see whatever it was. But I couldn't lift my eyes. You know those dreams. You're trying to look at something, but you can't. Who knows? Maybe I was afraid to. Anyway, after a while, the dream shifted. And it was like I was sleepwalking out in the dunes. I was walking along a path that was worn down through the vegetation. And up ahead, I saw what I thought was a black rock lying in the middle of the path. Then I looked again, and I realized it wasn't a rock at all. It was a black panther buried up to its neck in the sand. It just stood there petrified. Slowly, it turned its head to look at me. Then it opened its mouth like it was going to scream. And it was like in a cartoon, where all of a sudden the mouth got really huge, and I could see all the way to the back of its throat. It screamed, or I did. I don't know which, but I woke myself up. Afterwards, I lay there trying to decide if I had actually heard something, or was it all in my mind? Then I noticed one thing that must have been causing at least part of the dream. Oh? What was that? Roger. He was up on the roof, pacing in his pajamas. Obviously, it was his pacing that I was hearing in my sleep and turning into an animal. So, now are you going to analyze my dream for me? I'm afraid I'm not much good at that. You know, Nora, your mother and father are both very concerned about your safety. Oh, that's a laugh. The only thing my stepmother is concerned about is controlling other people's lives. As for Roger, he's much more worried about his reputation on campus. You know, that's the real reason he hired you to clear this up. He's afraid the faculty will laugh at him. Still, your parents are worried. They're concerned you're not taking this seriously enough. I really don't believe this. Why is it when I act like an adult, everybody expects me to act like a juvenile? I'm not a child, Mr. Underhill. And I refuse to believe in some fairy tale curse just because everybody else is getting hysterical over it. It took us several false starts before we finally discovered the trail that led to the hunting shack where we hoped to find the young writer living alone in the woods. A high, thin fog that was slowly burning off made the woods seem darker and more dense as we passed through them, while each clearing that we came to was filled with a dazzling light as though sunlight was seeping in from every direction. We followed the path that was little more than a deer trail for several miles until we came upon one of these suffused openings, and there, suddenly, in the middle of the clearing, stood the hunting shack, staring back at us with its door widely ajar. Captain Underhill stopped us. We both stood listening for a moment. Do you hear anything? No, I don't. Should I? I guess not. It's these damned ears of mine. At my age, I keep expecting them to go bad on me. But they never do. Shouldn't we call out and, and let him know we're approaching? No. No, I, I have the feeling he already knows. That is, if he's still around. It's possible he heard us coming and took off. Why should he do that? We'll find out. Let's go in. I felt uncomfortable making such a secretive approach and entering the cabin without permission. Nevertheless, without saying anything, I followed behind and crossed the threshold right behind him. The fog was as thick inside the cabin as out. In one corner, I could make out a bunk with a sleeping bag unrolled on top of an old mattress. Lying under the bed was a knapsack and duffel bag. On a shelf above the window, I saw a row of books and a pair of binoculars. The other side of the room was the kitchen and dining area. An alcohol stove was set out on a fold-down bench. A solitary chair made of pieces of driftwood was drawn up to a wooden table. On the table was a hurricane lamp, the beginnings of a letter 
with only a few sentences put down and a half-finished cup of coffee. You were right, Waverly. He must have heard us coming and took off. Oh, I don't think so, Alex. The coffee's cold and there's a layer of pollen floating on top. Also, the kerosene lamp is burned dry and the wick's charred. I'm afraid our inhabitant left some time ago. Obviously at night or he wouldn't have had the lamp burning. And obviously he intended to come back. The question is, why didn't he? I think we'd better have a closer look around. We left the cabin and began a search of the immediate area. In back was an old windmill, still standing, but no longer working. The top was just barely visible through the drifting fog. The blades of the wind vane hung limp and broken like damaged feathers. A crow sat above, eyeing us with more than the usual circumspection. Waverly noticed it the same time I did. There was something about this crow. Either it was especially tame, or there was something down below it was jealously guarding. Over here. When we found him, he was lying partially concealed beneath a wild azalea bush. An expression of abject terror frozen upon his face. His mouth agape, his eyes rolled back. The wounds he had suffered began on either side of his face and continued downward in parallel lines that ended just below his diaphragm. The wounds were deep, and the flesh that had been flayed open was the prize the crow had been guarding so jealously. Despite all my years as a physician dealing with wounds of every kind, it still took me several minutes to gather my thoughts. Waverly, what are we going to do about this? I'm afraid we have no choice. We'll have to report it to the police. Though if I had my way, I'd prefer to keep quiet about it. You can imagine how it's going to compound the sensationalism already surrounding this case when news of this gets out. I must say this puts an entirely new complexion on things. It forces me to reevaluate my reasoning. Captain Underhill's prediction about the publicity this would bring proved absolutely correct. Within a day after the discovery of the body was announced, the story made the evening news on all three networks. Reporters from every sector of the media converged on the area, filling every motel and hotel on the Lower Cape. A certain degree of hysteria naturally followed, but mostly the locals seemed willing to take the few extra precautions and let it go at that. Eventually, the story about the family curse resurfaced, and the Penimans quickly became minor celebrities. They found themselves forced to hire a gatekeeper who was positioned day and night at the head of the drive to keep out the curious, who were apt to drive down hoping to catch a glimpse of the beast. Within a week, however, with no new developments and no new sightings to report, the story began to taper off. Another hunt with hounds was authorized and carried out with no results. The event went through the usual stages of practical jokers calling up to report fresh sightings, probably by local merchants who hoped the boom in business would continue forever. Of course, there were the inevitable T-shirts. The worst one showed a row of claw marks down the front. On the back it read, I got clawed on Cape Cod. While the story was playing itself out, Captain Underhill seemed content to spend most of his time either reading in a motel room or going out taking walks. I returned to my practice with the promise that he would call me if anything happened. Eight days after we found the body, I received a message at my office from Captain Underhill instructing me to meet him at the motel and bring a sleeping bag. <laughs> I arrived several hours after dark. We set off walking almost immediately, leaving the lights of the motel behind and walking overland. We were soon enveloped by darkness. A wind that was beginning to stir was pulling sections of fog in off the ocean and sending them drifting through the pines like passing phantoms. Moving through the woods, you could feel them brush against your face ghostly touch, so palpable it provoked unwilling goosebumps all over my flesh. Except for the sea breeze that made the faint whistling through the pine branches, and of course the ever-present distant foghorn of highland light, the night air seemed more quiet than it should have been. 
It was the quiet that got to me, magnifying my nerves and making it all the more difficult to follow behind Underhill, who had requested that I keep silent until we reached our destination. As he had neglected to mention where this was, and as we continued walking in what seemed a random direction, I began to think this destination might be some sort of mythical location. Whether we were lost or not, I made a mental note to myself never again to suggest that Underhill was in anything but perfect condition. Why are we stopping? We're close enough. To where? To the house. Don't you see it? Over there. We don't want to get too close. What are we going to do? Wait. Wait and be patient. If we're lucky, we'll have a visitor. You mean the creature? There's a good chance. The Penemans have heard it now two nights in a row. Always very late. Between two and four in the morning. Nocturnal predatory animals tend to be predictable in their hunting patterns. They follow the same circuit night after night. What are you doing? Getting into my sleeping bag. I suggest you do the same. We can expect a long wait and we may as well be comfortable. You're not zipping yourself in. Why not? Well, what if it comes? How, how will you run? It'll be like one of those campers in Yellowstone who, who get trapped inside their sleeping bag and then mauled to death by the grizzlies. And what chance do you think a man my age would have of outrunning it? If nothing more, this bag will provide some protection. If not from the beast, at least from the cold. Well, I'm certainly not going to immobilize myself in some cocoon of a sleeping bag. I may lie down on it, but I'm not getting in. All right. All right, suit yourself. But don't catch cold. Waverly, you're, you're, you're not going to sleep. Oh, why not? We're going to be up late. A small rest now might do us some good. But it seems you're taking this whole thing far too lightly. You didn't even bring a gun. No, but I noticed you did. Yes, and I intend to use it if I have to. All right. But keep in mind, if it's an eastern mountain lion that's out there, it's an endangered species. Killing it will mean a $20,000 fine. Well, I'd rather pay the fine than pay for either one of our funerals. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. Are, are you awake? Yes. I've been thinking about the gardener. There's something strange about him, don't you think? Oh, I'd say so, yes. What did you make of it? I think people like that are their own worst enemy. Self-appointed spokesmen for God, they always manage a backward interpretation of everything they read in the Bible. And the Lord said, Go forth, be fruit, fly, and multiple. Hmm, yes. Uh, well, all right. Go back to sleep. I'll take the first watch. Yes, I knew you would. Good night, Doctor. I hope you have nightmares. I heard something. What was that? Wait, Lily. Wake up. I, I think it's here. Waverly! Waverly, where, where are you? Waverly! Waverly! Shh, be quiet. You'll wake the whole neighborhood. Did you hear it? I'm sure I heard something. Yes, yes, I heard it. It's gone now. Where were you? Sitting about ten yards away. Your snoring was making it too difficult to listen. But did you hear it? Yes, quite clearly. We can go now. I don't think it's likely to return. Why not? Because I've discovered our creature and the Cheshire cat have at least one thing in common. The ability to appear and disappear at will. Where the hell have you been? I tried reaching you all night. Is something wrong? Oh, no, nothing's wrong. Except last night that thing tried to kill Nora. Was she hurt? I thought we were hiring you to protect her. 
I don't know why we're paying to put you up at a motel if you're not going to be available when something Where like Where is this. she now? Upstairs, resting in her room. She's frightened. She had a terrible scare, and, and she still hasn't recovered. She wasn't prepared for this. Not at all. Anyway, my wife and I are making arrangements to move her off the property. Suppose you tell me what happened. I, I see you brought your doctor friend with you. Well, come with me. I'll, I'll show you. It happened out here, in the garage. The garage door was closed, of course. Nora came out through the connecting door that leads to the kitchen. We'd had an argument. She'd wanted to go out to go visiting friends. Priscilla and I were against it, but she promised to use extra precaution, and, and she did. Our agreement was, if she was going out at all, she would keep the windows rolled up and the doors locked and not get out of the car no matter what until she was safely out on the road and well away from the property. And that's exactly what she did. Or tried to do. She came out here and got behind the wheel of the car. She turned on the headlights. She checked the doors and windows before leaning across to the glove compartment for the remote control switch that opens the garage door. As the door went up, she started the engine. Then she reached up to adjust the rear view mirror. That's when she saw it. It was standing there, illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights, standing in the open about ten yards behind the car. The animal did not move. Neither did Nora, who by now was completely frozen with fear. As she watched, the worst possible thing happened. It began to move. Not away, as any other wild animal would have done, but straight toward her. Deliberately and purposefully, it was going straight for the car. Priscilla and I were inside the house expecting to hear the car back up and, and drive away. Oh, my God! Roger! It's Nora! Quickly! Quickly! I see. What time was this, approximately? Around 8.30 or 9. When you came out, did you or your wife see the animal? No, of course not. The car horn frightened it off. What are you suggesting, that she made this up? No. Because if you are... You're completely wrong. I don't know what sort of opinion you have formed about my daughter, but I know she is not capable of putting on an act like this. Nora saw the thing. I've seen it twice. The park ranger saw it, and it has already killed a man. Are you suggesting all this is a figment of our imaginations? Oh, calm down, Mr. Penniman. Tell me what you intend to do about it. Well, the first thing we're going to do is to get Nora away from here as fast as we can. I'd rather you didn't. And for what reason? I'm afraid if she disappears, so will the creature. Now, what would you like us to do? Use her as bait? Try to lure the creature back? Why not simply stake her down out in the yard? Maybe that's what you'd like us to do. Professor Penniman, please. Captain Underhill is only... You know the last thing she said to me? Last night before she finally went to sleep? She said she was giving it back. The whale's tooth. She doesn't want it anymore. She wants me to get rid of it. Did you? I will. I'm going to. This morning, as soon as she wakes up. Hmm. If you don't mind, Professor Penniman, when she does wake up, I'd like to go up and talk to her first. I waited with Roger and Priscilla Penniman in their kitchen while Captain Underhill went up to talk to their daughter. I had seen enough of Captain Underhill's methods to know that he was working on a theory, and I sensed that he felt he was getting close to a solution. The interview did not last long, no more than five minutes. When he came back down, I could see that something had happened to change his mind. Underhill's explanation to the Penimans was that he needed a little more time to work on the case, but that he was convinced the danger to Nora was past. He would not explain why, except that he recommended that Roger follow Nora's request and take back the whale's tooth. Later in the car, I asked him for more information about what occurred upstairs. He told me that Nora, in bed and obviously shaken, had given an account of the incident that matched what her father had said. He had asked to take another look at the whale's tooth, 
She let him go over and get it himself from her dresser drawer. The interview concluded by him telling her he thought she was making the right choice in giving it up. It wasn't worth the risk. She agreed, and that was the end of it. I hinted that I would like to know what theories he was working on. He told me he had one, but it had recently undergone a major reassessment. He refused to say more, except to tell me I might as well return to my practice. He would call me again when there were further developments. I heard nothing more from Underhill for more than a week. I kept an eye out for any new information that might appear in the paper, but the story had largely dropped out of sight. Magazines, of course, were still brimming with it, but only essentially rehashing what was already known. I read a blurb in the Cape Cod Times that a film company had concluded a financial agreement with the Penimans to come and shoot footage and tape interviews for a television special. All right. Mr. and Mrs. Penniman, if you'll both have a seat on the sofa, we'll take an exposure reading, and then we can begin the interview. Do I look all right? Yes, Mrs. Penniman, you look fine. Uh, Nora, I think if you don't mind, we'll have you sit this one out. We'll get to you a little later. Fine by me. Uh, Rick, control truck says they're picking up sound from the generator. Are all the windows closed? I could try closing the curtains, if that would help. That's a good idea. Why don't we do that? What are they doing outside? You've never seen a fog machine? I'm afraid that's the way we do it in the movies. While these interviews are going on, a second crew is going to be filming outside shots of the house. It's ironic. We almost always have fog around here, and yet on the one night you could use it. Actually, it's good we don't. We'll be using a helicopter a little later for air-to-ground shots with a searchlight. Obviously, we need clear skies for that. Uh, maybe you'll be lucky and actually film the creature from the air. We hope so, but no one's counting on it. Uh, Rick Control says they're ready. They have sound and picture. Okay, then. We can get started. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Penniman, as I've already explained to you, all we want is for each of you to tell us in your own words about some of the strange things that have been happening here the past few weeks. I'll ask you not to interrupt each other. You can take as much time as you want. All right. Let's begin with you, Professor uh, Penniman. Uh, wait a minute, Rick. Uh, Control says, wait a minute. What is it? Uh, we got a problem. Something's gone wrong. What's going on here? Who is this person? What's he doing here? I heard you were shooting a film. I thought you might need a few extras. This is my friend, Dr. Schofield. What the hell is this? Captain Underhill, this is not the time Get for you. out of here! I brought some other volunteers. Federal agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The Coast Guard, too, if you need them. They are down at the beach. Get out of here. You're ruining everything. My advice to you, Nora, since you're about to be taken into custody, is not to say anything until your parents can arrange a lawyer. If you film people would like to step outside and introduce yourselves, they're waiting for you. My God, Underhill, what is this? Nora, what, what's he talking about? Better let me explain. No point in Nora incriminating herself further. You're saying Nora had something to do with this? She had just about everything to do with it. Of course, she was not acting alone. My compliments, Nora, to whoever dreamed this up. An ingenious deception, elaborate, and almost flawlessly executed. Go get stuffed. Nora, shut up. You're saying all of this was staged? An illusion, Professor Penniman. Done for effect. Just as that fog machine outside creates the illusion of fog. But why? For what purpose? To carry out a large-scale drug smuggling operation. To bring drugs ashore. I'm afraid your daughter has at least that much in common with old Jacob Penniman. A propensity towards smuggling. But I don't understand. How is it possible? Well, shall we go back? To the beginning. Not as far back as Jacob Penniman, but to the night you first saw the creature. But I did see it. It, it couldn't have been an illusion. It wasn't. What you saw was a fully grown eastern mountain lion fitted with an unusual collar. I had hoped to have it here this evening. At this moment, the police are conducting a search of Ranger Johnson's house, where I expect it will turn up. He was in on this? Oh, yes. Yes, he was essential. He provided the second eyewitness. Two were necessary, you see, to make the media and the public sit up and take notice. Of course, a park ranger's eyewitness testimony in matters like this carries a lot of weight. You said some sort of collar? That's right. 
I haven't seen it yet myself, but I think I can describe it for you. First of all, it contained a miniature homing device that allowed them to keep track of where the animal was at all times. Such items are commonly used in large-game wildlife studies, studies similar to those Ranger Johnson performed on wolves in Minnesota. The collar also contained an electronic instrument that allowed them to administer small electric shocks on either side of the neck. This was the steering mechanism. Crude, but it provided some degree of control over the movements of the animal. Last of all, but equally important, was a built-in tranquilizing dart that could be triggered by remote control to inject a drug directly into the vein of the neck. This, of course, gave them the ability to go and retrieve the animal any time they wished. All of this electronic gadgetry was packaged inside a shaggy mane that transformed the animal's appearance into a facsimile of an African lion. That was what you saw crouching in the bushes that first night, and later running along the dunes in the moonlight. Wendell Johnson saw it, too, as he drove in. He could have made up a story. He was prepared to. But why bother when he could describe what he had seen and have it suit his purpose exactly? The fact that the animal was moving so fast when he saw it is attributable to the electric shocks that were tormenting the beast, driving it into a frenzy of panic as it desperately tried to escape from whatever was inflicting the pain. That is, until the next shock sent it off in a new direction. The shocks, of course, were also useful in eliciting the blood-curdling animal screams you heard that night. But if the creature was real, as you say, then, then how could it suddenly vanish when the hounds had it cornered in the underbrush? I was there. How can you explain that? Yes, it was a vanishing act, but one that had taken place hours before. The hounds followed the trail to the point where the tranquilizing dart had been injected. As the animal began to go down from the effects of the drug, its natural reaction was to make its way to cover. The last few yards it must have staggered and dragged itself along over the ground, thus laying down a stronger scent which the hounds interpreted as getting closer. Why did the beast vanish? It vanished because men had come hours earlier, hoisted the animal into a sling, and carried it away. From this point on, the legendary creature ceased to exist in the flesh, so to speak, and became purely a fabrication. But unfortunately, by then the accident had already taken place. You know the one I mean, don't you, Nora? The young, aspiring Thoreau, living in his cabin in the woods, who heard a noise that first night and went out to investigate, only to be struck down by an animal driven half insane by electric shocks. That was an accident. No one but Roger Penniman knew the young man was staying out there, and so no one knew he'd been killed until Dr. Schofield and I found the body several days later. That scared you, didn't it, Nora? In fact, it almost made you call the whole thing off. That was why, for a week, nothing more was heard from the creature. Then, of course, you realized it was too late to pull out. What was done was done. Besides, the death of the writer in the woods fit in perfectly with what they were trying to accomplish. Which was? A media sensation. A publicity hype. They set about resurrecting an old myth about a family curse, brought in a poor mountain lion to play the part of the phantom beast, and then watched as the press picked up the ball and ran with it. The result was an almost perfect smokescreen that would have allowed them to smuggle ashore millions of dollars worth of drugs in a single night under the pretense that they were shooting a film. That seems like a lot of effort to go Not through. when you consider how much profit was at stake and the fact that this land is so ideally suited for the purpose. A private inholding inside a large public park with frontage on the ocean. The main difficulty was how to get all the trucks in and out without arousing suspicion. When did you figure out all this? Oh, I must say, for me, it's been a painfully slow process of realization. My mental faculties, like the rest of me, have gone considerably downhill in recent years. Nonsense, Waverly. Of course, from the beginning, I suspected that some calculating mind was behind this. It's not that I'm disposed to disbelieve stories about family curses, but I like to examine other possibilities first. I began with the strange appearance and disappearance of the beast. I decided to believe Professor Penniman's story that he had seen something in his backyard. And I was also inclined to believe the hounds, who do not usually lie about such things. If the beast had seemed to disappear when the hounds had it at bay, it seemed to me that there were only two ways this could have been accomplished. 
Either someone had dragged a scent like they do in fox hunts, or, or they had done the same thing with the animal itself. Because of the eyewitness accounts, I picked the second choice, which forced me to come up with a notion about the collar. I had concluded this much not long after my initial conversation with Roger Penniman, but I was still left with figuring out who was doing it and for what reason. At first, I suspected the writer in the woods, but that theory had to be discarded when we found his body. Then, of course, I turned my attention back to Nora, who I considered a likely candidate from the beginning. I suspected she was involved. Later, of course, I was certain of it when I heard the story about her close encounter with the creature while she was out sitting in the garage. By then I knew very well the animal had not been around since the first night. But wait a minute, Waverly. We heard it the night you and I slept out. A recording, Doctor. A speaker system carefully hidden in the hollow of a tree. I went back the next day and found the wires. I apologize for not telling you, but I knew something was brewing and I didn't want to take a chance on anyone finding out. Anyway, I knew Nora was in on it, but I was having a devil of a time figuring out why. Her normal teenage rebelliousness and resentment toward her parents didn't justify her going to such lengths. Besides, there had to be others helping her, and the opportunity of embarrassing her father in front of the faculty did not seem sufficient to warrant all the effort. It is an example of how dim-witted I have become that it took until my second interview with Nora when I asked to see the scrimshaw once more and she pointed to the drawer where she kept it. I opened the drawer to take it out and it was then that I noticed several small marijuana seeds stuck in the corner. Nothing particularly unusual about that in this day and age, but seeing them made me suddenly realize the angle I'd been overlooking all along and literally in an instant I knew exactly what they were doing it for. After that, there was nothing more to do but be patient and be ready when the time came. Aha, a helicopter. Could be theirs, but more likely it's the Coast Guard. Captain Underhill, what's going to happen to Nora? Smuggling is a serious crime, but it's also a crime that in this country we tend to treat somewhat lightly with respect to the punishments that are handed down. I suppose because in a peculiar way it represents an American ideal. Free enterprise in its most flagrant form. Unfortunately, there's also the murder to consider. Someone's going to have to answer for that. Well, what do you mean? What murder? The murder of the writer in the woods. Nora and her compatriots may try to claim involuntary manslaughter, but I think second-degree murder will be the one that sticks. Releasing a wild animal like that and then tormenting it with electric shocks is the sort of reckless behavior that no judge is going to overlook. Without the murder, I think the most she would have gotten is probation, considering her age and lack of criminal record. As it is, I think she may want to start looking into correspondence schools. And so ended what has become Captain Waverly Underhill's most famous case. Famous because of notoriety. Not because it was any more or less ingenious than the solutions he had provided in other criminal investigations. Rarely has there been a crime whose intentional purpose was to create as much publicity as possible. It may be said that it reveals something about our national media obsession with human interest stories, that so many news organizations were so easily drawn in by the lure of a family curse and a predatory beast prowling the cape. And then, at the height of all the attention, to have Captain Underhill step forward and expose it as a plot to conceal a smuggling operation. Well, it was simply a master stroke of genius, and all from a man who claims his mind is going. There's one final addendum to this narrative. It comes from an article written by a reporter who writes for a New England magazine. He did some checking into the ancestry of the young writer in the woods who was mauled to death by the lion. It appears the writer was distantly related to a woman named Esmalina Saffron. The same Esmalina Saffron who worked as Jacob Penniman's cleaning woman and who, following her association with him, bore him an illegitimate heir. The reporter naturally pointed out what a freakish coincidence it was that a direct descendant of Jacob Penniman should have met an untimely death in almost the same location and by the same manner in which Jacob Penniman was killed. 
I leave it to you to pass judgment, since it appears that a family curse, unlike the rest of us, is something not so easily laid to rest. You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of The Curse of the Whale's Tooth. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Boney, co-produced by David Ellsworth, engineering by John Todd, sound effects by Scott Dickey, and with original music composed by Matt Birmingham. The actors in tonight's play, Judge McConville played Professor Roger Penniman. David Ellsworth was Captain Underhill. Wally O'Hara was Dr. Schofield. Lee Olive was Priscilla Penniman. Bob G.N. Ferranti played the ship captain. Jeff Kamish was the first mate and the gardener. Neil McGarry was Wendell Johnson. Christy Weimar was Nora Penniman. Evan Groppy, the director. And Scott Dickey played the assistant to the director. Tonight's program was recorded at HT Recording Studio and is copyrighted by Stephen Thomas Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. All rights, including rights for broadcast and reproduction, are reserved. This is Bob Nolan wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fog rolls in on another chapter of Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. It's a foggy night on old Cape Cod, a perfect night for a mystery. Tonight, Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater presents a Captain Waverly Underhill mystery entitled The June Bug Mystery, or Someone is Out to Kill You, Mr. President. Now, of course, there had been presidents coming to Cape Cod before, since early on. Teddy Roosevelt came here, Grover Cleveland spent a summer, but never before until then had there been a president of the United States who could actually say came from the Cape. Then arrived the year 1961. That was the year John F. Kennedy assumed office and the year that Cape Cod changed forever. The Cape had sent its favorite son to the White House, and the White House was putting Cape Cod on the map. Everybody's map, in everybody's glove compartment, and suddenly everybody who was planning a vacation decided, wouldn't this be a great year to visit Cape Cod? There was something different about the tourists showing up, though. Not only were there more of them, they were changed, altered. They had all been camelotted. Not mere vacationers. These were on a mission in pursuit of the mythical kingdom. And this year, Camelot was turning out to be a sandcastle on a Cape Cod beach. The beach was in a little hamlet of Hyannisport. The sandcastle was inside the Kennedy family compound, home to the president. Not far from the castle, in the surrounding serfdom of Hyannis, the Welcome Home Jack banner was hung across Main Street, whether the president was in town or not. Further, on the outskirts, the tourist trap businesses sprang up like weeds after a fire, advertising with giant signs to lure the public off the highway, giant lobsters, Giant snow cones, Moby Dicks, Jolly Rogers, lighthouses, and leaning towers of pizza. All contributing to the carnival-like atmosphere. But there really was an extra tingle of excitement in the air. Every person felt it, even Republicans. It was as though the very act of driving onto the Cape, crossing the Sagamore Bridge or the Vaughan Bridge, was enough to transform every occupant willingly or unwillingly, into Kennedy watches. The object? To spot a Kennedy, the grand prize, the president. And, failing at this, to get as close as you could to the fairy tale seat of power, which was the compound itself. 
There were two ways you could get there. One is by land, the other by sea. By sea, you could take a tourist boat, keeping a goodly distance away. The view was exposed, like getting a peek backstage. But you were kept so far, you couldn't see much. By land, you could get much closer, less than a city block away. But there was even less to see. Just a glimpse of the stockade fence. Over that, trees and a roof said to be the president's. You could drive by in your own car, joining the bumper-to-bumper -bumper line that crept by, or you could board a tour bus and join the same throng. By bus, you sat a little higher and could see over the fence a little better of a tiny patch of lawn. You had to look quick, and tourists on the buses were often confused if they glimpsed and taken their snapshots of the right roof. Tour guides were vague answering the questions if the president were home or not, particularly when he wasn't. And it wasn't because the Secret Service asked them not to tell. It was more the way the whale-watching boats do when they aren't sighting any whales or deep-sea fishermen when they aren't catching any fish. They pointed out that the president's schedule was secret and that he considered the Cape his slip-away place, especially when faced with a major decision. It was said he liked to return to walk the beaches. Which was true. So on that second Friday in April of 1961, about 6.30 p.m., two presidential helicopters, flying low, parallel to the beach, were making a beeline for Hyannis Port. None of the beachcombers looking up could have known for certain that the president was on board, but the helicopters were enough to fuel the rumor. Excitement grew, the hordes of tourists swelled. By evening, the line of cars and buses outside the compound was barely moving, despite the best efforts of the traffic cops. To ward off the certainty of one of the neighbors going berserk, attacking the next tourist who asked for a glass of water or to use the phone or the bathroom while exhaust fumes poured up onto their porches, a policy had wisely been implemented that shut traffic off completely after 10 p.m. An eerie quiet descends, which is nothing more than the normal quiet. One last carload of tourists departing the tranquil scene. Wait. Don't hurry away too fast. You'll miss it. Look back once. You may see the greatest tourist attraction there ever could be. Ah, if they only had turned around, they might have caught a glimpse. But they didn't. So they'll never know. And neither has anyone for the past 35 years. The alarming thing that is taking place on the other side of the fence. Look, there, on the roof, a silhouette. Dr. Schofield? Uh, Miss Toller, yes. Uh, come in. How do you do? I'm Alexander Schofield. Mindy Toller, hi. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting. Oh, that's all right. Is Captain Underhill here, too? He is, I'm afraid. Uh, but I warn you, he's not in the best of moods. It's my fault. I'm late. No, it's not you. It's just that old age brings certain adjustments that we all have to make. I only want to warn you. I could come back. Uh, there's no point. He's much too unpredictable. Follow me. It was no problem for us waiting for you. After all, we've been waiting quite a long time already. Thirty-five years and counting. I can't wait to hear the full story. From what you told me over the phone, it's very exciting. Mark, I hear footsteps. But that can't be. Waverly, allow me to present... Hi, Mindy Toller, archivist. Waverly Underhill, retired. My, you certainly are tall. Like your name. It's Toller, not Toller. Hmm. How old are you? Waverly! I don't mind. I'm 25. 25? So you weren't even born while all of this happened? <laughs> I'm afraid not. 
I have a tape recorder. Where shall we do this? Wherever you're comfortable. Right here on the porch? Anywhere's fine. I'll need to lie down. Lie down? As my back is acting up again. <laughs> it wasn't a few minutes ago. That's no problem. I can fix you up with a lavalier microphone. You can lie down. That'll be fine. All right. I'll sit in this chair. Oh, boy, am I stiff. That floor is a, a long way down. Can I help you? Uh, yes. Uh, would you? Waverly. Oh, that's, that's very nice of you. Have you seen a doctor? All the time. Oh, that's right. I live with him. I'm his roommate. I'm forced to be under protest. Nobody's forcing you. We merely reach that stage in life, Miss Toller, when circumstances and infirmity makes it wiser Living for Living with one's physician underfoot is one of the eight circles of hell. Well, it looks to me like you're the one underfoot. You're lying on the floor. Miss Toller, try living with a retired detective sometime. Well, if she'd like to. Waverly, stop being insulting. Miss Toller, would you would you hand me that pillow off the hammock? Oh, for your head? Now, under my hips. Oh, Waverly. Would you please? That that phone book, too. Would you would you slide it under? Waverly. I don't mind. He thinks it's obscene. Yes, I do. Well, then she can hand me a flatter pillow. Oh. No. Ah. Alex, why are you so upset? You're the one who said it was good for my back. It's to relieve pressure on my vertebrae. I didn't say do it when we have company. For a physician, you're very uptight about the human body. Here, would you clip this microphone to your shirt? Would you do it for me? Waverly! That's all right. You see, we don't get along. Oh, we get along. You know, Miss Toller, this, this bad back of mine is sort of a legacy from President Kennedy. Something we both shared. But since he also introduced me to the benefits of Swedish massage, I can't really blame him. You don't do Swedish massage, do you, Mindy? May I call you, Mindy? Waverly, now stop it. Miss Toller, will you turn that recorder on as soon as possible? Maybe if there are microphones recording him, it'll make him behave better. Thank you, Doctor. You're very nice. Oh, Alex, you're so nice. Waverly, if you don't stop behaving like a hormonal old goat, I'm going to take you down in the cellar and chain you up naked in the basement. Oh, my, you, you, you didn't record that. Uh, uh, couldn't we... Uh, 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 could we start again? <laughs> How well did you know the president, Captain Underhill? Not very. Oh, yes, he did. I never even met the man until just before he was about to be assassinated. In Dallas? No, no. I am his port. But afterward, he got to know the president quite well, though. The president felt about Waverly the way the crew of the PT Boat 109 felt about the president. And for the same reason. They knew they owed their lives to him. Well, don't forget you were there, too. Well, I didn't do anything. Yes, you did. Well, I never saved the president's life. I didn't either. I failed. Stop that. You didn't fail. You succeeded. You mean because the president was eventually assassinated anyway? No. No, I mean that night. I failed that night. Nonsense. Miss Toller, you better let me tell this. Oh, no. You'll forget things. I think one of you should go first. I will. And the other of you not interrupt. Let me. Dr. Schofield, why don't you? Thank you. Oh, great. He's going to leave things out. I remember better than you... You're senile, remember? That's what you're always telling people. Only about some things. <laughs> you can't be senile about some things. Either you are or you're not. If you are, you don't realize it. If you do realize it, you aren't. So you can't be because you say you are. Miss Toller, do you see what I mean about the eighth circle of hell? Well, that's only logic. You taught me that. Now let me begin this and be quiet. Now, Miss Toller... As you say, you weren't born then, but it is said of those of us who were living at the time that we can all of us remember exactly where we were when we first heard the news that President Kennedy had been shot. And where were you? Well, I was seeing a patient in my office. The nurse came in and told me. I was taking a nap with the radio on. Well, my reaction was like the rest of the country, stunned disbelief. However... Unlike everyone else, my thoughts were also mingled with another date two and a half years before, the date Captain Underhill saved the President's life. Except you weren't a captain then. I failed. Stop saying that. This man, Miss Toller, is a national hero, and I'm thrilled the story finally gets to be told. If I am, then so are you. You risked your medical career giving the president that injection. What was that? Well, I'll get to it. But I want you to understand the risk was all Waverly's. Imagine yourself, if you were an unproven police deputy, practically a cadet, 
and by accident you find yourself assigned to safeguarding the President of the United States, would you be willing to stake your reputation, your credibility, your whole career on a theory that you've dreamed up that says JFK is being stalked by John Wilkes Booth? Patently ridiculous. What's more, the theory has no evidence to back it up. There was a little. No, very little. Would you be willing to risk it? I... I don't know if I would. If I was so brave, then how come you're the only one I told? Because you knew you couldn't get the Secret Service to believe you. Not in time. Besides, you just had that run-in with Agent Roy. That's right. But you believed in me, didn't you, old friend? Well, I wasn't your old friend then. This is how we met, by the way. This was our first case together. I don't know why I had confidence in you. Except you convinced me, that's all. And what was the run-in? It was that afternoon, around 5.45. I was at the Kennedy compound inside the president's house, snooping around down in the basement. I was there, too, making a house call. I was upstairs. We hadn't run into each other yet. The household was all abuzz because word had just arrived that the president was on his way. I was checking out the clothes chute in the laundry room when this guy wearing a dark suit jumps out of the shadows with a gun. Freeze! Freeze! Hold it right there! All right. Don't get excited. Don't move. Feet apart, hands up against the wall. I can identify myself. Don't say a word. Not till I tell you and don't move. Front gate. Yep. Agent Roy in the basement of the main house. I found a suspicious guy snooping around. Hey, what's your name? Deputy Underhill. He says he's local. Deputy Underhill. I've never seen him before. Over. Uh, Checking. How come I've never seen you before? Gee, I don't know. Uh, Perhaps I've never arrested you before. Have you ever vacationed on Cape Cod? Don't get cute. Agent Roy? Yeah. Uh, It's okay. He's authorized. He is. It's his uh, first time he's ever signed in, but uh, he's uh, definitely got clearance. Well, that's dandy, damn it. Why did nobody tell me? There's supposed to be communication around here. Uh, Sorry, mix up. Never mind. Out, 012. Out, 31. I guess you can put your arms down. Sorry for the mix-up, but we have to be extra careful. Lancer's on his way. Lancer? Code name for the president. Lancer? <laughs> like in Lancelot. Uh, look, uh, we appreciate your helping out, uh, helping us do our job, but it's getting to be too much like a zoo around here. The Kennedys are a big family, all their friends, neighbors always dropping over, plus the squirrels. Squirrels? Uh, what we call the press, photographers, they love them. We got 17 state police and three local, including you. I think that means we got too many Injun chiefs running around here. Injun chiefs? Is that another code name? Why don't you tell me what you're doing? Investigating. What? Laundry shoots. All right, I'm going to ask you something. What are you doing here? We don't need you. You're not helping us. You're only making our job harder by getting in the way. I'll be sure and report it to my chief. Police. Chief, not Injun. I want you out of my way. I will if you get out of mine. You seem to be standing in it. Listen to me. We're not running around playing James Bond here. We think protecting the president is serious. We don't joke about it. Mm, So you're humorless and proud of it. This is a warning. Stay out of my way. If you're in my way while I'm trying to protect the president, I'll run right over you. Now get out of the basement. You're done snooping. I want you to leave the property. I will when I'm ready. Just remember what I told you. Afterwards, I went upstairs to have a look around the rest of the house. And I was just leaving my patient, coming out into the hallway on the third floor. Who was your patient? I'm sorry. Information about my patients is something I never divulge. Get plenty of rest, take that medication, and I'll be checking on you first thing tomorrow morning. Excuse me, Dr. Mudd? I'm sorry? You're a doctor, aren't you? Yes. Isn't your name Dr. Mudd? No, it's not. It's Dr. Schofield. Say, doctor, can I ask you to tell me what's this bone right here? That's your pinky. I mean, in med school, what did you call it? Mm, that would be the proximal bone of your fifth phalanx. Mm, uh, what's this muscle called? Uh, trapezius. Is tetracycline a good vaccine against diphtheria? For your information, tetracycline happens to be an antibiotic, not a vaccine. 
I can't believe you people. Is every one of you paranoid? Do you think I'm not a doctor now? No, not anymore. I believe you are. You were walking out, aren't you, doctor? Uh, may I go with you? No, thank you. I've been here enough. I don't need a Secret Service escort. Aren't you boys just a little overdoing it? I apologize for my rudeness, but I have an urgent reason. I'm not with the Secret Service. I'm local. Deputy Underhill? I, I know what you mean about them. Have you met Agent Roy? Yes, I met Agent no, Roy. I met him, too, just now. What is going on? Uh, Doctor... I won't be escorting you, but do you mind if we walk out together? In that case, I don't mind. <laughs> yes, I'd just like to speak with you. Who is this Dr. Mund you're looking for? Oh, never heard of him. No. Does he practice here on the Cape? No. He practiced in Virginia. He's been dead for a hundred years. A hundred years? Then why did you ask me? Uh, uh, outside first. Let's uh, step away from the door. I'm not looking for a doctor, necessarily, doctor. The person I'm looking for could be anyone. I'm expecting a skillful actor. What for? There is going to be an attempt on the president's life. I'm fairly sure of it. An attempt? But the president is on his way here. That's why it's urgent. Then you better tell the Secret Service. I don't trust them, and they're not going to believe me. You think I will? I'm hoping you will. And I'm trusting if you believe me, you'll help me. Go on. I'm listening. Well, I have to tell you how this developed, or you won't believe me for sure. Yesterday, I was put on this assignment. I don't belong on it because I'm an investigator, not a security guard. But the chief got to pick three, and he likes me, so he put me on it. But he didn't tell me what to do, and nobody else cared or was interested. So an investigator, I started investigating. That's how I stumbled on it. I was checking over the list of names of people who had registered in area hotels and motels within the past week. I was reading down the names and comparing them with my mental list of wanted criminals. It's a file we carry around in our heads like, like you know, the names of medicines. And I came across the name Ned Spangler. Ned Spangler? Is he wanted? Well, I thought so, but I couldn't quite place it. I was fairly certain I'd seen his name on a wanted list. I checked the files and records and nothing. I asked around. The name didn't ring a bell with anyone else. And then I looked down the list some more and I came across a second name. David Harold. And I had the same feeling. Once again, nothing in records, and nobody I asked knew. But I couldn't shake that feeling. The answer didn't come to me until last night. I woke up remembering. They were wanted criminals. But a hundred years ago. I had been doing some outside reading on the Civil War, and that's where I encountered the names. They were two of the conspirators in the plot to assassinate Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was their leader. Well, that's pretty long range, isn't it? Can't be any more than a coincidence. You're not suggesting that the South is rising again. Another conspiracy? Not a conspiracy. A lone assassin following in John Wilkes Booth's footsteps. I visited the hotels. Ned Spangler stayed at the Crab and Anchor two nights, Sunday and Monday, and checked out. David Harold registered at the Sea Contessa the following Tuesday and Wednesday. I checked the signature card. Both handwritings are identical. It's the same person. What about last night? I'm waiting on that information. It sounds a little unusual, I admit. But does it have to mean there's a plot? No, it doesn't have to mean that. Couldn't it just be a Civil War buff? I think that's what it is. A Civil War reenactor, but one who's gone off the deep end. Who thinks... Wait. Listen. Helicopters. He's almost here. Uh, look, Doctor, I haven't time to explain any further. But John Wilkes Booth, that's crazy. Not the original, an imitator, but just as dangerous. Who thinks Kennedy is Lincoln? Booth shot Lincoln on April 14th. April 14th? That's today. He shot him on Good Friday. Good Lord, today's Good Friday. He's almost here, Doctor. All right. I have no choice. I'll help you. But what do I do? Good. Look, help me keep watch. We especially have to get the president past the hour of ten o'clock. Then I think we'll be all right. Can you stick around here? Well, I think so. I'll just tell my patient I want to keep an eye on her. But why ten? Because it's in the script. That's a great advantage, Doctor. We know what he's going to attempt, and we know when. John Wilkes Booth planned to assassinate Lincoln at Ford's Theater at 10.15. The shot rang out at 10.20 while the president was engrossed in the second half of the play. The play... Oh, my God, I just remembered something. What? The, what my patient just informed me. What? President Kennedy. Tonight. He's attending a play. Yes, good. I see. I see. Hey, Jack. Oh, you. Hey, Jack. What is that?
There really was a play? Oh, skit, really. It was being held inside the compound at Bobby's house across the lawn. Afterwards was a twister party. It was something the neighborhood kids cooked up called Mr. Kissable Becomes President. The president was popular with kids. He gave them rides on his powder blue golf cart, and he promised to see the skit next time he returned. So it really wasn't a play, exactly. Oh, jeez, those things scare me. What is it? One of those big buzz bomber June bugs. He'll spoil your taping. We should try to get rid of him, I guess. Get up. Go away. Go on. Fly away. He's got his little hooks caught in the screen. Oh, he won't let go. He'll turn off the light, Alex. Then he won't buzz. Get up. Go on. Fly. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Better turn it off anyway, or he'll be back. We don't need a light on, do we? If you can be trusted. The president wasn't coming all this way just to see the play, was he? So why was he coming? I wondered that, too, at the time. Two days before, on April 12th, the Russians had put Yuri Gagarin up in space. I assumed the president was coming to mull over a decision about the space race. I was wrong. He was mulling over a decision, all right. It was about a place the world had never heard of. Bay of Pigs. Come Monday morning, they would. You know, Waverly, I've often wondered if the president's ill-fated decision to go ahead with that invasion was at all influenced by what happened to him. I would think he might have been rattled. I know I was rattled for days afterward. You were also knocked unconscious. That's why you were rattled. I wouldn't say the president was. I thought he took it remarkably in stride. How were you knocked out? I did it. Yes, and you never apologized. What happened? Well, we'll come to it. Now, let's go back. Wait, I want to ask Captain Underhill a question first. Yes? You say you first got suspicious of a plot when you found those two names on the list of hotel occupants. That's right. There were about five or six thousand names. Why is that so unusual? I mean, couldn't it have been just a standard coincidence? A standard coincidence? I'm not sure there is any such thing. No, it was too improbable to be coincidental. It had to be deliberate. If you're looking for a coincidence in the case, you you could say it was my knowing the names of the conspirators to begin with. That was purely coincidental and, and fairly lucky, too. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have become suspicious. But the fact the names were on the list could not be coincidental. I still don't see why, really. Alex, turn on the lamp again a minute. Miss Toller, will you... Will you remove this phone directory from under my hips? Oh, Waverly, not more of this. We're going to try an experiment. You too, Alex. We've got two phone books out here. Let's just see. Now, there were nine conspirators in all. Uh, ten, if you throw in Dr. Mudd. Let's see. There, there was, as I remember, John Wilkes Booth, George Atzerod, Ned Spangler, David Harold, mm, um, Samuel Arnold... John and Mary Surratt, Michael O'Laughlin, and, and Lewis Powell. That's the current Cape Cod phone book you have there. There must be about 150,000 names. Miss Toller, you look up Ned Spangler. Alex, you try David Harold. Is that H-E-R or H-A-R? Harold is H-E-R-O-L-D. I found Spangler. How many? Two. Ned Spangler? No, a uh, Jack and a Marshall. Okay. Okay, now look up Samuel Arnold. There are five Heralds. David Harold? No. Okay, try Michael O'Laughlin. There are plenty of Arnolds. Must be 50. Any Samuel Arnolds? Mm, no. Mm. Try George Atzerod. A-Z? A-T. A-T-Z-E-R-O-D-T. I found two O'Laughlins. Michael? No. Elizabeth and uh, Kelly. No, Michael. Try Surratt. There were two Surratts in the plot. John Surratt and his mother, Mary, who, uh... Now she ran a boarding house. There are no ad Surratts listed at all. Then try Lewis Powell. There are no Surratts in the Cape Cod phone book. And then try Dr. Mudd, Samuel Mudd. Wow, there are plenty of Powells. Any of them Lewis? No, there's a Leo. And try looking up John Wilkes Booth. Ah, here, I, I found a Mudd. Samuel Mudd? No, Kevin Mudd. Holy smokes, there are lots of Booths. Must be 20 of them. Any John Wilkes? There's a Jay Walker Booth listed... And three Johns. John F., John G., and John L. All right. All right. That's a match. My goodness, wouldn't you hate to be named Booth? On the other hand, it was... It was William Booth who founded the Salvation Army. Now, let's... Let's tally. 
We had seven partial matches where we matched the last names, but, but only one complete match. John Booth. Out of a random sampling of 150,000 names. And yet, and yet, checking the hotel list, I had found two complete matches out of a sampling of only five or six thousand. Thirty times smaller. So you see, it couldn't have been a coincidence. Oh, I'd better turn off the lamp again. So what did you do after the president arrived? We got ready. We waited. I told my patient I was sticking around to keep an eye on her condition. I called my office to say I wouldn't be back. I also got the information I was waiting for, the updated list of hotel registrants. I had my secretary read the list over the phone. This time there were no matches, not even a partial match. And what did that tell you? Well, it was the first indication that my theory might be wrong, after all. Which you didn't share with me. No point weakening your resolve. That's right. Or I might not have done what you had me do. I didn't have you do it. It was your own idea. Because you had me convinced we had to do anything to prevent the president from attending the play. And what did you do? Well, something I'm not proud of. You should be. I'm still not. What was it? I injected the president. He was just about to go see the play. His back was hurting from the helicopter ride. He wanted an injection of painkiller and muscle relaxant uh, so he could sit comfortably. Instead, I gave him something that induces muscle cramps. Not dangerous, but painful until it wears off. Like a bad Charlie horse. Anyway, it worked. It kept him from going. It worked splendidly. It allowed us to isolate him and keep watch over him. Oh, keeping watch was horrible, nerve-wracking. Can you imagine waiting for an assassin to show up and knowing that the assassin is John Wilkes Booth? I felt like I was trapped in time watching history repeat itself. It really was as if John Wilkes Booth had come back. After all, what was Booth himself but a delusional, paranoid actor? And this impersonator had to be delusional, and he had to be paranoid. If he wasn't an actor, he wasn't going to gain entrance inside the compound. What we had was a crazy fanatic acting out the identical fantasy of another crazy fanatic out of history. Therefore, it really was as if John Wilkes Booth had come back to murder Lincoln all over again. How did you make out? The president is not going. You did it. He's not going to the play, and he won't be feeling like playing Twister either, I guarantee you. How did you do it? Well, his back was hurting. He wanted a muscle relaxant. I gave him the opposite. He'll be feeling worse, not better, for about an hour. Will that do? It should. I'm getting close to ten o'clock. Is he lying down? Yes, he's reading. Windows are... Locked. Shades? Drawn. I drew them. Good. Then all we have to do now is wait out here. In the hallway? We'll use this, uh, this bedroom off the hall. There's no one in here. Keep the lights off. We'll stand just inside the door. You watch down the hallway that way. I'll watch down this. Keep an eye on the stairs, and we'll be ready if we see anybody coming up them. Where are you going? I want to be able to hear what's going on outside. Listen to that traffic. How do they stand it? We could be shutting off soon. It's almost ten. Don't feel bad, Doctor. You did the right thing. Did I? I violated the Hippocratic Oath. A doctor's most sacred oath. Cause no harm. Ask not what your country can do for you, Doctor. Ask what you can do for your country. I'd say you just did. You're saving the life of the President. I just hope you're right about all this. I mean, I don't want you to be. I'd rather you weren't. I'd rather not confront a crazed killer. Do you have a gun? Checked at the gate. I have this radio. I can call in reinforcements. One of those. The president has one on his bureau. Shh, shh. The maids are moving around. Everybody else must be over at the play. 
Waverly, you can't be sure about this. No. You realize there hasn't been a president shot since... McKinley. Oh, that must be... 60 years ago, 1901. How long ago? This is nothing about when it's going to happen again. Although I admit, it has made the Secret Service more cocky. So in that sense, it's made it more likely. Don't lose confidence, Doctor. We can feel foolish later if we have to. But to be safe rather than sorry requires that we be a little paranoid. No, thank you. I'm a physician. At least I was. I try to cure paranoia, not cultivate it. It's ten o'clock. Be ready, Doctor. This is about the time John Wilkes Booth shows up at Ford's Theater. They're shutting off the doors. Listen. April 14th is unlucky for another reason. Did you know? Why is that? Lincoln was shot on April 14th. He died April 15th. The Titanic struck an iceberg April 14th. It went down April 15th. Of course, that was 1912, not 1865. So what are you going to tell me next? You're expecting an iceberg to show up. Dr. Schofield! Uh, Dr. Schofield! The president. Probably his back. Quick, go in and see. I'll be right outside. It's my uh, back. I don't understand. You should be feeling some relief by now. Well, it's still acting up. Uh, can't I have another uh, injection? No, I can't. Not for another hour. Uh, it, it's best if you remain lying down, Mr. President. Well, I need something. Perhaps a uh, bath would do. Uh, I suppose so. Yes, it might. I suppose. All right. I'll be right back. Just a minute. Yes, and not a moment longer. What's he doing? He wants a bath. That's no problem. Not up here. In the basement. There's a whirlpool tub down there. He wants to use it. All right. That's okay, too. Maybe even better. We can sneak him down there without being seen. I'll go down and start filling the tub and checking the room out. In a few minutes, you lead him down. Then stay with him. I'm coming back up here. No. No, I, I can't guard him alone. What if I need you? Well, do it this way. When you go back in, help yourself to his portable radio. It's identical to this one? Yes. He's a such a channel nine. We'll set ours to 14. We can talk to each other privately. You can call me if you need me. What are you going to do? I'm going to be a presidential decoy. Underhill, do you read me? Over. I read you. Over. I'm outside the tub room. He's soaking. The coast is clear. Over. I'm in his room. Nobody's showing up here yet either. Over. What time is it now? It's uh, ten minutes after ten. Our assassin may be running late. By now the real booth had entered the back of Ford's theater. He'd snuck around the stage and was climbing the back step to the dress circle. Wait a minute. Waverly, do you hear that? Over. I hear it. I'm switching back to nine. I'll call you back in a minute. Out. Boys, I've been trampling my rose bushes. The sand from that stupid helicopter. It has kicked up and pitted all my glass sliders. It's my patio furniture. Oh, come on. I am his neighbor for, for crying out like you let me see. What is this? Roger, come on, just tell him I'm here. All right, so I just want to talk to you. Never mind. It's legitimate. Just a neighbor. He's not getting in. Over. Oh, Waverly, I'm glad you're back on. I'm on my way to the gatehouse. You let the president? I had to. He told me to. Get back to where you were. I'm coming down. Waverly, he told me to. I'm sorry. Never mind. Come on. The coast is still clear. Go in and check it. Mr. President. Mr. President? Mr. President! Waverly, he's gone! Listen, check the house. Is he underwater? No. No, he isn't. Well, then start looking through the house. You go that way. Look everywhere. Find him. Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, Mr. President. Yeah, what is it? Uh, I know about the uh, neighbor. I'm coming. Just let me get a uh, bathrobe on. Sir, my name is Deputy Underhill. I'm a police investigator. Mr. President, I need your cooperation. I have reason to believe your life is in danger right now. I'll try to explain, but I need to ask you to bear with me. No. Shh. Don't answer. Who is it? Wait, really, it's me. Is the hall clear? Yes, it is. I can't find him. Dr. Schofield. Mr. President, did he tell you? Dr. Schofield, do you believe him? Yes, Mr. President, I do. We better uh, alert the Secret Service. Uh, No, sir. I'd rather not alert anyone just yet. We'll be safer if we wait just a few minutes. What time is it? Shh. Don't say anything. Who is it? Oh, I am looking for President Kennedy. Uh, Who is it? Inga Nichols. Mr. President, do you know her? Yes. Did you send for her? No. Who sent you, Miss Nichols? President Kennedy's father sent me to massage his sore back. Uh, I think it's all right. Let her in. Uh, Miss Nichols, is the hall empty? You mean, yeah, there is no one out here but me? Inga. Oh, what is going on? You'll have to uh, ask these gentlemen. I'm just a spectator. Miss Nichols, this is Dr. Schofield. Uh, Miss Nichols, how do you do? Everybody keep away from the windows, please, even though the shades are drawn. 1020, Doctor. By now, Booth was entering the private hallway outside the President's box. He was right outside the door. By uh, Booth, you mean John Wilkes? I'm afraid, yes. Shh. Excuse me, Mr. President. Captain Arms, Secret Service. Is everything all right in there? Go ahead. Answer. Mr. President? Yes. Yes, it is, Captain. Thank you. I, uh, I don't believe I know him. Mr. President? Don't let him in. Would you mind opening up, sir? I need to satisfy myself everything is all right. Everything is fine. I'm just about to get a uh, back massage from Inga Nichols. Yeah? Yeah, Uh, yeah, I am in here, too. Mr. President, I'm sorry. I just need to check for myself. Sir, open up. Agent, I am ordering you not to be bothering me. Now go away. No, sir. Not until I'm satisfied. What should we do? No. Sir, I think something's wrong. Now, if you don't open this door immediately... Look out! Look out! Ah! President! President! Hold him! Grab him! Which one? He's out. The bullet grazed his forehead. Come get your medics up here right away. Miss Nichols, are you all right? Yeah, Mr. President, I am fine. I shook up, it's fine. Mr. President, what happened here? It appears this deputy just saved my life. Oh. And the good doctor's coming, too. Yes, thank God. Mr. President, please, I need to know what happened Never here. let Deputy Underhill tell you. Well, well we, we were expecting an assassin to, to show up. One that thinks that he's John Wilkes Booth. I thought you might be him. It turns out he was already hiding in the room. He snuck up behind us because all of us were facing the door. He was pointing the derringer. I I saw his arm just in time. Unfortunately, in deflecting the shot, Dr. Schofield got pistol whipped and the bullet grazed his forehead. Now he's coming around. He's a lucky fellow. He'll have a scar. But he is lucky. He'll also have a, uh, a medal to go with it. Here come the medics. Quick, in here. You have a stretcher? No, straight jackets. Oh, then you want down the hall. Captain Arm, why don't you uh, escort them? Is it safe? It's safe. I, I'm sure it's safe now. Come with me. Oh. Uh, don't get up, Doctor. Keep lying still. Don't be a stop. I am a southern citizen. That poor man is seriously out of his mind. He thinks he's Booth. That, uh, that makes me Lincoln, I suppose. Well, you are the president, Mr. President. So I am. That I am. And, uh, since I am, 
I'm going to be asking you to obey a presidential order and keep this confidential. I understand. I don't want this uh, getting out. Oh, no, sir. You know, uh, Deputy, when you first burst in here yourself, I thought you were the crazy one. I know. Even after Dr. Schofield arrived and, uh, Inga, I was still thinking of how to best protect myself from you. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were crazy, too. <laughs> <laughs> I even, I was even considering asking Inga here to uh, offer one of her massages. I figured after that, you might still be uh, crazy, but you'd be harmless. <laughs> Come in. Right over here. Take the uh, best possible care of him. So, do you still have a scar? Yes, I do. Uh, turn on the lamp. I if I lean into the light, look, uh, look right here. It's not very big. Well, it's gotten smaller over the years. Everything shrinks. We shrink. History shrinks. Do you have a medal? Oh, we both do. His is bigger. But you have a purple heart. Captain Underhill, I still don't understand. How did he sneak up behind you? Because I made several blunders. The first was when I checked the hotel registries for the last time and discovered there were no matches. I interpreted that as evidence my theory was wrong. I should have realized there was another explanation. Which was? That Booth was already inside the compound. The reason he hadn't signed another registry at some hotel was because he was already in hiding. How did he get in? Well, we never found out for sure. He might have snuck over the fence the night before. That would have been easier to do with the president not there. Security would have been more lax. How did he get into the president's room? Well, he might have slipped out the basement and climbed to the roof and come in the bedroom window. Or else he might have come up the stairs while I was running down the other way. Either way, it led to my biggest blunder. Which was? Well, when I came up to find the president in his bedroom, I, I assumed, because he was still alive, that the assassin could not be in there, too. I should have rechecked and resecured that room. I see. And why didn't the president want the story getting out? Well, he thought it would distract the country. He knew very well the sort of Damocles hangs over the head of every president. So what was the point? So after you saved him, how did you feel when he was later killed in Dallas? By the way, you don't have a solution for that one, too, do you? I wish I did. No. No, I felt shocked and saddened, like everyone else. Did it make you think that saving him had been useless? Not at all. No, I, I felt the way the president felt after the Cuban Missile Crisis... After the danger was over, he expressed the thought that perhaps he had performed his one single presidential purpose, to avert a nuclear war. He even joked afterwards to his brother Bobby, and I think it's clear what he was remembering as he spoke, that perhaps now it was time for him to go to the theater, as Lincoln had done. Bobby's answer was, well, if you're going, I'm going with you. Well, Waverly, here she goes. Looks like you... Looks like we both struck out. Ah, uh, let her go. Obviously, she has a boyfriend somewhere. Oh, oh, is that her excuse, is it? Well, it's done. Our most famous case. Think anyone would believe us? I don't know. It's up to them. Oh, oh. I, I think I'll sleep on the porch. <laughs> that doggone June bug again. Why do they always sound so angry? You have been listening to Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater's presentation of the June Bug Mystery, or Someone is Out to Kill You, Mr. President. The actors, Dave Ellsworth played Captain Waverly Underhill. Wally O'Hara was Dr. Alexander Schofield. Nicole Noel played Mindy Polar Archivist. David C. Wallace played Young Underhill. Tom Dutton was Young Schofield. Michael Meller was Agent Roy. Stephen Russell was Captain Arm. Laura Garner was Inga Nichols. Chuck Powers was the angry neighbor. Don Bliss played John Wilkes Booth. 
Debbie Oney and Nikki Todd were the maids. Catherine Oney was on the beach. And Kevin Rice played President Kennedy. Tonight's program was produced, written, and directed by Stephen Thomas Oney. Engineering by John Todd. Original music by Mark Birmingham. Program recorded at HT Studio, Cape Cod, and Rose Mead, Los Angeles. Copyright by Stephen Thomas Oney for Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. One note on tonight's play. All of the dates and facts used in this story are historically accurate. With one exception. That we do not believe President Kennedy was actually on Cape Cod that weekend. But who knows? He may have fooled us. Jack always liked to fool people. Tonight's program is dedicated to John F. Kennedy, 35th United States President, who, in August of 1961, established the Cape Cod National Seashore. This is Bernadette McPherson, playing Rose Kennedy, wishing you a pleasant evening and inviting you to tune in again when the fall rolls in on another chapter of the Cape Cod Radio Mystery Theater. I've got everything switched on, and I'm not even sure what call letters I should be using. I saw these written down beside the equipment, 2X2L. This is 2X2L calling for anyone.